Part 2, Rising Up and Rising Down Chapter 11 There was something weirdly eternal about Coruscant's endless artificial sprawl. The skyline of Galactic City was constantly morphing, and the lanes of speeder traffic were eternally in motion at every hour of the day, but in that ceaseless change there was a rare kind of permanence. Throughout history, regardless of almost every major war and interstellar catastrophe, a trillion beings were always going about their business in the vast urban web of Coruscant. That, at least, was what usually occurred to Jagged Fell when he visited the capital of the Alliance. It was the kind of thought appropriate for a man who'd grown up in cold caves buried beneath the surface of a snowball planet. He hadn't lived in Chile in 50 years, but that core would never leave him. That was the kind of thought that would make a man feel young again. So it was tonic to step through the doors to the Alliance Chief of State's office and see Senator Alana Solo DJ o standing there by the window. Galactic City's midday traffic whisked by outside her window. He could still remember Alana as a small child, red hair dyed black and traveling with her grandparents as the war orphan Amelia. She'd absorbed a lot of Leia Organa in the process. That much was clear. The little girl was long gone. Thank you for seeing me. Jagged said as he turned his eyes to the figure behind the desk. I hope I'm not late. You're as reliably punctual as ever, Master Fell, Lanik Sevash said. The long-necked Cormian had been elected to his second term as chief of state two years ago. Compared to some contests Jag had witnessed it had been as fair and boring as elections were supposed to run in functioning democracies. Synex Juvex had been just distant thunderclaps then. It was surely a good thing that the Alliance was now being run by beings like Savage, technocratic, and temperamentally conservative, but Jag wondered how such a leader would react in time of crisis. How was the flight from Bastion? Alana asked as they both took seats facing Savage. As smooth as could be expected. I heard you had an incident during some recent war games. Savage's small eye settled on Jag. One involving some relations, I believe. My son Arlen happened to chase some ship pirates right into the Bulbringi system during a very sensitive time, Jag explained. But the pirates were stopped because of them, so there was no harm done. I'm glad to hear that. I hope you've had time to review the file Senator DJ O sent you. I have, yes. He favored Alana with a smile. I suppose you like my comments on them? Please, she said. Then you should brace yourself, Jack said and added a laugh to blunt the tension. It didn't see to work. The idea of inviting a representative from Savire's organization is not inherently bad. We can't settle this by just talking to the houses, and everyone knows it. The way you're going about it, frankly, risks doing more harm than good. First, you're planning to wait until the houses show up at Yagdol to tell them about Savire's representative. The houses need to be thrown off their guard, Alana said. We've been letting them negotiate on their own turf, literally, and it's made them complacent. Besides, security is an issue. If we tell all the houses today, I'm sure one of them would have an assassination plan drawn up in a week. Then tell them three days in advance. Jag looked at them both. I'm not joking. I think that will knock them off balance without alienating them too much. And it will throw their assassins off balance too, hopefully. What's your second point? Asked Alana. Her tone said she was considering his first. My second question's more fundamental. What do we really know about Savire's organization? What kind of power structure does she have? Does she make all the decisions, or is there a committee? In short, how much sway will her delegate really have? Alana let out a restrained sigh that said she'd been asking herself those questions all along. I'm hoping we'll be able to learn a lot of that just by working with her delegate. Frankly, it's the only way. The woman and her allies have buried themselves deep for their own safety. It's as hard for our intel people to find out about them as it is for the houses. Jag glanced at Savash, who'd been listening quietly so far. I hope you'll be sending your best spies to this conference. Savash's head tilted a little on his long neck. Will Imperial Space request an official presence? To be honest, I think Bastion wants to stay far away from this. I frankly don't blame them. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Alana rolled her eyes. We're looking at a situation where I see three possible outcomes, Jag told them. 
The best one is that the governing houses institute sweeping structural reforms to implement democratic power structures, an impartial legal system, and a decentralized and privatized economy. I think that's possible in theory, but it would take years to implement, willing leaders, and a patient populace. So what do you think will happen? Alana crossed her arms over her chest. The other two options are less ideal. One, probably the most likely, is that the house is clamped down. Savior falls victim to an untraceable assassin. Her movement breaks down without her leadership. Then it will be up the Alliance to decide how to penalize a member state that's flagrantly violating the rights of sentience agreement instead of just doing it on the sly. And the third, ask Savash with a touch of dread. Jag didn't plan to spare them. They called him here for an honest opinion, and they both knew he'd gotten too old to couch his opinions in diplomatic nicety. It was a rare advantage of age. The third option, he said, is a large-scale revolt with many casualties. The houses won't hesitate to use violence to put down an uprising, and that'll just make the rebels fight harder. Sevash looked at Alana. Did you sense Savyar is capable of that? She shook her head. I honestly don't know. What did the force tell you? Asked Jag. She was hard to read. Falling often are and frankly, so are professional politicians. But I don't think she was telling any outright lies. Savior wouldn't have told it that revolt, Jack said. If she dies a martyr, anger can spark a blaze that'll burn all over Senex Juvex. And a lot of people are already angry. Alana let out a frustrated sigh. I still think these talks are our best chance to avoid a catastrophe. I agree, said Jack. They all knew a best chance wasn't the same as a good one. When it came time for Jag and Alana to leave, they sauntered together out of Sevash's office and down the corridors of the old Imperial Palace. Jag had seen a lot of chiefs of state pass through those halls. After 35 years, they were all starting to blur together. What's Sevash's opinion on all this? He asked as they approached the lift bank. He didn't want to volunteer. He got elected by promising to avoid confrontation. He's trying to stick to that promise, which means he's backing talks to far. Will he back peacekeepers to enforce an agreement? What about a large-scale intervention in case of an uprising? She sighed again. One thing at a time, please. All right, all right. You know, as somebody who helped liberalize the empery off all things, I thought you'd be more optimistic about reforming Synex Juvex. Jack shrugged. To be honest, I never thought it would work. What? She stopped and stared. He shrugged again. I was half expecting to get assassinated by the Moth Council a year into the job, if you want the truth. Things went better than expected. I give my wife the credit. What did Jaina do? What doesn't she do? I'm sure it was something. That's why I always give her credit. Can't remember exactly what. It was a while back, and my memory's starting to go. She snorted. So all this time, Uncle Jag, you've been making history by accident. Senator, I think that's how it always works. His thoughts fell back on another politician a century back who laid out an incredibly elaborate plot and brought it all to brutal fruition. That one, of course, had been a Sith Lord as well as a senator. Almost always, he added, and decided to leave it at that. The storage room aboard Savire's Corvette had become an abattoir. The dead from the recent attack had been laid out on the floor, each corpse cleaned and placed on a separate tarpaulin evenly spaced from the others. There were two rows, seven bodies in the one closer to the blown open blast doors, five in the one further away. When the four Mandalorians walked into the chamber, they stepped right over the first row and went directly to the bodies of their comrades. Savior was waiting for them there. She looked down on her dead guards with a face weighed down by grief. The attack was a sudden one, the falling woman said. Your friends defended the best they could. I'd be dead if not for them. Tamar Skirida's gaze skimmed over the armored bodies to the one at the far end, the corpse in maroon, and black plating. Her knees weakened and her face went slack beneath the mask of her blue and black helmet. When word had come of the attack of the causalities, she'd instantly dropped into a state of desperate denial, but there it was. There could be no appeal. 
Her sister Nile was dead, and the only thing that kept her standing was her cousin Dorn's hand on her shoulder. How did they find you? Jevern Auchis asked with a voice was as cold and hard as his silver and green helmet. If he was upset by what had happened he didn't show it, but then, you'd expect that of your mandalor. We don't know yet. Savyar shook her head. It seems there was only one of them. What? Shalk Jebin asked incredulously. What kind of crazy Arudiai's commando could pull this off? Tamar shook off Dorne's hand and dropped to a crouch over Niall's body. She saw that one arm had been severed from the shoulder, so, too, had the head. Her sister's neck had been cut clean through with a blade that singed the synth fabric of her suit collar and cauterized both sides of the wounds. A Jedi, Tamar said. It was a Jedi. Fearfeck, Dorn said. I didn't realize they'd gotten involved. Didn't you say the Alliance wasn't negotiating with you? Asked Duchess. They were. It might be they still are. Savior looked down at the bodies. Despite this, I've decided to go ahead and send Moran Nall to the conference at Yagtal. Lady, have you lost your shabla mind? Asked Jevin. They just tried to kill you. Not necessarily, Alcha said evenly. The Jedi and Karuskin haven't been joined at the hip in decades. It could have been someone else who sent them. So the Shabla GDI are for hire now. Morn Browler asked from the back of the group. I thought they were supposed to be all noble and righteous. It could have been a rogue Jedi, Dorn suggested. A Sith. What can you tell us about the Jedi? Ox asked Savyar. Do you have the body? My guard got off a lucky shot right as it was coming toward me. One bolt in the back of the head. The whole body faded in an instant and only the robe was left. She shook her head. I always thought it was a legend that they could do that. Was it human or something else? Asked Dorn. A bearable. I can't tell you that much, if nothing else. We'll have to ask around. See if we can scrounge up intel on a bearable Jedi, Archa said. And you really don't think he was working for the Alliance? Anything's possible, but I doubt it. More likely he'd be working for the houses. I never thought Jedi would hang around the likes of Kalor Vendrone, Dorne said. But I guess stranger things have happened. We may never know which Jedi did this. Savire locked eyes with Alch's visor. What we need to do is plan for the future. Your people need to protect mine. That's what I'm paying you for. We're paying too, Tamar said. You DCI, Tamika, Dorne whispered. Ox ignored them both. You want us to guard Noel's body at the conference. That's right. Seeing faces like ours might be a turnoff, Jebin told her. That's why they'll be seeing your real faces, Savyar told him. I know you're all scowling beneath your helmets, but I need the best fighters in the galaxy to protect my people, now more than ever. My people are devoted but none of them are soldiers like you. Put your besker under your clothes if you want, but I'm going to need you to be there protecting my representatives. Maybe we should negotiate a little extra credits, Jebin said. Savyar glared at him. Compared to what else was, was in your contract, bodyguard work is safe and straightforward. Tell that to Orvold, Dorn gestured grimly to the bodies. Of course, I apologize. Savyar sighed. I was almost killed yesterday. It wears on the nerves. You'll get used to it, Archer said. I'll pick a team to guard your reps. Thank you. She looked at the corpse below her. I know it's your custom to take the armor of your dead. You can't have the bodies too. We appreciate that, said Alchus. Anything else? For the moment, no, but don't go flying off right away. I may have more in a few hours. Good enough. Alchus turned to his assembled soldiers. All right, vote. We have work to do. It wasn't hard for four able bodies Mandalorians to retrieve five armored bodies, not when they had Repulsor sleds and nobody shooting at them. Tamar Skirata had retrieved fallen friends, even relatives, under much worse circumstances, but this was different. Nile was different. She only had one older sister, now she had none. It left her feeling hollow inside. The entire march through the blaster scored hallways of the Corvette back to their couple ship felt dreamlike and unreal. But when they were back on their own ground, awful reality started to settle. 
They took Niall's body to a separate chamber so that private respects could be paid. It was customary to give pieces of Besker from the dead to their relatives. Tamar's grandfather had walked around an entire suit made of armor from Law's family. But then, Venkus Garada had had a lot of family and a lot of dead. When Tamar and Dorn were alone with Niall, they took off their helmets first. They didn't take off Niles. It would have been too ghoulish, they felt, to pry that bodiless head out of his shell. Tamar didn't want to see her sister like that. She could remember that face as it had been in life. That was enough. Instead, they took pieces of armor from the body. Dorn took Niles to shoulder plates. Their maroon would match well enough with his red armor. Tamar's own besker was blue touched with red. She pondered for a long moment, then slid the black gauntlets off Niall's stiff hands. Niall was only a year older and about the same size. When they'd been young, they swapped clothes like feckless Iruti girls across the galaxy. The gloves would fit, Tamar knew. The gloves would do. There was a long moment when they both stood over the slab, looking down at the cut-apart corpse. Tamar broke it by asking, do you really think it was a Jedi? Dorn frowned. Those are definitely lightsaber burns. What else could it have been? I don't know. A rogue Jedi, maybe? A Sith. Same stake. Different Bantha, Dorn grunted without conviction. It was a standard Mando refrain that Jedi and Sith were the same thing in the end. Both trouble, except, so common wisdom went, the Sith paid better. Most of their fellow mercenaries believed it without question. It was harder for them, though. Tamar's grandfather hadn't been a Jedi, but he'd had the Force, and he'd passed on some of that knowledge before he died. Not to Dorn. He was a Skarata, family and name, and fact, but not of the same bloodline as Tamar and Niall. He had no Force sensitivity like them, but growing up he'd watched the two sisters practice in secret taking lessons from the old man in meditation and combat that would have shamed them all if the others on Mandalore had found out. Old Vankus Garada had bequeathed to them a pair of lightsabers, ancient ones he in turn had gotten from his mother who'd been a real actual Jedi Knight in the Old Republic and broken her vows to the Order by marrying a clone soldier. As they'd gotten older Niall had practiced less and less until she finally stopped duels and swordplay with her younger sister. It was getting in the way of work, Niall had said. Getting in the way of a proper Mando lifestyle. Maybe if she'd kept training, if she carried her lightsaber, the fight on Savire's ship would have ended differently. As she stared down at what was left of her sister, Tamar could only wonder. Do you know where she kept her lightsaber? Dor must have intuited her thoughts. In her quarters, with the rest of her kit. You'll take it? Someone should. Dorn nodded grimly. She was always embarrassed to carry it around. That was a sick, blackly funny thought. Embarrassment that killed a tough Mando warrior. Embarrassment of what her own family was. Manda said family was everything. They also said being Mandalorian was everything, like those values could never clash. Tamar reached into the sealed pouch at her hip and drew the lightsaber her grandfather had given her. She thumped the button and a sizzling blade of blue-white light stabbed halfway to the ceiling. You know how to fight with two of them? Dorn asked softly. She barely knew how to fight with one. Her grandfather had, but he'd been an old man when he decided to start teaching. All she had were scraps of memory and gut feeling all tossed together and mostly locked away by mental armor as impenetrable as Besker. She was figuring out how to say that when the door slid open without warning. She found herself staring across the glowing blade at Jevernoches. Mandalor. She bleated and quickly released the switch. Autis stepped in and the door closed behind him. Relax, Skarada. I knew your babor and I know your family secret. There's not much to keep secret, sir. Tamar brushed black hair behind her ear. I swear. Alches regarded them both without expression. The Mandalor was young, still in his thirties and, she had to admit, handsome in a way that was cool and almost aristocratic. He'd only ascended to leadership over Mandalore a few years ago, and while he'd proven himself in combat many times his command skills were still untested. That was about to change, 
and not for the first time she wondered if Alchus really knew the fullness of what he committed them to. Savior was a woman who expected a lot. Maybe he saw that question in her eyes. Maybe not. The mandolin was inscrutable as he said, I've come to decision about the conference at Yagdol. You'll be going with him. Tamar stiffened. Yes, sir. What about me, Mandler? Asked Dorn. You too. I'll have Tempe Kalbana in charge. A clever choice, she thought. Kalbana was Dracelian, a rarity on mostly human Mandalore. There were also a lot of Dracelians in Savire's movement. Like her, they were descended from refugees who fled the Vol and ended up in borderline slavery. Better bring that too. Alta's gesture to the cylinder she clasped in both hands. Sir, in case more GDI freaks go after our employers. She was much better with a blaster than a saber, and always would be, but she said, Yes, sir. Good. That's still two weeks away, but get ready. Will you stay in Senex Juvex, Mandler? Asked Dorn. Of course. Someone's got to prep the war machine. He noticed their expressions. Don't look shabbily surprised. These talks are to buy time. Savior knows it if she won't say it. He tapped his Besker chest plate. She wouldn't have hired us to fight a war if she didn't plan to fight one. It was a pretty valid point. Doran said, We'll do our best, sir. I'm sure you will. Alchus turned, stepped out the door, and was gone. Tamar lowered her lightsaber but still squeezed it with both hands. She didn't mind fighting wars. That was what Mandas did. They fought and died on other beings' credits, usually because those beings were too weak, lazy, or cowardly to die themselves. This felt different. Mando prejudice aside, she knew Jedi didn't charge into ships and start slaughtering indiscriminately. Not real Jedi anyway. She didn't know what was really going on, but she didn't like it. Something her good or her grandfather's nebulous force was telling her that by the end she'd find out the truth. Whether she wanted to or not. When the Mandalorians had departed, Darth Zorn joined Keekin in her private meditation chamber. The newly minted Sith Lord had spent most of the past day there. His intruder, still running on his slave circuit, was hiding in the sensor-blurring gaseous tangles of the shroud. He was starting to feel impatient for the opportunity to slip back to it. The time to slip away would come, but only after his master joined her ship with others from her revolutionary band. You will not be delayed much longer, my apprentice, Zorin said as she stepped into the circular chamber. Keekit had spent the past two hours sitting cross-legged in the center, trying to soothe himself with mild success. I'm not certain Vandron will be satisfied by what I bring back to him. He doesn't have to be satisfied. He only has to continue believing you're the best tool available to him. I am no one's tool except the one Sith's. Yes. But Vandrin is a conceited old goat. Humor him for a little while longer. His time will come. What did you tell the Mandalorians? I blamed the deaths of their friends on a Jedi, of course. Will they believe it? Every sentient in this galaxy believes what they want to believe. Mandalorians want to believe the worst of Jedi, so they will accept what I tell them. I requested that some of them attend Nal to the conference on Yagdol as well. Then more will die and there will still be plenty Mandalorians left. We'll kill a few more, but that will only bind them closer to us. Zorn's smile was amused. These warrior cultures can be pathetically straightforward sometimes. When will I get a chance to call Intruder? We'll be going to Waystation Crash next. You'll be able to slip away there. Will you go back to the world ship, Master? I think so. I want to check on our friend before the rising comes. This will only go to plan if the weapon is ready. The Mandalorians will not be happy when they learn of it. The Mandalorians will do what we pay them to do and die when we want them to die, Zorin hissed. Do not concern yourself with the wishes of lesser beings, Darth Keekin. You are a Sith Lord now. You are one Sith. The rest of the galaxy is vermin to us. Even the Jedi. No, she conceded. The Jedi are our shadow just like we are theirs. We are equals, but opposites. Keegan nodded. In their way, the Sith possessed a deep respect for Jedi, twisted as it was by millennia of hatred.
He knew that more straightforward reverence ran deep through Barabel culture, apparently based on some ancient good deed done by a wandering knight in the days before common space travel to Barab I that knowledge came secondhand, the one Sith had taken him as a child, stained his face red and black to mark their indelible claim on him. They forced him as a dedicated weapon, as opposed to Sith like Zorn, who had joined as adults. Their unmarked faces and years spent among the vermin made them uniquely suited to hide their Sith identity and sow discord throughout the galaxy. In the future, all one Sith would wear their true selves proudly on their faces because all the galaxy would be at their heel. But for now, subterfuge was necessary. I don't care what Vandran or the Mandalorians think of us, Master, Kika told her. I only want to be certain they'll do our bidding. Then you shouldn't worry. Once you understand a being's desires, they become easy to manipulate. And these vermin have simple desires. It is good the Sith exist to rule them, Master. Excellent, Darth Kikid. Zorin smiled. You're thinking like a Sith Lord at last. So be patient. Realize how small the little creatures we command are. And be ready to throw them away when the time is right. Chapter 12 On the ride from Bilbringi to Bastion, Jay Skywalker had listened to Warren enumerate on the differences he'd noticed between the Jedi training centers on Asus versus the Imperial Capital. The mental roster he's gathered was dauntingly long and detailed, and Jade had found herself wondering when he'd had time to figure it all out. The message she got beneath it all was what Warren really did prefer the atmosphere on Bastion and was glad to be going back. Jay supposed that made sense given the similarities between Chiss and Imperial cultures, but it wasn't an opinion she shared. Bastion was too cold, too gray, too strict. But at least she got to see her aunt. She'd heard Jaina Solo Fell was a Martinet teacher of young Jedi, Warren had, in fact, listed it as something in Bastion's favor, but the old woman had never seemed hard to Jade. She was, in fact, as generous devoted a relative as anyone could ask for. Jade wished her relationship with her father could be this easy. The evening after their arrival, Jade joined her aunt and cousin in the Solo family condominium in Ravlin. Davik was still with the fleet and Uncle Jagged was apparently on Coruscan talking politics, which gave the three of them space to spare. Talk started causal at first, but when three Jedi were in the same living room it naturally tended toward Jedi business. At one point Jaina asked her son, have you heard from anyone in the Navy about the pirates you helped them capture? Nothing yet. Did anything come your way? It did, actually. I guess they want to direct all communications through the Academy. How formal and imperial of them. What was it? Jaina got up and grabbed a data pad from her room. She tossed it onto Arlen's sofa and dropped back into her seat. There's not much there. They said that despite their best interrogations, none of the pirates know who they were reselling the stolen ships to. Jay snorted. That sounds unlikely. Especially when they're selling the ship and cargo together, Arlen said as he skimmed the notes. At least we have some description of the ship the buyer used. That's something. He dropped the pad in his lap. Do you think this is worth investigating further? Jaina raised an eyebrow. Are you asking for permission to do what you want? You have to admit it's pretty suspicious when the one guy who's running the operation and presumably knows who the buyer is blows his brains out rather than go to jail. He probably figured the buyer would find him in jail and shut him up, but in a more painful way. Jaina's gaze rolled onto Jade. Sorry. Not a pleasant talk, is it? It's okay, she said. She'd been right there with Arlen and watched the guy turn his blaster on himself. It was a sad, Grim image that had been burned to her brain but she couldn't run away from bad things, not if she was to be a Jedi. She asked her cousin, what more do you think you can do? I was thinking of spinning over to Ralti Iyer and seeing the guy who sent us on this chase in the first place. Chaz has to be curious about where his stolen property went. Do you think that will help? Asked Jaina. I think he'd like to see this. Arlen tapped the data pad. You know Chaz. He's got connections in all corners of galactic commerce that those Navy security agents couldn't even dream of. Legitimate or otherwise, I presume. More or less, yes. Arlen glanced at Jade. No offense, but I don't think you should come with me on this trip. 
I want to know what was going on there as much as you do, she said. But I guess you're right. I can't really tag along as your kid's sister if you and chance to talk up crime bosses, can I? Son, please don't go chatting up crime bosses unless you have to, Jaina said. I have a feeling that'll be up to chance, Arlen grinned and got off the sofa. I think it's start of business hours where he is. I'm going to see if I can patch in a call. Don't let me stop you, Jaina called as he ducked out of the living room. She turned her attention to Jade, who in turn shifted in her chair to look out the window at the lit up raveling skyline. He's right, you know. You should stay here for a while. I know, Jade sighed. It's just that I hear that all the time from my dad. He's trying to help you. You're his daughter. I'm a Jedi too, or trying to be. Ben knows that. But he's lost your mother. He lost his mother. He doesn't want to lose you too. I know, I know. She looked back at Jaina. I'm sorry. It's just, when you were an apprentice, was it like this? Did you really want to be a Jedi? To do what Jedi did and learn what Jedi learned? Then have everyone tell you to slow down and play it safe? A sad smile creased Jaina's face. When I was your age, the U.S. and Vong invaded. We had to be Jedi whether we were ready or not. Jade flushed, ashamed. I'm sorry. I just forget that sometimes. It's good that you do. I lost my brother young. Your dad lost his mother. Your generation got what ours never did. Peace. You can't understand what that means to us, Jade. Nobody can if they didn't grow up like we did. You're right. Of course you're right. It's just, a couple days ago I saw a guy turn his own head to burnt slag, and I don't know why. This doesn't feel like peace, Aunt Jaina. The old woman blinked, shifted in her seat, and blinked again, like she was seeing Jay for the first time. You're right, she said at last. Listen, if you're okay with staying on Bastion for a while, I can give you some one-on-one -on -one training. I can try and teach you things you haven't learned yet on Asus. Would you like that? What Jade really wanted was to go with Arlen and solve this mystery, but she knew a good offer when she heard it. That would be good, thank. But what about Jadrum? What about Morn? They'll probably stay here. But to be honest, I think I'd like a little break from them. Jaina frowned. Are they bothering you? Not intentionally. It's more like... You know, they're not very much alike. I've noticed. Mostly they get along, but I think the more they're together, the more they try to get on each other's nerves. It's like this intentional feedback loop where they try to annoy each other more and more. Jade sighed. Boys are weird. Jade, you're talking to someone who grew up with two little brothers, then raised a pair of sons. Jaina sunk in her chair with a wistful smile. Believe me, I can tell you stories. Are they? Arlen stories. Jaina glanced down the hallway, then turned back to Jade with a conspiratorial grin. Where would you like to start? Despite being born as heir to the Tendrando Corporation and raised by parents who were, frankly put, filthy rich, Lando Calrissian Jr. wasn't generally one to flaunt his wealth. Chance's penthouse in Galactic City was well appointed and roomy without being ostentatious. His personal space yacht was also modestly sized and hid his unique modifications well. Most unknown observers would mistake Chance for a small-time business owner or freelancer instead of what he really was. In all this, Arlen understood, Chance was very much unlike his father, who gone out of his way to dress his dapper capes and shimmer silk shirts even when all he had were the credits in his pockets. Jedi weren't big on showy displays of wealth either, so Arlen was glad for that. He was, therefore, somewhat nonplussed when he arrived at Chance's place on Coruscant and was quickly shoved into the dressing room by his friend's servant droid and told to throw on the expensive business suit hanging in front of him. Arlen knew better than to protest, so he threw the thing on. It fit perfectly, and that much wasn't a surprise. Chance never skimped on details. The servant droid then directed Arlen to a waiting airspeeder and the moment Arlen sat down he was whisked away by the machine's autopilot to one of the highest spires in Galactic City. When he got out, Arlen finally started to understand what all this was about. He'd never been to the Iridian spires before, 
but he'd heard Chance call at the most exclusive drinking establishment on Coruscant, which probably made it the most exclusive one in the galaxy. Chance was prone to bouts of exaggeration, but from the old human host's silently judgmental expression, Arlen gathered that showing up in anything less than the expensive suit he squeezed himself into would have gotten him bodily thrown off the premises. Standing straight and trying his best to sound posh, Arlen said, Good afternoon. My name is Arlen Fell. I believe I'm on your guest list. He'd had no guarantee the spires kept a guest list, but the host seemed to have one in his head. He nodded, very politely, and said, I believe you'll find Master Calrissian at the main bar. Would you like us to take your jacket, sir? I'm quite fine, thank you. Arlen tugged it closed. He'd hooked his lightsaber onto his belt just in case and wasn't keen on showing the thing off. Very well, Master Fell. If you have any questions or requests, please don't hesitate to talk to one of the staff. Arlen nodded and slipped through the door. As expected, the Iridian Spires was soaked in an atmosphere of not just money, but class. The displays of wealth weren't crass. You had to be of a certain kind of breeding to recognize the rare Empress Tita marble used for the floor tiles or know the art pieces suspended from the ceiling were originals from the Mon Cal water artist Govikmer. Any peasant would have appreciated the view, though. A wraparound 360-degree transparent steel window was all that separated them from the clouds streaked highest layers of Galactic City now starting to gleam in late afternoon light. Arlen walked confidently toward the oval-shaped bar counter in the center of the room, which at this hour was only one-third occupied. He knew Chance by the back of his curly head, so he sneaked up from behind to tap the man on the shoulder. Calrissian gave no mark of surprise as he looked over his shoulder and grinned. Ah, uh, Arlen, you made it after all. Sorry if I'm late. I had to find the right suit. Not at all, you're just in time. Take a seat. Chan snapped his fingers and pointed at the bartender. For my friend here a Bedalian sunrise with a shot of Rycanthian whiskey. You're starting me off strong, Arlen said. Nobody makes them better than the Spires. This one's my treat. Chance patted Arlen on the shoulder as he dropped onto the stool. Does that mean I have to pay for the rest? Yes, unless you let me pick your drinks. You're a cruel patron. Please, I'm as benevolent as they come. Chaz leaned back in his seat so Arlen could get a good look at the man he'd been seated next to. It was another human, maybe a little older than Chaz. His head was shaved clean and his shoulders looked broad beneath a suit with an elegant quitty design. Retor of Qvolt, Chaz said. Please meet my good friend, Arlen Fell. Retor raised a brow. Correct me if I'm wrong. But aren't you a Jedi Knight? I am indeed, Arlen shrugged, as though he couldn't help it. He'd been hoping to avoid advertising his Jedi status in this place, but it was too late now. The most he could do was return the favor. Now, correct me I for I'm wrong, but aren't you the newest member of the Kua Drive Yard's Board of Governors? You're not wrong at all, Master Jedi. I'm impressed, Chan said with a look of honest surprise. Since when did you keep up with corporate news, Arlen? Well, it's not like I sit around and meditate all day. Arlen turned his attention back to Retor. If Chance had whisked him away to have cocktails with this man, there must have been a damn good reason. So have you known Mr. Calrissian long, or is he just trying to suck up to you now? Not at all. He's been sucking up to me for years. Redder's smile was easy and unpretentious. Surprising, Arlen thought for a member of the Kuwaiti aristocracy. Maybe the venerable old shipbuilding conglomerate was letting a new breed take over. All right, all right. Chance waved both hands. Retor can't stay for long, but I wanted to make sure the three of us had a chance to talk. Straight to it, good. Arlen asked, what do we have to talk about? You see, I've already been telling Retor about my problem with space pirates on the Hydean. Losing three whole ships is no small matter, the Kuwaiti said. That would have been enough to sink a smaller company. Now, Retor, as you may have heard, there was a little dust-up in Bilbringi recently where those pirates were foiled and captured by some especially capable Jedi Knights. So it was you, then, said Retor. I was wondering. I had a lot of help, Arlen said truthfully. 
I think some of those ships they were trying to steal were KDY products. That's right, but that's not why I wanted to talk about this, said Chance. Do you have the list? I do, in fact. Arlen took a small portable data pad out of his suit jacket. He'd almost forgotten to take it in the rush here. We got this from the Imperial Naval Security Team that's been looking into the personal accounts of the pirates we captured. Is it legal for me to see this? Rator asked like it was a minor issue. Technically, let's just say yes. Before I left, the Jedi Order on Bastion received an official request for assistance in investigating this matter. Which gives me some official weight to throw around. It helps to have family in high places, Rator took the data pad, then added, not that I'm one to talk. So what exactly do you want me to see? The Imperial investigators were able to look into the finances of the pirates they've captured, and it's pretty interesting. Most of them had individual accounts at a handful of banks, some based on Ralti Iyer or Brintal but some were immunalist. The investigators were able to pull the government weight and get the records from the Moonless banks quickly, but the ones from Ralti Iyer and Brintal just came in today. So what am I looking at? Rator frowned. All I see are a bunch of small payments routed through different companies. Exactly. There's no big cash dump. Most of those corporations don't even make payments to more than two or three people out of a couple dozen pirates. And have you heard of those companies? None of them look familiar off the top of my head, but there's billions of listed corporations in the galaxy. I'm mostly familiar with the bigger ones. What I'm guessing is, these guys were paid piece by piece through a whole army of shell corporations. Whoever was buying the stolen merchandise from these guys must have been going really far to cover his tracks. Chan said, you've got more resources to track down these fake companies than anyone, including me. I can look into it. But you know I can't promise anything. Some extra eyes are all I ask. If you come through, I'll waive what you owe me from that Sabic last game. Well, that's an incentive. Rator glanced at the Jedi. I don't suppose he lets you play with him. Arlen shook his head. He claims I have an unfair advantage. Sounds right. Don't let the nickname fool you. Chance only starts playing when he thinks he can win. Rator snorted and picked up the data pad. Can I keep this? Please do, Chan said. And just so you know, this stays between us, understand? Of course. Rator pushed his stool back from the bar counter. Now if you gentlemen will excuse me, I have professional business to attend to. We're looking to expand our facilities on Jending, and their senator wants another bribe. Arlen couldn't tell if he was joking or not, so he just said, good luck with that. It's good to meet you, Master Fell. I've always wanted to share a drink with the Jedi. Chance I will see you later. They waved him off and were suddenly alone at the bar. After a moment of silence, Chance pointed to the alcohol shimmering glass in front of Arlen. You didn't actually touch your sunrise. Slipped my mind, Arlen said, picked up the glass, and swallowed a mouthful. Calling it strong would have been a horrendous understatement, and Chance tried poorly to hide his amusement. So, you go gambling with corporate executives now? Arlen asked after the sting started to fade from his mouth. I am a corporate executive, remember? Yes, but a board member for KDY is about as high as it gets. How did you start hanging out with him? The same way I hang to with anyone. I draw them in using my natural charisma. You let him think he could beat you, right? Chan shrugged. Like the man said, I play when I think I can win. Arlen dared another, smaller sip of the sunrise. It went down better. So he asked, is that our best shot, or do you have other leads you want to look into? I thought you mentioned more. We also have a dinner date. Hope you don't mind the busy schedule. A dinner date? Okay. With whom? Chance told him. Arlen looked down into his sunrise and said, I think I'm going to need one more drink. You're paying? As always, Chance obliged him. Their speeder was waiting for them when they were done, and again they were on their way, slicing through the late traffic and low-hanging clouds the color of sunset. Okay, Arlen said as he settled in the passenger seat, run this by me again. Why are going to go see a hut crime lord? 
He's not a crime lord. Don't even insinuate it. Actually, he'll be very offended. What is he, then? A normal legitimate business owner, just like me. And seriously, don't imply otherwise. He'll go off on you for propagating negative stereotypes. So why are we going to have dinner with a legitimate hub business owner? Because Volgma got two ships stolen by these same pirates. I'm sure he's been looking into this on his own, so I thought we could swap information. Put that was a sounded reasonable. Arlen was started to regret that second sunrise, though. Well, he said, half to himself, this should be different. He wasn't sure what to expect, but Volgma's place still took him by surprise. He wasn't sure if they met at the hut's private quarters or some sub-level of his business office, but the entire place looked disarmingly sleek and professional. There was a noticeable lack of nefarious-looking hangers-on, barely clad dancing girls, and obsequious servants. They were greeted by a female Deveronian in a plain black business suit who escorted them to what looked like a repurposed conference room, with the table laden down with a full variety of food. Volgma, at least, looked very much the hut. He was a big one too, almost ten meters from head to wiggling green-brown tail, which meant he must have been old. He reclined on a broad repulsor sled at the head of the table, and when he spread his stubby army to welcome them, he sat in deep slurred basic, Greetings, Master Calrissian. It's been too long. That took Arlen by surprise. Most huts understood basic fine, and could even speak it, but they usually refused to because they thought it was beneath their dignity. Basic was the language of legitimate business, though, so it looked like Vogma had adapted. Greetings to you too, Master Vogma, Chance gave a little bow. Meet a dear friend of mine, Arlen fell. Ah, a Jedi. Volgma rumbled. Please, have a seat. It has been a long time I met a Jedi. As he dropped in front of a plate of something hot and still moving, Arlen asked, how long was that? Oh, over a hundred years, perhaps. There was a scarcity of Jedi for a time. Now eat, please. I think you'll enjoy the peach kagormalk. I imported that straight from Nal Hutta and had my chef prepare them. Arlen eyed the squirming plate. That's, uh, very generous of you, and of Ogma. He glanced at Chance for help, but his friend just gave him a look that said, Go on, get it over with. So he got it over with. The Bedalian sunrises, at least, had provided a little bit of liquid courage. To delay the second forkful, he asked the hut, So tell me, have you made much progress finding the guys who stole your ships? I heard it was you, Master Jedi, who found them. News gets around. I've always had the greatest respect for the Jedi, you know. The only ones who resent them are evildoers and criminals, and their resentment is based on fear. Arlen took the unsubtle message, and then took more Gormok. As he struggled to get it down, Chan said, the investigation sort of run into a wall. We took them all alive except their captain, and nobody else seems to know who they were stealing ships for. Their payments all seem to have come through shell companies. Yes, the Imperials have already informed me of that much. Volgma's tail twitched. They wouldn't provide me with a list of those companies. I'm not sure why. They wouldn't give me that info either, Volgma. Don't take it personally. Thankfully, we have it anyway. The hut's eyes widened. And you'll provide it. At what cost? No cost. The guys behind this stole from us both, Volgma. I thought we could work together to find out who he really is. Hmm. Your offer is wise and generous. Of course I'll take you up on it. Master Jedi, will you also be helping? That's why I'm here. Excellent. I'm sure you can offer skills I cannot. Now please eat. It's the least I can do for the help. Looking down at his plate and trying not to be suck, Arlen said, Of course. Give my compliments to the chef. A few hours passed, and when they finally went back to Chance's speeder, Arlen was amazed not to be suffering severe indigestion. Gormok is actually not that bad, Chance told him, once you get used to it. Have it a lot, do you? Only when I meet with Vogma, which isn't so often. You don't play sapic with him, then. Afraid not. Our relationship's always been professional. At least, until now. I have to admit, he doesn't seem in the level. 
Best anyone can tell, he has been since before our parents were born. The galaxy is full of wonders, isn't it? I guess so. As they stepped out onto the landing platform, cold wind whipped through the night. Arlen turned his back to it, so he faced his friend head on. Chance. Question. Shoot. What did we accomplish tonight? We didn't actually learn anything new. No, but we set things in motion. We shared information and strengthened connections that will be vital for the future of our project. We ate and drank a lot. That's how business works, Arlen. Food and flattery. Didn't realize that. Well, that's why I'm really rich, and you took monastic vows. Jedi aren't monastic. Well, not usually. Then why are you the one always sleeping on my couch? Before Arlen came up with a good repost, Chance hopped into his speeder, chuckling. All the Jedi could do was follow. Chapter 13 Constantly racked by storms and tidal forces, Yagdal was a most inhospitable planet that had produced a notoriously durable race of sentients. The given could survive the vacuum as well as Yagdal's surface, but for most soft-skinned species neither was hospitable, and the given had accordingly built a series of space stations over the planet through which they interacted with the rest of the galaxy. It was on the largest of those stations that the Alliance had elected to host the latest round of talks to resolve the Synex Juvex situation. In terms of manpower used and media attention garnered, it outsized all other talks combined by many magnitudes. The situation left Jever Hain of two minds. On the one hand, maybe knowing the eyes of the galaxy, were on them just might move the houses toward actual reform. On the other, these talks had turned the space station into an absolute zoo. Alliance security personnel and even some Marines had been brought in to reinforce the station's given police force. While they should have been working together to keep all the delegates, diplomats, and even press agents safe, the practical effect was one of even greater confusion. A part of him wished Chief of State Savash had approved the use of Jedi guards on that station. The other part figured it would have made things even more chaotic. He tried to focus on what lay directly ahead of him at any given him. The talks were one day away, and the delegates from the houses has been arriving one by one for the past two. There were 19 houses in all, and Hain had been there to greet most of them on arrival, though Senator DJO had fielded a few when she could spare the time. There was one arrival they came together to greet. Unlike most of the arrivals, which had been arranged via that station's flight control and scheduled days in advance, the coming of Moran Nall was kept secret from everyone except the senator, the ambassador, and Haynes Averina. The given security team had thrown a fit when they were told about the surprise arrival, but they complied eventually. When Noel's modest Corellian shuttle glided into the station's smallest private docking bay, the party greeting it was small. Alana and Haynes stood in front, with Verena at his shoulder. Two given police officers and four handpicked senatorial guards stood behind them, and that was all. When the shuttle ramp lowered, his own security people were the first ones out. Hain marked a long-headed Dracelian, a burly green-skinned Itaran, and two humans. One had his black hair cropped close to his head, while the other had hers in a jaw-length bob. They looked like they might have been brother and sister. After they gave the hangar a cursory look over, Savire's delegate came down the ramp. Details on her organization were frustratingly scarce, but from what Hain understood, Moran Nall was a longtime crusader for the rights of miners on the harsh desert world of Veridin. Any kind of miners' union was barred by the ruling house Petro, but that hadn't stopped Nall from organizing the workers. The stout, blue-scaled Nasorian didn't look particularly formidable, but he knew any being who'd done what Nall had possessed metal to spare. Elena was one to initiate greetings. To Hain's surprise, she replicated the hands-open gesture Cynix lords used to salute other royalty. Nal clearly recognized the gesture. He blinked in surprise and didn't know how to respond. Then he spread his hands and did the same. Hain was relieved to see he'd gotten the message. Everyone was on equal ground here. It's an honor to meet you, Ambassador Nal, Alana said. I'm Senator Alana DJO, and this is Jever Hain of the Alliance Diplomatic Corps. Yes, I'm familiar with you both. Noel's head looked oversized as it bobbed on his thin neck. I'm glad to be here, of course, 
though I must say I never thought I'd earn the title ambassador. Unlikely things happen every day, Alana said. I'm hoping we can make more of them follow. You sound like an optimist, Senator. Politics is the art of making things possible, Ambassador. If you'll come with me, we'll take you to your quarters. Noel's bodyguards started to fall in close, but he waved them a few steps away so Alana, Hain, and Verena could walk with him as the given police began leading them through the station. A small cadre of aides emerged from Noel's shuttle and followed at the rear of the herd. Tell me, said Noel, am I to be staying in the same habitat as all the other, ah, uh, delegates? We've made other arrangements, Hain said. In the interest of security, of course. I'm afraid they aren't quite as well appointed as the ones claimed by the lords, but you'll still have all the major comforts. Have you ever been to Veridin, Ambassador? I can't say I have. Then you're lucky. I've spent most of my life there. You could stick me in the nearest supply closet and it would be paradise in comparison. We're better hosts than that, I hope. I believe everyone on your staff will have private quarters. Verena. That's correct, sir. And Ambassador Nall, the location of your quarters is also being kept secret from the other delegates. Those of us present here are the only ones who know. Nothing like the threat of constant death to make a being feel at home. Noel's smile was brittle. Tell me, did any of the houses pull out their delegations when they found out I was attending? Surprisingly, no, said Alana. There was plenty of protest, of course, but I don't think any of them were willing to lose face by being the first one to bail. P thought for sure House's Vandran or Petrol would leave. Kalor Vandran has more writing on this than anyone, Hank said. He hosted the last round of talks. He'd look petulant in front of the rest of them and went home. Peer pressure is a wonderful thing, Nal hummed. That goes both ways, Ambassador, Alana warned. There's going to be 19 of them and only one of you. I would say you'll be outnumbered, but that doesn't begin to cover it. Oh, I'm expecting them to try and gang up on me. But the Cynic Shuvex lords are never as united as outsiders think. Interhouse rivalries run centuries deep and none of them really trust one another. You sound well-versed in their politics, Hain observed. I can give you some inside tips before talks tomorrow, if you'd like. I very much would. I was going to come to escort you to the conference center at around 0900 hours. May I come a little early? Feel free to. Maybe you can give me some tips as well. Senator Dejo. I'm afraid someone has to keep all theater's delegates occupied. Alana smiled thinly and passed a glance at Hank. It said, I wish I staked that claim first. When they arrived at their destination, the Dressilian bodyguard stopped them in front of the door and said, Please, Ambassador, let us give the room a thorough search before you enter. Nal looked up at his host. Please don't take offense. It's all right, said Hay. Your people can go ahead. I'm sure they'll find everything is secure. Very well, Nal waved a clawed hand. Go ahead and be as through as you need. When they stepped through the door, and it closed behind them, the four Mandalorians were alone with each other for the first time in days. Tamar Skirata felt the urge to drop her guard and quickly stomped it down. They had work to do. As promised, their temporary living quarters were spacious and included several adjoining suites of single bedrooms. They went from room to room running checks for explosive compounds, trace elements in the air, and potentially poisonous liquids and at one point she heard her cousin mutter, nicer than anything we have on our ships. I guess we should have been diplomats, Tamar told him. Yeah, Mandos are famous for their people's skills. Knows a damned miner. He seems to have picked up people's skills just fine. I guess anyone can learn. By the way, notice who the senator was. I know, the happened GDI queen. Is that supposed to make me feel safer? I don't know, does it? From the adjoining room, their Doran compatriot said, I'd feel a lot safer if we were in full Biscargon. I feel naked without it. Then it's good you only feel naked, Tempe Kalbana said as the four of them converged in the main living room. The Dressilian looked them over and said, Anything. Every room I checked looks clear, Doran said, but we could spend the rest of the day double and triple checking every panel. Did you check everything? 
Yes, sir, Tamar said. Then that will do for now. One of us needs to stay in this place at all times to make sure nobody tries to plant surprises during the conference. Someone will also need to keep night watch. We'll figure out shifts later. Should we call Nolan now? Tempe Cabana took a deep breath, like he was sniffing the air. All right. Makra shall. Let them in. As the iterant went back to the door, the Dressilian leaned close on Tamar's shoulder and said, Any gut feeling? Tamar flinched. She didn't know Tempe Cabana well, and there was no reason for him to know about her family's lingering Jedi blood. Jevernaches must have told him. Nothing out of the ordinary, Tamar said quietly. Hope it stays that way, he replied as the door opened and everyone filed in. She did hope that. Right now she hoped it more than anything. Compared to other mission Darth Keek had performed in service of the one Sith, the assassination of Moran Nall was strikingly easy. Getting aboard the station was the first easy step. Incoming ships were heavily screened by both Alliance and given security teams that even Intruder would have had difficulty slipping past, but Keekit was provided passage by Kalor Vandran himself. Once the Lord Shuttle was safely docked in his berth, Keekit merely waited until he could slip past the guards, then went to join Vandran in the quarters provided for him. The morning before the first day of talks were scheduled, Keekit received his instructions from his supposed master. They met in the old human's dressing room, and Vandran stared at the mirror the entire time, adjusting with his robes and fidgeting nervously. I've heard that Moran Nall arrived on this station yesterday. They're keeping a very tight lid on his location. You need to do something about that. Do you wish him dead, Lord? Kikit, fearsome face mostly shadowed by the hood of his black robes, stood over Vandran's shoulder. Not yet. You need to watch him when he comes to the talks today. Track him when he goes back to his quarters, wherever they are. From there, try to find out where his ship is berthed. You wish to track him? Exactly. That little Nasorian is just Savire's mouthpiece. Killing him gets us nothing. But if he can lead us back to her, that's different. He smoothed his white hair back. Under no circumstances is harm to fall on him. Understood. I can't guarantee the other houses aren't planning something against him. They probably are. If you see indication one of them is, then prevent them. Is that understood? Very lord. Vandran looked over his shoulder and set dark eyes on the bearable. Under no circumstances should harm come to any of the other lords either. If someone does try to kill Nal, you must find out who called for the assassination. I'll deal with the rest myself. Do you understand? Don't be overzealous. Of course, Lord. Kikit hissed and tried to sound chastened. When he'd returned to Carfetti and he had a story prepared about tracking down and executing agents from one of the Hut cartels who'd been hired to assassinate him over a business deal that had gone sour the year before. Vandran hadn't taken it well. He'd been convinced deep down that his nemesis Savyar had tried to kill him and had refused to take Kikit's story at face value. Rather than distrust what his agent had told him, he delivered a long lecture about investigating leads to the fullest and not relying on violence to solve every problem. Deep down, the old human clearly thought his Barabell servant was too stupid to plot against him and placed the blame on mere incompetence. That was fortune for Kikit, but it also grated to be demeaned in such a way. He consoled himself with the knowledge that he was a full Sith Lord now, worthy of the title Darth and he would not have to answer this miserable old man's beckon much longer. Slip away now, before I take my people, and move out, Vandran told him. You will find a place to keep an eye on everything, I assume. The charts you provided me of the station layout will be most helpful. I thought as much. Vandran tugged his robe straight one last time, admired his own face in the mirror, then said, Go on with it, then. Your goal is to make today happen as smoothly as possible. Understood. Yes, Lord, Kikit said, and slipped out the door. The last part, at least, was the truth. Vandran had apparently bribed someone on the local security staff for a full map of the station layout, including secure areas. He hadn't been able to ferret out which safe section the Alliance had whisked Moran Nall to, but it really didn't matter. Kikit already knew. 
Savire's representative trusted his leader implicitly. Therefore, despite bringing alone four Mandalorian warriors, along as part of his security detail, he missed out on the simple fact that a tiny tracer beacon had been placed inside his personal comlink. Therefore, after leaving Kalor Vandran, Kikit slipped into a maintenance passage and began vectoring through the station's interior toward Knoll's quarters. The ship's maintenance and utility ducts had been arranged with typical given efficiency, and Kikit was able to find Knoll quickly. Once he was safely secluded in an air shaft some 10 meters away, he activated the second useful instrument installed in Knoll's comlink. Then he tapped the transmitter embedded in his lobeless ear and listened to the Knoll, saying, Calling House Tanil reformists would be a huge stretch, but I think they have a certain pliability compared so, say, Vandran. What about Anchory? A new voice asked. She does not budge, even if she makes a show of it. House Picturin, though, might bend toward House Taniel if there was a split among the Lord. And then there's House Garanin. What about it? The Nasorian's voice wavered in amusement. Pro Garanin despises Kalor Vandron. I had heard something like that, though I could never tell why. I always understood Garanin was one of the most conservative houses. It is, but Prell and Kalor had a falling out over a woman, oh, sixty standard years ago. They've never stopped fighting about it since. Fascinating. You know, that really explains a lot. I think. I'm sorry, sir, a woman's voice said. But it's time to get moving. Of course, the second voice said. Thank you for the talk. No problem at all, Ambassador Hain, Nal said. Furniture creaked with alleviated weight. Now come, let's get this show started, shall we? The appearance of the Alliance ambassador was an unexpected element. He tried to weigh what that meant, what Darth Zorn would want for him to do. For a second he felt the urge to rush back to a comm station and ask her, but that was foolish. There was no time, and there was a Sith Lord now besides. The choice was his to make. He needed to stay with Nal and complete his mission. And if Jever Hain died along with Moran Nall, well, he imagined it would drive a deeper wedge than ever between the House and the Alliance. Perhaps, Darth Keek had mused, the Force was with him today. When Nall and Hain marched off to do diplomatic battle with the Senex Juvex Lords, Tamar Skarada was left to watch the House. She wasn't happy about staying behind while the other three Mandalorians went off with the Ambassadors, but Tempe Kalbana was right. Someone had to keep this place secure at all times. Still, as she watched them go, a strange feeling settled over her. At first she couldn't place it. As she began another walkthrough of the living complex, she felt like she was being watched. She started checking for monitoring devices again, even though they'd done a thorough check over the night before. After only a few minutes, though, the paranoia was replaced by something else, a grim, deep sense of dread settled in her stomach. She tried to shake it off. She blamed the weird feeling on a number of things. She was far from home. She was alone without Dorn or the other Mandas. She was out of her familiar Besker shell. She was stuck on a bodyguard mission when she'd been trained as a fighter. None of that was big enough, and she decided the real reason for her wordless anxiety was the most obvious. Her sister was dead, killed by a rogue Jedi or Sith. She didn't know the full truth of it. She needed to know the full truth. Without well, it, she'd never feel any closure behind Niall's death. And until that came, everything on this mission would feel wrong. So she settled on that explanation. Getting to the source of irrational emotions was supposed to tame them, but that didn't happen. Instead, her dread got sharp, stronger, until she felt like she was going to overflow with it. Something very bad was about to happen. She knew it, deep down and that cold only mean her grandfather's force was trying to talk to her. Standing alone in Nose quarters, she let out a long, frustrated scream at the top of her lungs. Then she grabbed her comlink and ran out the door. It had been less than ten minutes since they'd left. If she sprinted, she might still catch up. The main conference room aboard the station was located at the exact center of its disc-shaped structure. A broad, Double reinforced transparent steel dome made up the ceiling of the arena shaped chamber, and Alliance staff had installed particle and energy shields over the dome as well for the duration of the talks. 
No effort had been spared in making sure that the delegated would be as secure as possible when they gathered beneath the starry ceiling. The corridors leading into the arena were the weak point. Six different hallways connected to the chamber like spokes in a wheel, and all of them ran directly beneath the station's exterior hull for 100 meters leading into the arena. Kikit had done most of the work last night, once he figured out where in the station Moran Nall was being kept. From there it had been easy to extrapolate which corridor he'd be taken into the arena. It had also been easy to plant a series of thermal detonite charges in the air ducts that ran in the thin space between the hallway ceiling and the station's outer shell. Normally such weapons would have been detected by rigorous security sweeps, but Kalor Vandran had mostly thoughtfully come in a shuttle with special compartments shielded from intrusive scans. Hiding in the dark, Darth Key could track their movements. He listened to the continuing diplomatic blather between Nall and Hain. The two beings seemed to be taking a liking to each other, not that it mattered. His one worry was that Noel would be taken on a different route to the arena but that was not the case. His team was marching right down the corridor where death was waiting. And then suddenly, just as they were entering the long stretch of hallway where the charges were planted, everyone stopped moving. Kikit had no idea why. The hidden transmitter Noel's comlink only picked up sounds immediately adjacent to the source. He heard some muffled voices, but they weren't audible. Kika's mind raced. If he blew the charges now it would open the corridor to space. That would probably be enough to whisk away Nal and the rest into the vacuum, but they were so close to the door leading to the previous corridor. There was a chance, an awful chance that Nal might escape. He rested one claw on the detonator and tried to make out what the voices around Nal were saying. For the first time since being honored by Darth Zorin, he didn't know what to do. Hain and Nal stood shoulder to shoulder, frowning in confusion at the sudden halt. The Dressilian security chief at the front of their column had stopped to answer his buzzing comlink. Now he was hunched over, back to them, speaking quickly but quietly to whoever was on the other end. Hain took a tentative step forward. Excuse me, but is there an issue? The Inoran guard held up a broad green hand and shook his head. No interruptions were allowed. Eh? Hain frowned deeper and looked over his shoulder at the human security officer behind them. The young man gave the tiniest shrug. He didn't know what was happening either. Finally, the Dressilian shut off his comlink and asked, Ambassador Hain. Is there another corridor we can take to the conference room? Hey frowned. Well, yes. There's six total, but we'd have to loop back. It would take, say, five more minutes. Is there a problem? The Dressilium looked right at Nall. It would be best if we took another route, sir. What was that call? Hey demanded. Did you discover a threat? The stone-faced guard looked suddenly confused. I think it would be best to take a new route. Being in danger was bad. Not knowing if they were in danger was even worse. Hain had been in the diplomatic service for over 30 years and he'd had his life threatened more than once, but at least those times he'd known what the danger was. The Dressilian kept staring at Nall. This was, after all, his party. The Nasorian hesitated, then asked Hain, Can you lead us to another corridor? Of course, Ambassador. Follow me. He took two steps back toward the door through which they'd come, and then the corridor exploded. Everyone was knocked the deck. Flame and smoke and light all died as quickly as they'd come. There was a rush of wind gushing out into the vacuum, and Hain realized what was happening. He scrambled for something to grab onto but the walls, and floor were all so smooth. He scraped fingernails against plastic that slipped out from under him. The floor fell away, and he was in the air. Null, smaller than the rest of them, was sucked first into the great hole that had been opened in the ceiling. Then the Dressilian went. The Atora's head slammed hard against the ceiling on the way out and he stopped struggling as he was carried away. Hain tried to grab hold of the tattered hole even as he was pulled through it. For a second he looked back and saw the door at the far side of the corridor, the one they'd come through, the door that could have saved them. It was wide open, and the dark-haired female bodyguard who stayed behind was filling his frame, reaching one hand out toward the one who looked like a brother. He seemed to be floating weightless but hadn't been pulled away like the rest of them. 
How strange, Hain thought. And then the charred plastil edges slipped out from under his bleeding hands, and he was falling, spinning, spiraling into cold black forever. With one hand gripping hard to the threshold of the door, Tamar stretched out the other to grab hold of her cousin, even as the air rushed out from behind her. It was pushing her as hard as it could into the void, but she wouldn't let go of the door, wouldn't let go of Dorn, even though he didn't have hold of him at all, not with the flesh and blood hand wrapped in her dead sister's gloves. She had him in the force. She hadn't even done it consciously. She'd opened the door just seconds after the explosive charges went off. The air had already been gushing out but Dorn, he'd been closest to the door, and even as Nall and Hain and Mach Rachel and Tempe Kalbana were pulled through the gap he'd reached out and willed him not to fall away like the rest of them. He hadn't. The gushing air lifted him off his feet and tugged him toward the gap torn through the ceiling, but he didn't fall away. For a long second Tamar was surprised by what she'd done. From his expression, so was Dorn. Then she concentrated and pulled. Even as the air tried to carry them both away, she slowly reeled him in. She found the desperate, angry need inside of her, the need not to fail. Niall was dead, but not Dorn. Never Dorn. She wouldn't let it happen. She pulled him toward her, slowly, steadily, even as the gush of air started to thin because it almost all of it had been sucked away. She pulled him so close their hands touched. She grabbed him through Niall's glove and pulled as hard as she could, with the force with every muscle in her body. They both fell back through the threshold, out of the broken corridor. Dorn had the presence of mind to slap the door control panel as they fell. It slammed shut behind them, sealing them off from the vacuum. Alarms wailed, and resupplied oxygen hissed urgently through the corridor's vents, but Tamar barely noticed. She and Dorn collapsed on top of each other, panting, exhausted, both amazed to still be alive. Then everything else settled in. Mach Rachel and Tempe Kalbana were dead. Hain was dead. Nal was dead. They'd been sent on this mission, and they failed utterly. The price would be high for them, the billions of beings in Synex Juvex, the galaxy itself. But they were alive. She told herself that again and again until she found the strength to rise. They could fight another day. In normal times, Alana found some comfort in staring out a viewport at the icy constancy of the stars. It was a way to remind herself that no matter difficulty seemed so important at any given time, the universe would march on forever. As she stood in her quarters aboard the station, looking out at all the tiny lights against the black, her mind kept reeling back to Nal and Hain, floating frozen through the vacuum. There was no peace in that thought, but she found it was still preferable to turning around the facing Kalor Vanjan head on. There's no way the conference can continue now, the old man was saying. The delegates from Houses Garanin and Picturin have already left. They're afraid for their lives. You should have never called for a conference if the Alliance couldn't guarantee the safety of them. I understand, Lord Vandran, she said firmly, bitterly. Better than you? Yes. Yes, Ambassador Haynes' death is a great tragedy. Though I do wonder why he was with Nal in the first place instead of with you and the rest of us in the arena. People are asking questions about what they were doing together before the talks. Are you insinuating something? She stared very hard at the abyss. I'm only saying that now the gossip will be uncontrollable. Saviar is going to make Nal into martyr. We all know that. She's going to place blame on his death on me, personally. It took all her Jedi training not to give in to her anger. A lot of beings are going to suggest that, Lord Vandran. He took a moment to reply, as though he were frozen in shock. When he did speak, he was angry. What are y'all implying, Senator? If you mean to say something, be out with it. I implied nothing. I'm sorry if you thought I was. He snorted. Typical obfuscation. The Alliance was supposed to provide security for this event. It's your fault what happened here today, not mine. The worst of it was that he was right. This entire conference had been her stratagem, and it had blown up in the worst way possible. Two good beings were already dead, and more were likely to follow. She couldn't take any more. Spinning around, she said, Lord Vandran, what happened today is the sole and absolute responsibility of the people who killed Moran Nall. And we will find out who was responsible, 
and the whole galaxy will know. Do you understand me? He met her glare with indignation, not reproach. Absolutely. Whoever was responsible, I hope you catch them. But don't you dare hint I might be connected. Don't dare. Because I was not. They held each other's angry stares for a long moment, until Alana decided she believed him. Part of it was the hoarse exhaustion in his voice. Mostly it was the force. Kalor Vandran usually guarded his emotions, but right now he was seething with what felt like righteous frustration. No, he hadn't killed Moran Null. She says he was most angry at someone, though, someone who wasn't her. Do you have any idea who might have been responsible? She asked finally. A little tension leaked out of him. No, I truly don't. House Garanin, perhaps. Our House Casino. But it was not me. She sensed again that he was telling the truth. Almost apologetically, she asked, When will you be going back to Carfedian? As soon as possible. He straightened his robes and gave her one last long look in the eye. Goodbye, Senator Joe. I doubt we'll see each other again. I hope otherwise. In a sad, strange way, she did. This crisis isn't going to go away. You're right. It's going to get much, much worse. We all have to prepare for that. With the swirl of Dramash and Silk, he was gone. Alana let herself lean back against the cold, transparent steel window. She tried to imagine all of what was to come. Anger at Noel's death. Violence. A crackdown by the houses. The formal withdrawal of Cynic's Juvex from the Alliance. Another hapes. The enormity of the failure was too much. She stumbled to the nearest sofa and collapsed onto it. She closed her eyes and tried to imagine what it would be like to run away from it all, to shirk her title, and all the awful responsibility of power and live in some state of hermetic mediation far, far away. To do what her mother had done. It felt so tempting, because she knew it could not be done. Chapter 14 When news of the disaster at Yagdol came down, Jagged Fell was still on Karuskin. It was early evening in Galactic City, and he'd been about to depart on the too long, too familiar return route to Bastion, but he put the trip on hasty delay so he could watch some of the fallout. The collapse of the talks came quickly and as expected. The various delegates from the house returned to their throne rolls and Synax Juvex, some staying long enough to talk to Alliance investigators and others not. After that there was a pause where everyone waited with held breath to see what came next. It wasn't in Jag's nature to just wait and see. His list of contacts on the capital was diverse and extensive, and after a few quick come messages he was able to arrange a meeting with one of the most familiar. He arrived at the Alliance Naval Command Headquarters complex as the sun was climbing up through Galactic City's forest of spires and the lines of speeder traffic were starting to thicken in anticipation of morning rush hour. He passed those familiar security gates and was escorted down familiar hallways until he stepped into the office of his cousin, Admiral Sayal, Antilles. Sayal had been named after her aunt, Jag's mother, and now that she got an older he started seeing a resemblance. Like Jag's, her once bronze hair had been turned mostly gray after a lifetime in service of the greater good. Once long, it now hovered in a sharp bob a few centimeters above the shoulders of her blue uniform. Jag was used to finding her behind her desk. Sile's days as a frontline fleet admiral were behind her, and now she mostly worked in an administrative capacity. It was, he thought, a good thing for her now, though she looked suitably grim as he sat down in front of her. We've got a meeting with Chief of State Savash in two hours, Sile told him. Though we implied other top-ranking military officers. I won't be long. I wanted to sound out the situation before I go back to Bastion. She sighed. We're all waiting and seeing right now, Jack. But we're preparing for the worst. Admiral Primvold's recalling the Third Fleet to the Saswana Sector. If he has to intervene in Senex Juvex, it'll be easy to do so from there. Intervene how? And with how much force? That depends on what happens, doesn't it? Her voice was annoyed, tense. Jack. Are you sounding me out as you, or as the official Imperial Liaison? Right now me? What, by the time I get back to Bastion, I'll be Liaison again? If there's something you think Admiral Warhaven should know, tell me no so I can tell him. So both, she sighed. 
everything's so up in the air right now. Everything's confused. I will say that if too many people start getting killed, we will take action. Against the houses. Against whoever's doing the killing. Noel's death has the people in Synex Juvex at their breaking point. It might just be the spark needed to set off a general uprising. I know, Jag growled. I can't believe someone from the houses was stupid enough to kill him. They may have signed their own death warrant. The houses are a fossilized aristocracy that hasn't changed in a thousand years. Their leaders are terrified of losing their historic privileges and has made them do foolish things. Foolish is a mild way of saying suicidally moronic. The point is, Jag, we're preparing a peacekeeping force. Hopefully we'll only have to intervene on a few worlds. I for intervene at all. Sevas still needs to get authorization from a Senate vote, which looks like it'll pass, but you never know. The point is, we need to head off violence before it spins out of control. When you talk to Admiral Urhaven, let him know that. We want this to be a limited action, but we're prepared to see it through. Jag raised an eyebrow. Is that Lonic Savash's position? Savash is cautious. He's been making his case to senators ahead of the vote tomorrow, and he's been stressing any intervention will be limited. He doesn't want to be known as the chief of state to break the long peace, but he doesn't want to stand back and watch it break itself either. He'll do what's right. What does admirals tell him to, you mean? Her smile was tired, Riddle. What else? Here's the real question. Will he invoke the Treaty of Annexes? Ten silence passed between them? The agreement had been drawn up 30 years ago as a means to bind the galaxy's great powers closer together. It declared that an attack on one was an attack on all, and if the Bothans, for example, were attacked by a non-signatory power like the Happens, Huts, or U.S. and Vong, then the Core Worlds, the Empire, and even Senex Juvex would be legally obliged to help Bothans defend themselves. In practice, it had never been invoked. Let me put it this way, Sial said at last. He shouldn't have to. You mean that the Empire should recognize the common duty it owes to the people of the Alliance and donate warships to keep the peace in Synex Juvex? Exactly. Well, it's a good thing I was planning to tell Warhaven that anyway. I'm glad we're on the same page. So am I? Jag leaned back in his chair. Davek's ship was part of the big combat exercises we just held at Bill Bringy. Sayal instantly took his meaning. He knows what he signed up for. Still, sometimes I wish I'd been able to convince my children to go into civilian life like you did. Arlen's not in the military. No, Jack said. He took after his mother, which is so much worse. Jedi are tireless meddlers. And you're not. He glanced out her window at the rosy morning sky. Point taken, Sayal. Point taken. There were riots, of course. They started out on Veridan, Moran Noel's homeworld, and despite preemptive action by House Petro's security forces, they quickly spread across the planet. The other riots did not so much as spread out from the battered mining world so much as they sprouted up of their own volition, almost simultaneously. Demonstrations on crowded port and trading planets turned violently quickly, especially when security forces attempted crackdowns. A stampede on Vorsbane killed over a hundred civilians as well as a dozen House Picutorian troops. A building filled with servants and clerks for House Araba was bombed on Masubir. House Casito's great grain fields on Asiathor were set to burn by packs of arsonists. And on Fingren, House Vanjan's greatest agri-world, vandals and anarchists had turned the two main spaceports to havoc and were destroyed any house property they could find. All of that went on for almost three full standard days before Saviar finally made her broadcast. Kalor Vandran watched it all in the privacy of his estate on Carfedian. The falling started out somber and personal. She recounted the first time she'd met Moran Nall face to face, a secret meeting on Malador, she said, followed by the last time they talked before his fatal trip to Yagtol. The Nasorian had been well aware of what he risked by stepping into a station filled with enemies, she said but with characteristic gentle bravery he'd gone anyway. Saviar then skipped over his actual death and gave a short summary of his life, highlighting his bravery in standing up to the cruel slave masters on Veridin and paid tribute to those following his example now. 
From there it got more and more political. The ones expressing their discontent on Veridin and Masubir and Fangren now, she said, were not just carrying on Noel's spirit, they were his spirit. The security forces from the houses were the brave Nasorian's murderers. As always, she stopped carefully short of actually endorsing violence against the government, but she ended with a call to action that was hard to interpret as anything else under the circumstances. The whole take made Vandran angry, but at least it had been what he'd expected. Through that anger he noted a few curious things. For one, she'd carefully avoided any mention of the actual conference through her entire speech. Rumors would have spread news of Noel's death, vivid and clear, and recounting them would have taken words away from more urgent uses. Likewise, she hadn't actually accused any of the houses of murdered Noel, because most of her audience already believed in anyway. She'd also neglected to mention to Galactic Alliance at all, not even the ambassador, who'd been killed with Nal. He'd half expected her to implore Karuskin for help, but it seemed Savyar was intent on tackling the situation under her own terms, without outside interference. Vandra knew a canny political player when he heard one. Savyar might have been a firebrand, but she was no fool. That was all the more reason to do what had to be done. When he summoned Kika to his quarters, the bearable was quick in coming. As always, the Black Hood cast shadows on his fear-striped face. His reptilian slit eyes watched Vandran warily from beneath them. Alien body language was so hard to read, but Vandran wanted to believe Kikid was ashamed for his failures. He had every reason to be, after what happened on Yagtal. I am giving you a mission, Vandran said. This one is so simple even you should be able to do it. What is that, Lord? You know what it is. You're to find Saviar and kill her. It's the only way this madness can end. You can do it, can't you? I hired you on your reputation as an assassin. Clearly you aren't up to tracking or guard work, but I hope you're still capable at murdering things. Aren't you? As you say? As you say? Vandran sneered. Stop being obsequious. It doesn't fit you. Just do as I ask. Do this one simple thing and I will perhaps overlook some aspects of your failure so far. Do you understand? Kiki bobbed his head. What happens if killing her doesn't not stop the riots? Then we will stop them. Every head that rises up will be shot off. There will be no mercy for traitors. The Alliance. He snorted. Let them cry. Let them kick us out of their pointless little coalition. They're toothless, utterly toothless. The houses have governed these sectors for 1,000 years, and we won't let them fall to anarchy, not on our watch. We've beaten the rabble into submission before, and we'll do it again. It's as simple as that. Vandran couldn't tell how much of that got through to Kika's alien brain. He blinked and asked, Do you wish for reports, Lord? Reports? No. Don't try to contact me. You never know who might be listening. Just kill the witch. Even you can understand that. Find her, kill her, and don't come back to me until that's done. Yes, Lord. Now go. Get out of here. I don't want to see you again unless you have Savire's blood on your hands. Is that clear? Very. Until we meet again, Lord. Kika turned and was gone. Vandran stared at the door for a long time. Kika had spoken those last words with such casual confidence. Vandran didn't know what to make of them. Deep down, he didn't really believe he'd see Kikit again. The bearable had been useful in some ways, but clearly the alien wasn't up to the tasks Vandran needed him for. Hiring a human agent would have been better, probably, but it was too late to regret all the mistakes already made. Vandran sighed and went to retrieve his comlink. He needed to call the head of security on Fangren and talk to him directly. So far the man had been taken too cautious and approached to the rioters. Anarchy only spread if you were complacent enough to let it. Order had to be laid down by any means necessary. When he returned to his ship, Darth Kikit removed the audiovisual recording device he'd attached to the inside of his hood and plugged it into Intruder's main computer. It took only a second to upload the data. After that, he brought the communication system online and hailed Darth Zorn. He waited almost a minute before the falling woman's face appeared on the cockpit holo projector. Speak, Darth Kikit. 
Lord Vandren has tasked me to find and kill Savyar, he said without humor. I'm surprised it took him so long. Zorn's grin was slanted. What else? I've recorded the incident and can transmit it now. He spoke very candidly on other topics also. Ah, that was very clever. Did he refer to you by name at any point in the conversation? No. Then it should be fit for public release. You won't be able to go back to him once we send it out, of course. He said to only return if I had Savire's blood on my hands. Then the problem is avoided. Where should I go now? Zorn went thoughtful. Stay in the region of Carfedian and wait, I think. Hopefully you'll have one last task there. Are you at the world ship, master? I am. Our U.S. Hinvong friend has prepared things accordingly. Then we'll reveal ourselves. Not yet, but soon. I've waited a long time, master. I can wait a little more. She nodded. Send me your little recording. That should hasten things on just a bit. When Kikit killed the hollow connection, he sent the data package across the same encrypted transmission. When that was done, he shut off the comm and began to warm the engines. He'd rather be at Darth Zorn's sight as they moved the rising into his next stage, but he knew there was a plan, and the plan had to be adhered to. The one Sith were not the Sith of old, always jabbing knives in each other's backs and climbing over the corpses of former allies to imagine glories. He and Zorin both served a greater goal. Besides, he had a good idea what his last task on Carfedian would be, and he was looking forward to it. Again and again in time of crisis the question reared his head, what was to be done? Specifically, what were the Jedi to do? The decentralized nature of the Jedi Order made deciding these things tricky. The Academy on Bastion and the Temple of Asus were just two of nearly a dozen sites the Jedi had staked across the galaxy. That police had been decided by Jay's grandfather and furthered by her father. They'd reasoned that locking the entire Order up in one building on Coruscant or one planet in the Outer Rim only isolated the Jedi from the galaxy they were meant to serve. By establishing local headquarters on planets like Bastion, the Jedi became closer to the people hopefully more helpful and less mysterious. Even that plan had downsides. The Skywalkers knew that better than anyone. Before she was born, a secret Jedi Academy had been hosted in the Hapes Cluster. The attempt to publicly rejuvenate it and create a permanent Jedi presence has sparked the reactionary nobles to finally oust Queen Mother Tenokai DJO and purge their territory of Force users. The mess in Synex Juvex was different. There was no anti-Jedi cause lurking behind the unrest there. In fact, the Jedi seemed utterly irrelevant as a millennium of pent-up violence finally seemed ready to crest. Standing back while millions or even billions of innocent lives were at stake was not the Jedi way, which was why Grandmaster Ben Skywalker had called a rare conclave from the members of the Jedi Council scattered across the stars. Such a conclave was conducted via a very secure, encrypted network of hyperlink communications. It was not meant to be eavesdropped on by anyone, even other Jedi not on the Council. Therefore, Jay Skywalker felt tense, guilty, and also a little bit excited as she sat in the corner of her aunt's chamber, out of range of the holo transmitter's viewfinder, as Master Jaina Solo spoke with six flickering blue holo images representing the other Council members. Any action we take in Synex Juvex will be tricky, Jaina was saying. She'd been the one to suggest her niece secretly watch these talks, and Jay still wasn't sure why, but it definitely wasn't an offer to turn down. Normally the Order is only permitted to act on worlds where we've been given express permission by the local governments. Right now you could argue whether there is a legitimate government in Synex Juvex. If we ask for permission from the houses we'll surely be turned down, Siha Dorval said. She was a red-haired woman a little older than Jay's father. Frankly, I don't think we want to ask them. It would just confer on them a legitimacy, and I'm not comfortable with that. Yes, we've all seen that. Candid holo recording of Kalor Vandran, the ancient Jedi Master K. Crux shook Shaggy his head. An often reclusive Jedi of the Old Republic and survivor of the Clone Wars, the whiff is huge and fearsome looking appearance belied his pacifist nature. The Order shouldn't be an accomplice to beings like that. I agree with all of you, Jay's father said. 
In the holo, he was sitting cross-legged on a stool, leaning forward with elbows on knees. But Jaina's point still stands. Since the authority of the houses is in question, to put it mildly, I intend to go to Chief of State Savash and ask for his permission to insert Jedi into the sectors. And if he refuses, ask Kalmar Abbas, a Kreviki Jedi who ran another academy, on Watery Bestie. I don't think he will, Ben said. Not if we restrict ourselves to mercy missions only. Can you be sure, though? Master Dorvald asked. I think Savash is going to try and keep this mission as uncomplicated as possible. He might not like us butting in. This situation is already as complicated, said the brittle but firm voice of the council's oldest member. Despite his lined face, his messy white beard and form-concealing cloak, there was an intensity in Kype Duran's eyes that, Janet said, had never really changed in all his life. That is true, K. Crook said, but Chief of State Savage. He has his duty, and we have ours. If the Jedi sit aside and don't lift a finger to help, we'll be as guilty as the ones who killed Moran Null. A grim silence passed through the group. Jade had heard all the stories of what Kype Durin had done in his time the good, the bad, the outright horrible. Anything he said seemed to carry an extra weight. The law is the law, Durin said, casually dismissive. The Jedi are the Jedi. We serve the Force and nothing else. If the law doesn't do the right thing, then we bend it. Or break it if we absolutely have to. Then what should we do here, Master Durin? Ask Techly, the stout and grayfur Chandra fan who ran an academy for healers on Icy Renvar. We don't need to bend or break rules, Jaina said. We just need to find a way around them. Ben smirked knowingly. Suggestions. Just think back a month ago. A mix of masters, knights, and apprentices barged into an Imperial War Games exercise, saved some ships, and got lauded for it. And a week before that, Two very capable apprentices helped a certain senator save some lives on the Vandron homeworld. Jaina refrained from throwing a knowing wink in Jay's direction, but her tone hinted enough. The girl fidgeted uncomfortably. That was different, said Ben. Elena invited them as her guards. They were there legally. One pattern I've noticed, Dorval said, is that people are a lot more willing to overlook us stepping over some lines if it works to their advantage. It's easier to ask forgiveness than ask permission, Kype Dern said. Perhaps, K. Crook grunted, but it is better to have permission than need forgiveness. We are moving away from the core of the issue, Master Boss clacked his pincers, a creviky call for order. If Savash grants Jedi permission to run mercy missions into Synex Juvex, good. If not, then we ask forgiveness later. Kype and Jaina nodded agreement, but Jay couldn't tell what the others thought. The question then, boss went on, is what we do once we are there. We could not snap our claws and instantly solve centuries of mountain anger and injustice. This conflict is far bigger than us. Which is why we need to do anything we can to alleviate suffering, Techly said. Master Skywalker, I'm willing to send every healer I think is capable to Synex Juvex. There are millions being hurt or injured as we speak and I'm sure most of them don't have access to proper medical help. That's a very good point, Ben nodded. In fact, you're the first thing I'm going to mention to Savash. An offer like that is pretty much impossible to turn down. Hopefully that can help us get our feet in the door for more. Such as, ask Dorvald. Food. Equipment. Supplies. People there need a lot more than force healing. Master Skywalker and you thinking of actual I back in the Rebels? Durin asked. Jay couldn't tell if he was skeptical or hopeful or both at once. I hesitate to call them Rebels just yet. Right now it seems to be like a lot of angry people with no real organization. What about Savyar? Asked Dorvald. From what I can tell, nobody knows how organized she really is, Jaina said. Not even Alliance or Imperial Intel. This wouldn't be happening without her, Dern said. She's at the center of everything. Do you suggest we make contact with her? Boss asked. Dern seemed to consider that. It was Ben who stopped him, saying, Right now I want to stay clear of anything overtly political. 
The last thing we want is the galaxy seeing us as kingmakers. No, we'll give mercy to anyone who needs it. That included rebels, people displaced by the rebels, and anyone caught in the crossfire. We'll need to make sure we don't get in that crossfire, Jaina said. Whether we go in under alliance auspices or not, we're going to need more than just healers. No offense, Techly. The Chadra fan dipped her broad nose in a sign she took none. K. Crux said, we will need Jedi experienced in fighting. And they should be with the healers at all times. Agreed. Jaina looked at Ben. Any objections? His smile was gentle. None. You've all been reading my mind. Scary thought, Dern grunted. I'd volunteer my services, but I'm not as quick on my feet as I used to be. Don't worry, Kype. We'd only send you after there's nobody else in the order left, Jaina said with a smirk. I'm going to leave it to all of you to decide which Jedi should go. I don't need everyone. Barry Master Techly's healers, I want, say, a dozen of your best. That will be more than enough for now, I hope. We will take time to consider, Ba said. You have two days, and that's it, said Ben. Understood. Understood, Master, Techly said. Is that all for now? I think so, Ben said. You can get in touch with me individually anytime you want. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. There was a short chorus of yes, Master Skywalker, and then the holos began to wink out. First went Dorvald, the K Crook, then Dern and Techly, and Boss. Finally, it was just Jay's father as a flickering blue ghost, staring at his cousin from across light years. Well, Jaina said, I thought that went well. Didn't you? Well enough for a start, Ben said. He didn't seem relaxed now that the rest were gone. Well, what do you think? About who I'd send? I'm not sure about Arlen. He's still on Coruscant with Chance and apparently they've just started making some leads on their whole pirate investigation. After a pause, Jaina said, If you want me to go, Ben, I'll go. He nodded. I think you should, just to oversee things. I can't still handle myself in a fight. I'm not a broken old man like Kype. I'll tell him you said that. Believe me, I've called him worse. Jaina smiled as she said it. Then she turned her eyes right on Jade and said, I have other suggestions too. Ben gave a long sigh. Jade, are you there? She swallowed and said, Yes, Dad. I should stop trusting your aunt. He shook his head as Jade shuffled beside Jaina into the holo transmitter's recording range. Did you see it all? She nodded. Jaina said, It was my idea, Ben. Don't blame your daughter. The thought never crossed my mind, he said dryly. Jade, what do you think? She folded her hands in front of her, intertwining fingers so tightly they hurt, but she kept the nervousness out of her voice. Dad, I don't want to just sit here, not when the Jedi are doing something important. Every Jedi feels like that but not all of them are going to go. I know, Dad. But I feel like I was there when this thing started, with Alana at Carfedian. This started long before any of us, Jade. You're right. But I feel like I was torn away from something when I shouldn't have been. He didn't react to the accusation, finally voiced aloud. She went on, I don't want that to happen again. I'm not going to learn to be a Jedi if I'm always getting yanked back just when I'm starting to really feel like one. You're still an apprentice, not a full Jedi, and the situation there's more dangerous than ever. I know. But I'm never going to be a Jedi by playing it safe. Dad, I know about what you went through growing up. They were awful things, and you shouldn't have had to experience them, but they made you what you are today, and that's a great Jedi. And you want to make sure I never go through what you did. You want to protect me? I understand that, especially with what happened to mom. But I don't want to put myself in danger, but I should. If I don't, then I'm no real Jedi at all. Her father's blue electric face stared at hers across the gap, stern and considering. Finally, his eyes slid to Janus, and he said with the tone of defeat, It was a good speech, wasn't it? I thought so. All right, Ben sighed. I think, I think it would be all right if you went. But Master Mjallu has to go with you. Not a problem, Jade nodded. What about Jodrum and Warren? I suppose they can go too, 
but only if they want to, and only if you don't pressure them. She nodded again. Jodram went wherever she did, and Warren was even more desperate to prove himself than she was. Jade had a feeling neither of them would need any pressure at all. She kept a smile off her face, though. Very seriously, she said. Thank you, Dad. I mean it. Thanks so much. You'll call me again before you muster out. Of course, Dad. May the force be with you. You too, Dad. And Jaina. Yes, Ben. Next council meeting. No eavesdroppers. You've got my word. The holo abruptly disappeared, leaving Jade and Jaina alone in the cool, dark chamber. Feeling suddenly dazed, Jade lowered herself to the floor next to her aunt. Jaina slipped an arm across her back and squeezed her shoulder. You're welcome, by the way. Thanks. Thank you. I just wasn't expecting that. But you wanted it, right? Yeah, I did. Wanting things is easy, Jaina said, and her upbeat expression became serious. Looking Jade right in the eye, she said, getting what you want and dealing with it, and all the unwanted stuff that comes along with it, that's the real challenge. And you'll probably have to face it when you're not ready. I guess that's part of my training, too. Jay tried to smile. Yes, Jaina said, still serious. That's what being a Jedi is. Chapter 15 So far in their investigation, Chance had taken Arlen to a high-level cocktail lounge and a private feast. Before this meeting, Chance had warned him it was going to be very different. But as they walked through the entryway of a mid-rise tower owned by a company called Gemstone Transit Limited, he couldn't see much difference. As they rode the lift up the highest levels, he asked, Are you sure this guy's a criminal mastermind? Because his place looks pretty legitimate to me? Mastermind is a little overdoing it, but Gemstone Limited is legitimate. That's the whole point of having a front. He launders money through Gemstone that he makes on his illegal activities. Most of this company's clients don't even know how dirty his hands are. How do I know? He got a warning glare for an answer, so Arlen tried another question. Does this guy know you know? That thinks I know. Do you know that? Or do you think he thinks you know? Chance rolled his eyes. Stop it. You're confusing me. Seriously? This is important. No, it's not. It won't even matter because in 10 minutes he's going to know I know for sure. Which is going to change my relationship with Gemstone Transit Limited a lot, by the way. Arlen wasn't going to apologize. It's important, Chance. Yeah, yeah, don't remind me. As the lift slowed to a halt, he straightened his suit jacket and breathed, showtime. When Tomar Gresh came out to meet them, he gave Chance a big backslap and hug. To Arlen, introduced only be first name. He gave a firm handshake. After that, all three of them retreated to a lounge with soft sofas and chairs angled to face a broad skyline view. Gresh poured three glasses of Jorian brandy and offered it as a toast. So far, it really did seem like the rest, but that wouldn't last long. It's good to see you again, Chance, it really is, said Gresh after a few minutes of pleasantries. He was well-dressed, well-groomed, and well-spoken but in a way subtly different from old money like Retor of Kovolt or Vogma. I certainly don't mind you stopping by, but I was wondering if you had a reason. I do, actually. Chance hunts forward, closer to Gresh. You might have heard about a group of pirates that got caught in Bobringi last month. I did hear about that. Gresh's eyes darted briefly to Arlen, but the Jedi couldn't get a read on whether this guy knew who he was. Did you also hear, they stole three of my ships? Vessel, cargo, everything gone? I'm sorry to hear that, Chance. Can you get them back now? Nope. Nobody's been able to figure out who these pirates fenced them to. Seems like everything was a real top secret thing. Only their captain knew for sure, and he's dead. Kent and Dandro handle a hit like that. We might be in the red for a few months, but we'll be okay especially since the Imperials agreed to redistribute some of the funds from the pirates' accounts back into mine. It's as close to compensation as I'll ever get. So all of these pirates were captured. Except the captain. But the point is, the Imperials were able to gain access to these guys' financial records. 
It seems that these guys have been getting their payments routed through a bunch of shell corporations I'd never heard of. Covering their tracks well, then. Impressively so. If someone's trying that hard to hide it makes me curious, so I did some digging on my own. He took out a slim data pad and set it on the table in front of Greshk. A friend of mine with even more resources than me was able to pull registration records on a lot of those companies. Greshk picked it up and looked over the data retort of Kovot had retrieved. Not much to see, he said. Yes and no, Chance went on. A lot in those records is confidential, but if you go through enough to see a pattern. Out of almost 30 companies, 25 are officially consolidated on one of four different outer rim worlds. More importantly, those 25 were all created between 12 and 18 months ago. Very interesting, but I'm not sure what it has to do with me. Gresh gave the data pad back. From what Arlen could tell, he meant what he said. He really didn't know. Well, it got me thinking, said Chance. If someone created all these fake companies a year and a half ago, and started buying a ton of stolen ships starting six months ago, then somebody's been planning this for a little while. Gresh shrugged. Less than two years isn't long in business terms. Not necessarily. Sometimes a lot happens in a short time. So I got to thinking what started happening a year and a half ago. And you know what I came up with? Do I have to guess? Gresh looked guarded now. The one thing that jumped out at me is that the Glitterstone market exploded again. I mean, bam, that stuff started selling all across the galaxy overnight in huge amounts. I didn't know you follow the traffic of illegal substances, Gresh said. Very cold now. I normally don't, but you see, I have a certain interest in Glitterstone. A personal one, actually. For a time, my parents owned the spice mines of Castle. Did you know that? Tangerando Enterprises had a monopoly on all the Glitterstone pulled out of there. And being upstanding corporate citizens, my parents made sure all of was sold to legitimate buyers for legal use. That's news to me, Gresh said. Arlen was sure he was lying. But you don't own Kessel now. My parents sold it about 20 years ago. The planetoid's literally falling apart because it's so close to the mall. It wasn't worth the investment to keep it running. I think it's passed through seven other owners since then. For a while, Glitterstone production spiked, but then it dropped back down again. I guess because nobody wanted to climb into the insider of a disintegrating planetoid and scoop up webbing from energy spiders. Who could blame them? Exactly. But then Glitterstone production exploded a year and a half ago. Kessel didn't change owners and the owners didn't invest in more mining equipment, so only one thing could have been behind the Glitterstone explosion. Someone found a way to move energy spiders off of Kessel, Gresh said evenly. Exactly. My parents tried that but it never worked. Energy spiders need these plasma emissions to stay alive but nobody's been able to reproduce them outside of Kessel. I heard there was some success on Ryleth once, but that was a long time ago. The point is, somebody smuggled energy spiders off Kessel and somewhere they've got them thriving and spinning out webs of Glitterstem in record volume. And whoever that guy is, you can bet your life he's become a very rich man very quickly. And you're telling me this, why? I was just wondering what you've heard. Gemstone Limited ships all kinds of things all across the galaxy. If anyone would have an ear to the ground on who's making good and who's moving them, it would be you. It was, Arlen thought, a fairly subtle way to accuse someone of being a drug trafficker. Not subtle enough, from Gresh's hard expression. Calrissian, I really don't know why you thought I could help you with this. You may have misjudged something in our relationship. I don't mean offense, I really don't. Chance held up a hand. But seriously, Tomar, any scrap you can give me will help. And I swear I will never ask it again. You're damned right you won't. Gresh looked down at his near-empty tumbler. What's in it for me? I'll pay you 20% more on everything you ship for me up the Hydean and the Rima. 30. 25. Good enough. Gresh leaned forward. You want to know who's putting out all that new glitter stuff? Fine. It's Mordron Crux. When Arlen and Chance exchanged questioning looks, Gresh sighed and added, Broken Moon. You've heard of that one? We have, Arlen said. Ah, 
he speaks. Gresh said sarcastically. What have you heard, friend? I know it's a big up and coming crime syndicate. Based on a broken moon somewhere, apparently. Is this Mordron Crux the man in charge? He is. Thielen. Used to work for one of the hut syndicates but broke off on his own. You're right. The Glitterstam booms made him a rich man really fast. I don't suppose anyone knows where he's farming spice now. You can bet your butt he's guarding that secret close. What about his base? Where's this broken moon? Gresh thought for a moment, then looked back to Chance. 30%. Fine, Chance sighed. Where is he? Word has it he's based on some moons spinning around a gas giant in the Taloman system. Never heard of it, said Arlen. No reason you should have. It's way out on the Rima, past Iridu, and Sluice Van. There's no habitable planets, just a moon that got smashed by an asteroid couple billion years ago. It's still in steady orbit somehow so Crux carved it up and made a base out of it. Or so they say. Sounds like something we'll look into. Chance rose to his feet and Arlen followed. He extended a hand. Pleasure doing business with you? Pleasure's all mine, Calrissian. Gresh grabbed his hand and squeezed so hard Chance winced. On their way back down the list, Arlen asked, How much did that cost you? 30% on the Rima and Hydean, which means I'm going to have to look for new shipping clients on that route. He glanced at Arlen, eyes narrowed, Are you sure this is going to be worth the trouble? You're the one who dragged me into this, Chance. I know. But somehow I feel like I'm the one getting dragged along now. The planet Veridan baked under the long light of twin suns. Harsh winds scraped layers off the desert and coated plain, and mountain with hard fine sands the color of amber. Even the sunlight was colored by all the particles flying through the air, and anyone who went outside without goggles and a breath mask was asking to be blinded or choked. Just stepping foot on the hellish world was enough to educate Jay Skywalker in the Hell Moran Nall and the other Synax Juvex laborers had been born into. They set down the shuttle they'd taken from Bastion and near one of the deeper valleys they could find near the mining complex that sat amidst the mountains of the planet's northwest hemisphere. The most up-to-date intelligence reports they'd received when arriving in system was that all outside communications with the facility had been lost after what seemed to be a mass worker uprising. That mining complex dug miles deep into the planet's crust and supposedly contained nearly one million workers and staff. Since travel on the planet's surface was avoided at all costs, it was effectively its own subterranean city. Because the situation was so precarious, it was agreed that the Jedi would land outside the mining complex, scout it out, then return to the ship and report back to Jade's aunt, who was coordinating Jedi efforts in Cynic Shuvex from a ship on the edge of sectors. Scouting the mine required them to actually reach it first, and Jade found herself doubting they could do even that. They supposedly landed only two valleys over from the main shaft entrance, but each of those chasms in the landscape took three or four hours to climb out of, and another three or four to drop into. Jade and Jodrum had spent a lot of time clambering around Asa's rocky terrain, but the cliffs and ridges on Veridan were twice as steep. Worn, having been raised in a cold climate, moved sluggishly in the heat and kept on stopping to remove his breath mask and hastily gulped down mouthfuls of mater. As for Master Mjallu, the diminutive Bim had the most reason to be battered by the hostile landscape, but she fared better than any of them. Even as amber particles caught in tangles of her fur and the suns beat down on her head she moved with a strange grace, calling on the force like it was a steady stream of energy, using it to pull herself over one ledge and outcropping after another. Jade could feel her concentration in the force, that meditate state where she was at one with the world around her and moved over its surface as gracefully as a breeze. Jade could only watch her master with awe and envy. Veridan's twin sons gave it a day period as long as a Coruscan standard week, so when they reached the entrance to the mining complex the light was as bright and scorching as ever. They settled themselves on the downslope, inconspicuous amongst all the jagged brown rock. Jodrum and Jay took out macro binoculars and began to scan the mine entrance. From the surface, it didn't look like much. She spotted a few stout buildings and a pair of landing pads, one long and rectangular, the other square. Two medium-sized shuttlecraft sat on the square one, 
and while the bulk of some freighter stretched across the big one. On second glance, Jade noticed that that pieces of the freighter seemed to have been strewn across the desk. She saw the scorching on the hull next, and finally she realized that some of the debris on that field wasn't debris. It was bodies. There is death down there, Master Mjalu said simply. May I see? Warren spoke up, and Jodrum passed him the binoculars. Jade kept on scanning the surface. She spotted the communications dish atop a tower and angled toward the sky above. It didn't look damaged, but it was hard to be sure of anything right now. Do you see that? Warren said. The entrance is open. Jay swept her binoculars back down to the bottom of the canyon. She looked again at the landing pads and the one- and two-story buildings, then spotted the black mark of an open door at the base of the one furthest from the landing pad. That's how you get in. Jade asked. I was thinking there's be something bigger. Anything bigger, and all the dust particles in the atmosphere would get into the mine, Warren said. To do proper mining, you need rock borers to chew into the planet's crust. You need droids, you need staff, and you need a way to transport all those things underground. I think that's what we're looking at. It's not very big, Jay commented. You'd barely fit a speeder bus through that portal. Most rock boring machines are just that big. They wouldn't need to bring in larger equipment. You know a lot about tunnels, Jodrum commented. Cities on the Chiss homeworld are essentially subterranean. So are many of its colonies. He handed the binoculars back to Jodrum. Tunnels are our specialty. I bet they are, Jodrum muttered and looked at the complex again. I don't see anybody moving down there. I can't say I like that. They can't help dead, Jade said. They are not, Mjalu told them. Come yourselves, my apprentices. Reach out with the force. Can you sense them? far below. Jay tried to push everything else out of her mind, the anxiety, the questions, the hot sun, and howling wind, and constantly sandstorm. She let herself sink into the force and attuned to its currents. Jalu was right, but of course she'd be. There was a mass of people in the shaft below, thousands, maybe even a million. Their collective confusion, pain, and grief surged upward to the planet's surface. It was so strong, so overwhelming, so reminiscent of another surge of singular grief and pain from 12 years ago, that Jade had to break her own concentration. Her eyes popped open. Mjalu said, let us descend carefully. There are many beings down there. I dare say they need our help. You're right, said Jodrum. He sounded as shaken as Jade felt. Let's get going. The descent into the valley was slow and careful. Whatever automated defenses or security systems were set up around the perimeter didn't seem to be operating anymore, or if they did, nobody seemed to be watching them, because the four Jedi skid and clambered their way to the valley bottom without anyone trying to stop them. In fact, no living being stepped outside the entire time. That hardly made Warren feel better. He still felt the collective anxiety of a million beings beneath them as they stepped through the open portal into the mining complex's vehicle hangar. At the far end was one boring machine much like the ones used on Chilla. A couple of speeder bikes sat unused closer to the door. The hangar had room for a few more mid-sized vehicles but that space was empty. Warren wasn't sure what to make of any of it. None of the vehicles here looked damaged, but they'd clearly been a fight about the freighter outside. Whether it had been attacked while landing or taken off, it had been too hard to tell. There were three elevator shafts leading deep into the complex, one industrial-sized platform for vehicles and two smaller ones per personnel. Of the two smaller lifts, one seemed to be operable and the other not. It was another small mystery Warren didn't think he wanted to know the answer to. Because the only way to go was down, they took the operable small lift and descended into the mine complex. The lift tube rattled the whole way down. None of the Jedi spoke. All of them were sinking into the Force, into themselves, trying to attain some mediative state so they could better read the collective mood of the underground city they were approaching. What Warren could feel he didn't like. It reminded him of one time he'd joined a convoy of chess vessels returning from a border conflict with the Vakari. The battle had been a success but a bloody one. And ship after ship, the crews had emanated a grim sense of relief and satisfaction, 
mixed in with grief for lost friends and the jarring echo of violence. There had been violence down in that mine. There was no doubt of that. The interminable downward plunge ended with only the sudden shudder of the lift for warning. As the door started to open Jade, Warren, and Jodram placed their hands on their lightsabers, pretending they were ready for anything even if they weren't. Even though she had no weapon, Master Mjalu stood at in front of the doors, hands clasped calmly in front of her. The door opened and no one was there. A broad platform stretched out in front of them. At first glance it was empty, then Warren stepped out onto it for a better look and saw twisted metal of exploded machinery and many blaster scorched marring what was roughly one acre of flat dirkery. Beyond the platform, the rest of the mine complex spread out. A high dome of carved red stone sprawled too, maybe three kilometers into the distance. A compact grid patterned city of miners' barracks, administrative buildings, warehouses, and more was laid out below them and illuminated by sunbright glow globes suspended midway between the cavern roof and the buildings. In that light, they could see all the scars of a self-contained underground war. Broken walls slumped around black blast craters. Crashing air speeders had cut smoldering knife streaks through the Order Street grid. Fire still burned and smoke continued to rise and fan out against the darkened ceiling. Hide your sabers, children, Jalu said. Why? Jodram asked as he gripped his tighter. We don't know who is friend and who is foe here. Until we do is best not to advertise ourselves. Do as I say. Now. Once the three apprentices did so, Master Mjalu led the descent down the stairs from the elevator platform to the city. They spotted people moving through the streets. No one seemed to be fighting anymore, but everyone hurried like they were still being chased by laser blasts. Warren was immediately stuck that the beings in the streets were all kinds, young and old, male and female, human and non-human. No one looked at them twice, both because everyone seemed to be hurrying about and because they did not stand out, motley mixed though they were. He understood that all these beings must have been living here from the start. This had never been a mere mining complex. This was a city with all the complexity of life as city warranted. He wondered bleakly how many of his natives had ever seen an ocean or a blue sky. Some might have never even seen Veridan's bitter surface. As they walked, he spotted Ugnaughts, Tynans, Rhodians, Falin, Wren, Nasorians, and other species he couldn't place. The Synax Juvex houses were supposed to be human supremacists, but humans seemed to make up less than a third of the beings they were seeing in the streets. That, Combined with the sense of weary shell-shocked satisfaction coming them from all, pretty much confirmed what Warren had suspected from the start. There had been a violent insurrection against the ruling powers of House Petro, and the insurrectionists had won. Warren didn't know how to feel about that. He knew many Jedi sympathized with the rebels, and not without cause. The mistreatment they'd endured at the hands of the ossified Senex Juvex ruling caste was deplorable. Yet it was a chess and the ascendancy itself was an aristocracy, albeit one with more room for individual advancement and personal agency. There was a value in order. The best society was one where every being knew the rules and had a place to stand. To tear the rules down tore down the people and invited anarchy. That had been drilled into him since he was a child. Even after three years among the Jedi, who often viewed things so differently, that core belief was hard to shake. Even if a rising like this spread across the rest of Synax Juvex, there was no guarantee that what came after the houses would be an improvement. As they moved through the streets, they realized that most of the beings were moving, however furtively, in the same direction. Jade was the one to finally give in to her curiosity and call out to a trio of passing Asaurians. Hey, she called. Hey, where's everyone going? The trio swung their beak faces to look at her. They blinked small reptilians' eyes, and the lead one said, The main plaza, of course. Savire's going to be there. It's almost time. Savyar, Warren said. Here. All three of them looked at him without reply. Even in as mixed a city as this, a chist still warranted stares. We've been hiding since the fighting began, Master Mjalu said. Her voice, usually soft but firm, now creaked with faint helplessness. 
The children wanted to help, but I told them to stay where it was safe. I'm sorry. I wish we could have helped, but, well, I'm not as strong as I used to be. She added a pathetic cough, and the Nasorian's suspicious looks finally wilted. We didn't know she was coming until she was already here, one of them said. She must have sneaked into the facility somehow, under the noses of the security forces. What happened to them? Asked Jadram. Where are all House Petrol soldiers? Come and find out, the lead Nasorian said with a hungry gleam in his eye. Then they turned and scampered ahead. More slowly, with a shared and wordless trepidation, the four Jedi followed. They reached what was clearly a pre-planned plaza at the center of the otherwise cramped and utilitarian city and found it packed with people. The Jedi jostled around the edges of the crowd, trying to get a better look at what seemed to be a platform in the center. A chaotic roar erupted on the far side. Warren felt a surge of anger and hunger from the crowd but saw no violence. He still didn't know what was happening but the feeling in his gut got worse. When a pair of transitions nearly trampled Master Mjallu, Jadram bent low and let the little bim climb onto him. When they moved through the crowd again, Mjallu sat with legs swung around each of Jadram's shoulders and dangling over his chest. In another situation it might have been an amusing sight, but nothing could alleviate the mountain dread. There was another cry, and all eyes swung to the platform in the center. Even from a distance he could spot Savyar from her green head, and black ponytail. She seemed to be dressed in a sleeveless scarlet robe. Climbing onto the platform with her were a dozen figures in armor, all of different colors but all sharing the same T-visor helmet. Mandalorians, Jay said as she stood on her toes and peered through shoulders and head. Criffy Mandalorians. I bet that's how they got the edge on the security forces, Jadram said. Hush, children, Mjalu whispered, voice tense. The crowd roared again as something else came on stage. People threw up their arms in excitement, blocking War's view. He shifted to see through the forest up upraised arms, jostling shoulders with Jade as she tried to do the same. He got a clear view just in time to see a herd of humans paraded before Savyar, all in the same set of dirty gray armor. He couldn't hear what Savyar was saying, not from this far away, but he had a good idea that these were captured House Petrol security officers. Then Savyar swung her arm, a straight horizontal swipe. Warren spotted the flash of a vibro knife and a jet of arterial blood from a soldier's neck, blood that splashed on Savyar's scarlet gown and disappeared. The body toppled like a tree into the arms of the ravenous crowd. Get back, children, Mjalu said, voice urgent. Fall back. Now. Jadram obeyed first. He swung his shoulders back and forth pushing against the crowd as they surged hungrily toward the stage. Warren risked one look back to see two more bodies falling into the pit. Even as they broke away from the square, away from the rush of angry, desperate people, they couldn't ignore all the rage blazing up behind them. It was like a bonfire in their minds, hot and hungry, and all destructive, and there was nothing they could do to drown it out. It just kept on burning. Chapter 16 the reports coming in on the uprisings in Senex Juvex were so jumbled and self-contradictory as to be almost useless. One said that the revolt on Masubir had succeeded, another that it had been put down bloodily. A movement on Malador seemed to have been quashed before it became too extreme. There was talk, second-hand and unconfirmed, of mass riots on Carfedian itself. Of the initial movement on Veridan, no one could say. The one thing every source could agree on was that a successful rising had occurred on the surface of the agri world of Fingren, and that in response, frigates from House Vandron were currently pummeling those urban cinders from orbit. The death toll was unknown, certainly in the thousands, and set to rise into millions if no one intervened. In those circumstances, the Alliance had no choice but to act. Chief of State Savage didn't throw caution away, even with the situation as dire as it was. He ordered Admiral Primvold to take three task forces from the 3rd Fleet from Iridu to the border of Synex Juvex. One was to hold at the border planet Yetu, another is Asmeru. The third task force, with Admiral Primvold's flagship at the lead, was to enter the Synex sector and pacify the Fingren system. 
The third acted as quickly as it could, but reaching Fingren itself still took time. The Agro world was located along the Cynix Trace, a narrow lane of hyperspace navigable space that sliced through the giant collection of nebulae and gases called Thull Shroud. To get there, Task Force Starbright had to cross the border at Ismeru, jump to the House Taniel throne world of Neelanen, then dive into the Trace. As she gathered with Chief of State Savash and a dozen senior military officials and senators in the old Imperial Palace, Alana had listened with held breath to Admiral Primvo's status updates. She'd feared that House Tannil might try to stop the Alliance force before it could plunge further into the Cynic sector, but the home fleet graciously stayed back and let it continue on its way. That was only the start, of course. Alana wished the second task force had been approved for this mission, perhaps one that would come up the trace from the other side so they could catch Fingren in a pincer. Chief of State Savash seemed to believe one would be enough. From a military standpoint, Task Force Starbright had twice the firepower as the entire House Vandron fleet, but there was no telling how hard the Vandron ships would fight. Thanks to the recording leaked by Savire's people, everyone knew just how determined Kalor Vandron was to hold on to what he had. How much that murderous tenacity would trickle down to his soldiers was anyone's guess. When Primvold dropped out of hyperspace over Fangren, the tactical readout from his flagship was transmitted back to Coruscant so senior officials there could see what was happening in almost real time. The Elias fleet consisted of 15 capital ships all told, ranging from small pickets to Primvold's Mc 110 Mon Calamari Star Defender. The three-kilometer behemoth was probably capable of taking on House Vandron's ten frigates and light cruisers by itself, but Task Force Starbright spread around the planet to pin the Vandron fleet in low orbit. Primvo's broadcast announcement was transmitted back to Coruscant as well. The gravelly Mon Cal voice said, All ships in the Fingren system. This is Admiral Primvold of the Galactic Alliance Third Fleet. All hostile actions are to be ceased at once. All House Vandron ships are to cease firing on the planet. Once their flagship and commanding officer surrenders, all other ships will be allowed to withdraw. All hostile action on the planet itself will also cease. The current authority on Fangren will prepare itself for the arrival of Alliance peacekeepers. Once the transmission was done, a heavy silence fell over the meeting room and Fangren itself. The Vandron ships were holding position, neither firing nor moving. Alana knew that demanding the surrender of their commander was a risky move, but they'd all agreed it had to be done. Simply allowing them to withdraw wouldn't bring any justice to those already killed on Fangren. The Vandra's ships made no reply before they moved. They simply moved. Some of them turned noses for the edge of Fangren's gravity well and tried to pass through the nearest Alliance pickets. One vessel, surely their flagship, formed up with more and more, and attempted to outman you ever the swift Alliance gunships coming to delay them off while Primvol's flagship cut off their escape route. The officers on Coruscant watched the battle unfold half a galaxy away with a weird, accepting silence. None of them had expected this to go easily. The only thing they could do was watch, wait, and hope things went in their favor. Things began easily enough. Of the smaller Vandra ships trying to flee, only two of them made the ump to hyperspace. Two small gunships were crippled by flights of D-wing fighter bombers. A larger frigate was caught in an ion cannon barrage from an old Nebula-class destroyer, and another's engines were crippled by a Mc-45 Mon Cal picket. House Vandron's fighter wing was light, and the Alliance's nimble tri-wing interceptors easily cut through it to ribbons. The main wedge of the Vandron fleet made a stubborn stand. Admiral Primvo turned his flagship's broadsides to pummel it while his smaller ships moved to trap it on all sides. The fighting grew fierce, and the tense, patient silence in the command room finally broke when one Vandron Corvette, already crippled by a D-wing bomber run, veered into an Alliance Nebulon D-frigate and destroyed both. Alana gasped, Admiral Antilles across the table drew in breath. We were bound to get blooded, warned the First Fleet's Admiral Croce. There will be more of that before the fighting's over. He was right, of course. The little admiral was a gossip, and though his race was best known for shrewd business dealings, Croce had proven that tenacity could easily be transferred to the military sphere. Alana glanced at Chief of State Savash. 
The long-necked Cormian kept his thoughts from his face, but Alana had known him a long time and could feel him in the force. She knew he was wondering how many more would die and whether the long piece would finally be broken on his watch. That was the only capital ship they lost. In the next 20 minutes, another Vandron corvette was destroyed outright by Primbo's cannons. When the Vandron flagship's shields collapsed, it had no place to run. All shooting stopped without warning. Everyone in the command room waited, breathless, until Admiral Primvo said, the Vandron fleet has surrendered. The battle is over. Elena resisted the urge to do some very unmilitary clapping. Sevash said, thank you for your fine work, Admiral. Prepare to take that ship into custody and launch landing craft. Our peacekeepers are standing by, sir. Admiral Primvold, and Tilly said, have you had any communications with the ground yet? I'm afraid not. We attempted to hail them before the battle joined but got no response. We'll try again immediately. Make sure they know our peacekeepers are coming to help, Sevash said. We don't want people shooting each other for no reason. I very much agree, sir. I was going to wait, what's that? The tactical holo updated two seconds later, revealing a wave of yellow markers falling in toward Fangren. Sevash asked, Admiral, is it more Vandron ships? I don't think so, sir. We're struggling to get a read on them. Did those ships just come out off the shroud? Asked Croshi. They did. They must have been waiting at the edge, watching, and Micro jumped in. Can you get a reading, Admiral? Pressed Antilles. They look like they're coming in fast. We've got no hails. We're getting readings now. Some of them are civilian hauler. The rest are. Uh, something between a cough and rattle sounded deep in the Mon Cal's throat. Mandalorians, he said. Despite being the most large-scale job the Mandalorians had taken on in decades, they so far done little of that Mandos traditionally did. Acting as a revolutionary vanguard was not a usual Mandal job. Neither was guarding bodies. This, though, was refreshingly straightforward. Three heavy cargo haulers packed with military equipment and vital supplies needed to be delivered to the about-to-be-proclaimed free world of Fangren. Any ship that tried to stop the Malians, House Vandren, or anyone else was automatically a hostile target marked for destruction. It was, basically, run and gun. Tamara Skirata was unspeakably glad to be doing what she did best. After the disaster at Yagdol, she was lucky Jevern Aches hadn't tied her to the bow of his frigate and keel hauled her through hyperspace. As it was, she was nestled into the bubble cockpit of her Beska fighter at the crest of the charging wave. Normally it was the most dangerous place to be during a fight, but the Alliance ships had clearly been caught by surprise with their glowing apps turned to the approaching fleet. In the crucial minute when they should have turned around and brought their broadsides to bear they dithered probably unable to get clear readings through the jamming being pumped out of the lead transport. The jamming was mucking the Mandalorian sensors just as much, but the calculated ploy had been worth it. That minute of hesitation sealed the fate of the Alliance fleet. Tamar's fighter squadron whipped past an Alliance gunship without even bothering to slow down. A group of Triwane Interceptor's nimble dart-shaped fighters with three stout s foils spoken out of aft engine nacelle was the first to try and stop them. Tamara saw her first target racing right toward her and popped off a pair of proton torpedoes, then veered away. She saw on her scanners as the torps hit their target, punching through shields and vaporizing the nimble little ship. There was more of that to come. Dorn had his own squadron and was currently tangling with another swam of tri-wings. Tamara swung her cockpit away from Fingren to face the Alliance ships. She watched as the center wedge of three Crusader, two class Corvettes, and two Terrage class attack frigates punched forward. The Alliance's mighty Moncal flagship and the Nebula class destroyer closest to it broke formation, opening a lane for the Mandalorian ships rather than risk a collision. The gap was still a choke point waiting to be throttled by waves of turbolaser and missile fire, but instead of charging, and the Mandalorian's wedge split in half. Two corvettes and a frigate swung over the nose of the flagship, slowing down to pound it as hard as possible. The other two ships attacked the Star Destroy with a vengeance, punching through the older ship's shields and tearing ruptures through the nose of its hull. Tamar. 
Her cousin's voice crackled on her headset. Don't just shabla sit there. Two squads of D-wings heading rimward. She didn't have to check her scanners. She could spot the chain of red thrust flares with her eyes. I see it. Crash squad, on me. Stop those bombers before they get to our vote. D-wings were the Alliance's premier attack ship, a Mon Cal design made to succeed the venerable B-wing. They were in attack formation now, two dozen flying wing fighters standing vertically with ventral as foils extended. They could punch serious holes in the Mando frigates, but right now Dorn's squad was tangling up their fighter screens. Tamar and her pilots dove down on the bombers and pummeled their shields with chain-linked laser fire. Some D-wings moved to evade, but a surprising number kept flying straight at the frigate pounded the Alliance command vessel. Compared to the mighty Mon Cal cruiser, Jevern Ocha's flagship looked like a flitnet, but it was a tough and angry flitnet, which was all they needed now. Tamar led her fighters on a second run. This time they forced the D-wings to break their attack before most of them could let their bombs fly. That was when more Tri-wings arrived, and as Tamar was forced to tangle with them the D-wings began to wheel around and regroup for another pass. She'd just blown one Tri-wing to pieces when a brighter light flared just at the edge of her vision. She swung her fighter around to see a chain of explosions tear through the Nebula-class destroyer. The Mando Corvette and Frigate kept pounding it, ripping open its bow like a splitting seam, spilling flame and wreckage out into space. Surging up from behind the dying Star Destroyer were the three transports, each one escorted by a pair of Crusader Corvettes and dozen more Beskid fighters. Oh yeah, Manda. Gavern Ocha's voice sounded on her headset, his first broadcast since the battle started. Get those ships to the ground, Mando 8 and tear up an Evandrin ship while you can. Tamar could imagine a thousand other Mandalorians shouting war cries inside their helmets, but now she just swung her basket back to face the planet. The Vandran ships were the last line standing between those transports and Fingrin, and they wouldn't be standing much longer. All pilots, you heard the Mandalor, she told her people. Let's burn those Vandran Shaboyer down. The crew in the Alliance command room had watched the first stage of the battle in a tense but expectant silence. They watched in silence still, but now it was all grim horror. Admiral Primvo's flagship had taken heavy damage in the Mandalorian ambush, enough to knock out direct comm communication from the bridge. Tactical information was still transmitting, so Alana and all the senators and admirals could watch in helpless captivity as the Mandalorians and their three heavy transports cut through the Alliance line and fell toward the planet. The House Vandran ships, most of them badly damaged and trapped in lower orbit by the Alliance line, had no place to run. The Mandalorians fell on them with the savagery they were famous for. Most Vandran ships were in no position to defend themselves. The flagship flared and died without even firing a shot in its defense. Some of the smaller pickets tried to climb out of the planet's gravity well but were cut apart by swarming fighters. By the time the transports began falling into Fingreen's atmosphere, escorted by Crusader Corvettes the whole way down, every single Vandran ship had been destroyed. Alana couldn't guess how many lives had been snuffed out. Some Alliance ships tried to pursue the transports into the atmosphere but were chased away. Soon the rest of the Mandalorian vessels followed sweep. Only 30 minutes after they'd arrived, Fingreen's orbit was again empty of Mandalorians. The destruction in their wake was the sole proof of their passage, and it was more than enough. Still, no one in the command chamber could think of anything to say until a tech reported, Sirs, Admiral Primvo just sent us a message. Text only. A pause. It must be all they can get working now. Read it. Sevash's words were a sigh. The tech read, This message is from the free world of Fangren. We thank the Mandalorian protectors for their support in the liberation of our world. We pledge to stand with Savyar and all other liberation fighters in Synex Juvex. She swallowed. Any ship not aligned with the struggle to enter Fingren orbit will be fired upon with the intent to kill. This policy will hold until further notice. Grim silence again, until Savash said, Give Primvo to reply on the same channel. Tell him he has six hours to recover equipment and survivors from the damaged ships. Then he's to fall back to Ismeru. 
It will take them longer than that to set up proper defenses, Croce said. If we launch reinforcements now, before they dig in. I'll not declare war on both sides, Admiral, Savash said firmly. Send the signal, officer. They've won today, and we've lost. Kalor Vandren had watched the debacle of Fingren and is entirely from his estate on Carfedian. Again and again he told the commander of the planet's security forces to use a stronger hand. He'd wavered, trapped by misplaced moral anxiety perhaps, until his people were driven off planet by the rebels. Once stuck in orbit he'd finally done as ordered and started bombarding the cities, and when the time had come to fight the Alliance he'd made a decent show of it. And then the blasted Mandalorians had swept him out of the shroud and slaughtered every man and woman left under his command. 200,000 loyal security officers, if memory served, most of them no threat at all in their crippled ships. The one consolation of it all was that Savire's people were starting to show their true colors at last. That wasn't enough. The riots on Carfadian had been growing by the day. Security had cracked down hard but the ports had merely turned to guerrilla war zones. Even now, in his personal suite on the estate's highest spire, he could hear their clamor. Once he was sure the slaughter at Fingren was over he pushed his body off the sofa and shuffled to the window. Every step was a struggle, he'd never felt so old. When he reached the glass he pushed it aside and stepped onto the balcony. Cool breeze rushed his face. It was getting to be autumn now, and sky was overcast. Far below, a flood of being surged against the high white walls of his estate. The same walls, he recalled, where he'd almost been killed less than two months ago. It seemed so much longer. The walls would hold. The houses would hold against anarchy. He believed that. The houses were a rampart against alien rabble, and always had been since Thul Vandren a thousand years ago. He turned his back on the crowd and went to the comm station. He punched in Saren and Turi's coat and waited, waited until it seemed the call wouldn't go through. Then, finally, the old woman's face flickered to holographic life in front of his. Caller, I wasn't expecting to hear from you. Are you still holding out? Have you heard about Fingrine? There was no point in small talk. I just got word. Mandalorians, he sneered. Fitting in a way? Savages calling on savages. I wonder how much Savyar paid for their services. I'm sure they weren't cheap. I'm more interested in where she got the credits. Some underhanded way, I'm sure. Are you still on Carfedian? Of course. Where are you? After a second's hesitation, she said, I left in tours four hours ago. So she was leaving then. Fleeing her family's homeworld probably after stuffing her yacht with as many priceless objects as it could hold and still push off. She'd always been pragmatic like that. He was sure the heads of other houses were doing the same. You're too pessimistic, Saren. The houses won't fall to savages. Not while I'm alive. The old woman considered him carefully before she nodded. I believe you're right. Will you stay on Carfedian? The Vandrans have been here for a thousand years. I'd rather make my stand here than anywhere else. Mark my words, the Alliance will realize what a mistake they made by giving Savyar tacit report. I say after fingering they're already learning. Yes, though I can't say how much good it will do you in the end. Are you sure you're making your choice wisely? My choice made me before I was born, he said. And Turi smiled ruefully. Good luck, Kaller. You'll need it. He nodded once and held her eyes until the holo winked out. He felt himself wilt as he faced the empty wall. He'd known Anturi all his life. They'd grown up together, taken over their houses together, schemed to preserve Synex Juvex together. He didn't expect to see her again. Yes, after all these decades he was finally feeling old. Then he heard a familiar voice over his shoulder, half whisper and half rasp, asking, Are you feeling troubled? Lord. Vandren spun around, knowing what he'd see. Kikit was less than a meter behind him, hidden in his black cloak except for the soft yellow glow of his reptilian eyes and the faint gleam of his fangs. He took one deep breath, then another. He wanted to ask how Kikit had gotten into his quarters, but what was the point? There was no reason to ask about Savyar either. With almost a century of accumulated dignity, he lifted his head. 
looked the monster in the eye, and asked, did she hire you out from under me? Or were you Savire's agent from the start? Kika didn't step closer, didn't flinch, didn't blink. His jaws hinged open and he hissed one word, no. No what? It has to be one or the other, so which? At least tell me. Without one long stride, Kikid was in front of him. Vandran flinched a tiny flinch, but the beast didn't raise a claw. Hot, foul-smelling breath puffed in his face. Funny. He thought he'd be more afraid than this. His old hands weren't even trembling. Still, he wanted to know. What are you? He asked. Does it matter now? His Kikid. Vandran stared the monster in those awful animal eyes, and he had to admit to truth. No, I suppose it doesn't. Not anymore? Fiber cord whipped out of his left sleeve and into his right. He brought his arms up and down, then twisted, wrapping the cord tight around Vandran's neck. The old man's face went red, his wiry neck muscles strained, and the veins on his face bulged tight against his skin. Dark Kikit held him like that right on the verge of dying, hoping to save her confusion and dread from the fool's last moments. That was wanted, but what he found was a strange calm, an acceptance. Another twist and it was over. The body sagged to one side, but Kikit kept the cord tied around his neck. He carried the corpse over to the window and used the force to push the glass aside. Once he was on the balcony, the rest was easy. Getting back to his ship was easy too, He'd memorized every secret passage on the estate a long time ago, and security team was busy elsewhere. When he reached Intruder, he passed a call into Darth Zorin, who answered promptly. I am finished with Carfedian, he said simply. Excellent, Zorin smiled. I'm sure you're happy to have that business complete. Keegan didn't want to admit he felt strangely hollow. Are you on Veridan now? That's correct. The mining facility is secure but the machinery was damaged in the rising. I'll stay here and oversee the repairs for a few days more. What about the Alliance? They won't sit still after Fangren. I know, but this is important. Go the world ship and stay with Villith Dow until the next battle. Do you think they'll move on Fangren again? I know we just delivered an affront they can't ignore. Fangren or elsewhere, the world ship will be needed soon. Very well. I'll go there at once. He killed the connection, then began to fire the engines. He'd be glad to get away from here. When Intruder escaped Carfedian, it was a rocket flaring fast upward, then a black wing disappearing into a low clouds. Of the thousands gathered outside the Vandran estate, only a handful noticed and none cared. By now their eyes had all turned upward, squinting to the highest spire. From so far away they could just make out the body of their nemesis dangling by the neck from his balcony, swinging in the breeze under a leaden sky. Chapter 17 Fingren turned out to be just the start of a cascade of bad news. Reports of increasing reliability painted an increasingly dire depiction of the situation in Synex Juvex. Invigorated by the victory at Fingren, other House Vandran planets were rising up and declaring themselves free worlds in solidarity with Fingren. Kalor Vandran himself was an apparent suicide. Saren and Turi seemed to have fled and left her homeworld to the revolutionaries. The head of House Arba had supposedly been murdered by a mob and rumors swirled that House Casido's head had been assassinated by a Mandalorian commando squad. The infamous mercenaries were popping up all over Synex Juvex Al, always supporting the revolutionaries. At the same time other houses, namely Garanin, and Picturin were digging in by cracking down on uprisings with unabashed brutality. Reports were flooding in of widespread massacres of accused loyalists in the free worlds. Even during the months of negotiations, Alana had never thought things would explode this violently. Sometimes it almost seemed like something else was behind this all, stoking the fire for maximum effect. Clearly more had been going on beneath the surface, those Mandalorians hadn't hired themselves, and there was one obvious answer as to who bought their services. That answer just brought more questions. How many Mandalorians had Saviar hired? Where had she gotten the money? And just where was the falling woman at the heart of all this? Since Fingren she'd made no broadcast, the rumors placed her on any of a dozen worlds throughout the two sectors. 
It was strange, so often the natural reaction to total chaos was to stand back and do nothing for fear of making things worse. Everyone in Alliance Command knew that wasn't an option now. We made a mistake sending one task force, Chief of State Savash told her when she met him in his office two days after the battle. We should have sent a stronger force. There's no way we could have known the Mandalorians were going to attack, Alana told him. Of course we could have. The Cormian waved a long-fingered hand. It was a critical intelligence error. This whole situation is one critical intelligence error after another. She wanted to contradict him, but she also didn't want to lie. Fingren had set the Senate abuzz. Everyone was second-guessing the actions of Sevash, Alana, and Fleet Command, like they'd known the secret to solving this mess all along. They'd already passed the vote authorizing use of force to pacify Senex Juvex, but that vote had been based on Alliance law for peacekeeping its own systems. None of the new free worlds had officially submitted their withdrawal from the Alliance, but none of them had confirmed loyalty either. The legal situation was as much a mess as the military one. Things can't go back the way they were, Alana said. If we're going to keep Synex Juvex from totally falling apart, we're going to need diplomacy and force both working in conjunction. Working toward what end? Frankly, the same end we tried working for at Fengren. The Alliance respects the lives of all sentients, no matter what side they're on in this uprising. We need to stop the retaliatory bloodshed, period. That's a military role. Where's the diplomacy? Diplomacy is working out in accord. All those new free worlds aren't going back to house control. Hopefully we can force an agreement where the surviving houses keep a few planets, enough to keep the lords satisfied, while the rest of the world are integrated into the Alliance. Do you think they'll want to be in the Alliance? They will if we promise them aid. Most of those free worlds are impoverished or battle-damaged or based around exploiting a single resource. They'll need a lot help to get self-sufficient. They'll need us. Savage took a deep breath. Very well, Senator. Starting today you are to resign as head of the Senate Federation Committee. She stared. Sir, you're now head of the Reconstruction Committee. Draw up personnel. Draw up policies. Your only job from here on is to facilitate peace in Synax Juvex. It took her mind a moment to calculate the sudden turn. When it had, she said, it feels like that's been my only job for a while now. But what about that other half, sir? The military half is already in motion. Last night I gave approval for Admiral Crow she to take the first fleet to reinforce the third. They'll muster out tomorrow. Crow she and Primvold are already working out a joint battle plan. Despite the immensity of the task that had just been heaped on her, she was glad not to be in the Admiral's boots. There's a lot of system in crisis right now. Where do they even start? They've both agreed that Fingerin was a bigger symbolic defeat than a strategic one. There are planets that are both strategic and symbolic. Sir, are you talking about Carfedian? That's right. Best we know, the rebels haven't totally consolidated control over that planet yet. If we get there in time, in force, we can prevent a massacre of House Vandron loyalists. There's also been no indication that the Rebels have installed anti-orbital defense weapons like Fingren. I see the logic, sir. I just have one more concern. Ask. What about the Mandalorians? What kind of strength do they have? What can they yield in a pitch battle? We don't know. All we know is that no matter what they've brought, their total manpower and machinery is a fraction of what any Alliance fleet can yield. So they fall back on brute force, then? I understand, sir. I'm just wary of surprise after Fingren. Understandably so. That's why I've personally reached out to the leading figures in Imperial space. You've asked for a fleet. She thought on her last conversation with Jagged. They've agreed to send something. That's good news, sir. Very good news. Sevash did not look pleased. Senator. This is going to be the largest military operation in the galaxy in almost 40 years. There's nothing good about it. I'm sorry, sir. I misspoke. He released a hissing sound, the Cormian version of a frustrated groan. Senator Joe, this is the heaviest decision I've ever had to make. The long piece is breaking, 
and I will go down in history as the being who oversaw its collapse. Sevash was not normally emotive, but she could feel his shame through the force. It was all Alana could do not to wince. We can't still salvage this, sir. We have to believe that. I will do my best to try. Do you have any news from the Jedi? Sorry, it's been too hectic. I haven't talked to my aunt since she went to Synax Juvex. She was surprised that Ben had allowed his daughter to go into Synax Juvex right now. Jaina hadn't been, which meant she's probably had a hand in convincing him. Alana hoped neither of them regretted it. They're all trying to do the best they can right now, she told him. Our best, Sevash muttered, is all any of us can do, no matter what we are. And it was true. Alana knew that better than most. She was Jedi, a senator, and princess, but when faced with true chaos, none of it helped. The villa owned by Vitor Riege, former Imperial Admiral, former head of state, was located in the mountains on Bastion's southern continent. It felt half a galaxy away from the dense metropolitan sprawl of Ravelin, which Jagat supposed was the whole point. His unique family situation ensured that Jag was never out of the convoluted tangle of interstellar politics. As for Riege, he'd put in his decades in the Empire service and earned a quiet place to spend his retirement. Together, they'd remade the Empire from a corruption-choked authoritarian relic into a dynamic and modern state. They'd made history once but they were old men now. There was no doubt about that. Jag was reminded of it every time he came here and sat down in the living room, the one with the soft chairs and the wide window showing off white cap peaks. The walls were adorned with medals, mementos, holo images. He was always struck by one showing a younger Reed with the elderly Gilad Pelian. Nowadays Reed looked like the old Grand Admiral, almost uncannily so. He had the similar facial structure, the bristly white mustache, even the bulge around the midsection earned during retirement years. As for Jack, he knew very well he looked like his father had in his 60s. Shorter, but otherwise the same, with the still trim build, the hair, and beard gone from black to gray, even a patch over the same eye. When Jag and Riaj met that time, they didn't talk much. They sat in the living room, sipping brandy, glancing at the museum pieces on the walls, and might mountain behind. Riaj prodded him with questions about his children about Synex Juvex and about the Empire's possible commitments there. That was what they'd meant to talk about all along. They'd both been dancing around it awkwardly, but they could only dance for so long. Admiral Warhaven's given his go-ahead, Jagged said. We'll be sending a task force to help the Alliance. Riage nodded in approval, as Jag knew he would. Who are they putting in charge? Admiral Branth will be taking everything under his command. Branth's a fine officer. Riage smirked and tapped his glass. I taught him almost everything he knows. Yes. Jag took a sip from his own and savored the bitterness. I can't say I'm comfortable with it. Riage knew why, but he danced again. You've always been in favor of cooperation with the Alliance. I still am. It's just dance, dance around it. We stand to lose a lot. This is the biggest joint operation we've done in decades. If something happens, something disastrous, it will give power back to the isolationists. It could turn back the clock and ruin everything we've done. Do you think something disastrous will happen? How many ships is the Alliance sending? Two whole fleets, the first and the third. When combined with Brant's task force. Probably three times as many ships as are in all of Cynic Shuvex right now. Politically is very difficult. But in terms of raw military power, I don't see how they can lose, even if the Mandalorians spring a few surprises. I know. I'm just anxious. Understandable, Riot said softly. Jag drained his glass. Jaina's there now, directing the Jedi, but she's staying out of the actual hot spots. Of course, knowing Jaina, she might just charge him whenever she feels like it. Jag gave a long suffering sigh. Riot smirked. You knew who you were marrying? I know. But having my son on the front lines is bad enough. You'll have to trust him as well. Riai said softly. That was far easier to know than to do. 
After he parted from Riege, Jag's suborbital jumper carried him from Bastion's southern hemisphere to Ravelin in the north. The Fell family apartment echoed with its own emptiness. Jaina was in Synex Juvax, Arlen on Karuskin, Davak at Bilbringi, but not for long. They'd all been here together less than two months ago. He couldn't remember how long it had been before that. No matter when the next time came, it couldn't be too soon. If it came, he chided himself for being morbid, but that didn't make it go away. He went to the communications terminal and thought about coming Davek aboard Voidwalker. His son wouldn't like that. Not the interruption in the middle of his work, nor the public reminder of his important kin. His son wanted to prove himself as himself, even while staying true to the family name. He took after his father like that, just as Arlen took after his mother with his forced talent and headstrong recklessness. He decided to leave a message. When the recording started, he froze. Getting words out was still hard sometimes. He cleared his throat and said, Davik, this is your father. I imagine you've just learned that Void Walker will be mustering out under Admiral Branth for Synex Juvex. I don't know what you will find there or what challenges you'll encounter, but I do know you will face them with all your skill and bravery. I've never doubted you. None of us have. So go be a good soldier, Davik. And when you come back to us, I want to hear all your stories. Until then, good luck, and may the Force be with you. May it be with all of us. Davet listened to the message from his father right before hurrying to the senior staff meeting in the small conference from behind Voidwalker's bridge. Though he tried, he couldn't get it out of his mind the whole time, not the words, nor the gentle gravity in his father's voice. The order of battle has just come down from Admiral Brandt, Captain Lorne told them from the head of the oblong table. If you look at the data card you've been provided, you'll see it resembles the exercises at Bilbringi to a good degree. Davek had plugged his copy of the card into her personal data pad, and it was as Lorne had said. Voidwalker and Shieldbreaker would be working together as usual, attached to the Star Destroyer Resolute, along with two escort, frigates, and four small and tie starfighter gunships. He remembered the formations from the test battles well, and it looked like most of the other battle groups had been kept intact as well. The core of the formation would again be Brant's four-kilometer-long flagship Oswald Teshik with the destroyer Seretti and Rumoti on flank. It's a large battle group, sir, Davek commented. The other officers seated around the table look at him. Captain Lorne held out a long pale hand. Any other comments from our chief tactical officer? I, Adavik paused, considered, knowing the other officers, all older than him, would be quick to judge. I was just marking my surprise, sir. I didn't expect Admiral Warhaven to commit such a large fleet. Nor did I, to be honest. It seems that Naval Command wants to show the rest of the galaxy how important the Empire is to keeping the peace. That remark seemed to split the room. Some had satisfied smiles, other skeptical frowns. There were plenty, Davek knew, who wanted the Empire to stay out of what they saw as the Alliance's mess. They'd probably blame his father for dragging them into said mess and pass the blame and turn to Davik. One of the faces in between belonged to the ship's senior medical officer, a human now past middle age with a stern angular face more fitting a drill sergeant than a doctor. Trent Holden raised his hand and waited for Lauren to nod at him before saying, We've been waiting for a fresh supply of Bacta for two weeks. I've been getting a runaround every time I ask about it, but we're going to need that before we deploy. In fact, we'll need twice the usual standby supply. I'll make sure you get it, Chief, Lauren said. In fact, I'll need everyone to submit full material requests for their divisions by the end of today. We don't know how long this deployment will last, so think of everything we might need for the next six months. Davek hoped to the force he couldn't touch that this deployment didn't last that long. If it did, it meant that Synex Juvex was going to get much worse before it got better. He glanced around the table. As chief tactical officer, he didn't have to worry about physical assets, but he could see Holden, Deck Chief Orin, and Engineering Chief Daher tapping at their data pads, looking over what they'd need. Can we expect to deploy ground forces? Asked Navar Sly. The commander of Voidwalker's sole remaining stormtrooper company was short but built like a veteran bull. 
The plan right now is to keep your soldiers on orange alert going in, said Lorne. Admiral's Branth is still hacking out an agreed plan with his alliance counterpart, but yes, expect your stormtroopers to be deployed, Commander. I suspect the Alliance will want their troops to be first won the ground, but if troops are needed for long-term pacification of disputed areas, and I suspect they will be, your men will be taking part in it. Who will be in charge of the Alliance fleet, sir? Asked Davek. Admiral Primvold. Lorne shook his head. Primvold and the third will still be active, but the first fleet is undamaged, so they'll spearhead the operation. Admiral Crow, she has final say in all strategic decisions. Will this be a joint command, or will his authority extend over Admiral Brand? Asked Trancy Kamel. The first officer had been one of those ones who frowned skeptically at the prospect of this deployment. They all frowned even deeper at the thought of taking orders from an Alliance Admiral. Lorne folded his hands atop the table, looking around the officers, and said with a diplomatic smile, we follow the same chain of command as always. We'll undertake no combat maneuvers that do not have Admiral Brandt's approval. Understood. Some nods were weak, others firm, but it got the point across well enough. Still, we don't know where we'll deploy, remarked Gila Samar. With the situation as fluid as this, we won't know until the last minute, Lorne told the CAG. All the officers knew that fluid was polite military jargon for chaotic. Davik was surprised. Then, when the Muin fixed him with his small sharp eyes and asked, Lieutenant, as Chief Tactical Officer, do you have any guesses? Again, Davik could feel all the eyes on him. He ignored them by focusing solely on the captain. Well, sir, I've not been privy to high-level meetings, of course, and really this is more of a strategic issue, but obviously the fleets will spread out and pacify multiple systems. If we assume that our fleet would initially deploy, with the Admiral Croce at a key battleground, I think that narrows things considerably. Fingrine, asked Major Sly. Davik shook his head. The rebels have had over a week to install the defensive systems the Mandalorians delivered. No, I think we'll be going to a system that's already contested. Anturis and Carfedian are both thronewotes and still in flux. Though of course that could change by the time we actually get into the Cynic Sector. Other possibilities are Cartina, Thurman, and Malador. But if I were a betting man, I'd say Anturis or Carfedian. Why is that? Asked Holden. Mostly, sir, is because those two have their backs to the shroud. If our enemies are going to spring a trap, it's sure to come from there. So you believe our admirals are going to send us into a trap intentionally? Chief Orange screwed his face. Honestly, if I were them, I'd do just that. Davik was aware that everyone else at the table was staring at him now, mostly confused or skeptical. Lorne's little alien eyes were concentrated, thoughtful, and they sparked Davik to go on. If the rebels lose the chance to take control of a major house throne world, it will kill their momentum. They can't afford to give those planets up so they'll throw everything they have at us, including whatever they might have hiding in the shroud. What you're saying, Major Sly said, is that we'll try to start this campaign with a decisive action to set the tone. Well, I'm not privy to the Admiral's talks, like I said, but I think it makes the most sense. He felt relieved when Sly nodded, almost approvingly. Orrin, however, said, that's great sense except for one thing. We'll still be walking into a trap. Some of the others chuckled at the deck chief's frankness, but Davek said, we will, but at least we'll know about the risks. I assume we'll deploy in stages, with some fleets maybe ours hanging outside the battle zone, a micro jump or two away, then deploy in stages. We'll show all our cards one at a time, if you see what I mean. But we'll have more cards, so we should win. I've never seen you at our Sabbath games, Lieutenant, Samar smirked. David couldn't tell if it was mocking. I'm not the best player, but I know the basics. He tried to smile back. The first big battle is where we get to test our enemies and see everything they've got. Hopefully the rebels and the house forces will beat each other up that all we'll have to do is mop up. But this is all just my theory. We'll have to find out. Attention shifted away from him next with another question from Holden about medical supplies. Davik was glad to no longer be the center of attention, 
spot for the rest of the meetings, as Captain Lorne ran through all the tiny preparations required before deployment, he found himself running on a small high. He fielded the questions and, best he could tell, best he could hope, he gained a little more respect from the other officers, respect that had nothing to do with name. When the meeting ended, officers began to file out, but Lorne told Davik and Kamal to stay for a minute. The first officer was always hard for Davik to read, but he seemed like he was as curious about this unexpected request as Davik was. The captain remained in his chair, hands folded in his lap, while his officers stood before him. The moon said, you handled the questions adeptly, Lieutenant. Thank you, sir. You also handled them accurately. I figured you should know. Nothing's finalized yet, so please hold off telling the others. Kamo cleared his throat. Excuse me, sir, but what do you mean by accurate? It's very simple. The admirals are looking very hard at Anturis or Carfedian for the exact reasons Lieutenant Fell proscribed. The glow Davik felt at being right was dimmed by new anxiety. Sir, do we know what part the Imperial fleet will play in the battle? Not yet, I'm afraid. But naturally, we must be ready for anything. Davik and Kamal walked out of the conference room as one and walked shoulder to shoulder down the hall to the bridge. In a low first, the first officer muttered, Hardly a good sign, is it? Sir, be ready for anything, he said. Not encouraging. Davik had yet to discover what, if anything, Kamal thought encouraging, but he said, that's part of any combat situation, isn't it? Especially a large one like this. It's going to be bigger than anything you fought, Lieutenant. And me, and the captain, maybe even the admirals. He sucked in air through his teeth. Me, I think a six-month deployment is optimistic. You think we'll be there for longer, sir? Either that or we'll be dead. Davik let Kamo go ahead once they got to the bridge. He resolved that, for the duration of this campaign, however long it lasted, he would refrain from seeking counsel from his first officer. It was commonly claimed that any warship, from the biggest superstar destroyer to the smallest corvette, was a machine made up of machines. They said it not just in a literal sense, though that was true too. Every very section of the crew, the bridge staff, the gunners, the engineers, the deck crew, the pilots, the medical team first needed to train as people to be as effective and efficient as possible as a discrete entity. Then all those gunners and engineers, perfectly in tune with themselves like the best calibrated machines, would learn how to get in tune with each other until all those diverse constituent parts made the best overall war machine possible. That was common Navy talk. There was a corollary to that, less widely known. It stipulated that the one group on that ship left out of the calibrations was always the Stormtrooper Division. That was what Lucas Briggs' father and grandfather had told him, and as far as he'd seen yet, they were right. Voidwalker's mess hall was the perfect example. Engineers tended to sit with engineers, pilots with pilots, and so on, but there was still some cross-pollination. Deck crew would sometimes eat with pilots and engineers with gunners. The stormtroopers of the sole remaining company were always by themselves. It wasn't surprising, perhaps. All the Navy people had trained at one academy, infantry another. All those gunners and engineers knew as much about storming a hostile building and blackout conditions as Lucas has the other stormies knew about fixing hyperdrives and cannon coolants. To Navy people, stormies were the faceless dumb grunts who pounded dirt. To those stormies, the ones who never left their fancy shielded spaceships hardly deserved to be called soldiers. That was the way it was now, and had forever been. So said the Briggs family, which had worn the white for four generations. The afternoon after Major Sly had delivered their deployment orders, Squad D-7 of what his members unofficially called Razor Company took their usual spot in their usual table in Voidwalker's mess and started chewing through their usual meals. Let's take a bet, Minor Savorn said as he blew on his overheated suit. Fifty credits says the Alliance troops get all the action on we come in next day for mop up. Am I supposed to take that bet? Lucas raised a brow at the man across the table. I will, Layla March said from Lucas Wright. Hundred credits says we're with the first or second wave. Who you? 
betting big, Miner whistled. Any reason why? That way, if we get thrown into hot poodoo, I can cheer myself up thinking of the credits you'll owe me. Won't do you any good if I'm dead, said Miner cheerily. So that's been your plan all along. Dying in your first engagement. Lucas tissed at him. What would your parents think? They'd probably just be glad I got off Colfax Minor. First I've learned to do that in generations. Hey, I've heard the leader for gold squads from Colfax Minor too, Layla put in. Something Valter. You know her? Yes, we're such a backwater that everyone knows each other. In fact, we're first cousins. Minor rolled his eyes. No, I don't writing know her. Family name rings a bell, though. Think they're rich or something. Well, go introduce yourself. You can buy her a drink and wax all nostalgic about the mud ball back home. Minor shook his head, but Lucas nudged his foot under the table. Hey, have you seen her? Young. Not bad looking. I say it's worth a shot. You do it then? Ah, come on, Minor. A pilot and a squad leader. That's not bad, Layla said. In the opinion of the average Stormy, Thai pilots were about the only other people on the ship deserving of being called real soldiers. Miner shook his head. No, none of that. A lieutenant, and me. Nah. Pretty sure there's rules against that somewhere. I bet she fit better with Prince fell up on the bridge. They snickered and shook their heads. That Void Walker's tactical officer was the son of one of the most important men in recent Imperial history was not lost on anyone aboard. Lucas had only seen him from a distance. He hadn't looked like much, just any other officer, maybe a little young for his junior grade lieutenant bars. You know, you may be onto something, Layla said as she chomped on a ball Davy and chew stick. From what I hear, Ms. Gold Squadron's pretty cold. Doesn't hang out much even with her own pilots. Talks with a fake accent so people don't think she's from a worst mud ball in the Empire. Hey now, Miner said. We're not the worst. Hmm, she does sound like Prince Fell's type. Never see him in the closet either, Lucas said, using the affectionate nickname for Void Walkers far from spacious on board lounge and cantina. A Star Destroyer would have had more space to let the crew relax but not this packed little frigate. By the way, where do you hear all that about Walter from? Asked Miner. Look around you. Count out the number of attractive and available females versus homely men like yourself. What kind of ratio do you think the ship has? H-M-M-P-H. I guess it's in your favor. Don't know if I call it that, Layla bit another chew stick. But it makes trips to the closet interesting. You two need to cram with me more. Help makes friends with the Navy brats. Wouldn't do to break the family tradition. Lucas tissed again. Ah, uh, that's right. Miner nodded. Your dad and grandfather. They have stories to tell. He said it in a darker tone, and the message was clear. Combat stories. All of them had gone through tons of training, drills, and hyper-realistic simulations. But none of them had been through any engagement with a live and lethal enemy. Only a fraction of Razor Company had. Such was the state of the Empire during the Long Peace, for better or worse. Lucas sighed and looked at his cup of blue milk. Dad fought in the last big war. He saw action against the Verpine and Happens. Said he'd never thought women could fight so tough. Layla snorted and he went on. My grandfather, he had to fight the Vong. What he went through, well, I'm damn glad we won't be dealing with him. Synex Juvex still sounds like a mess. Miner shook his head. I'm not afraid to fight, but if you ask me, it's not our damned business getting involved. A bunch of old rich bastards and aliens start hacking each other up, and so what? Let them kill each other off. That's what I say. Oh, the sophisticated argument I'd expect from Colfax Miner, Layla rolled her eyes. If we're supposed to be a big power in the galaxy, we're expected to act like one. The Empire has the best trained, best regimented military in the damned galaxy, way better than whatever rabble the Alliance has thrown together. What's the point of being the best if we sit back and let them do all the fighting? Aren't you the one who didn't want pound ground first? Miner reminded her testily. The Colfax Miner remark had struck a nerve. Listen, 
I'm not dying to get shot at. Pun intended, but I understand why we are not just sitting this thing out. It makes sense. Miner shook his head. What about you, Briggs? What does the family wisdom have to say about it? Lucas held his tongue. All the changes the Empire had gone through had driven a weird wedge through his family. His grandfather, who'd gone through the Vong War, was the one who welcomed all the reforms and spoke of Jagged Fell with a tone of reverence. Conversely, it was Lucas's father who collected all the memorabilia from the generation before that, when the Empire had ruled all the civilized galaxy and protected beings from anarchy, democracy, and alien rule. When he learned that Lucas was serving on a ship captain by a moon, his father's expression had darkened and his eyes had asked just where the real empire had gone. Lucas took a long sip of milk and said, Does it matter what we think? We put on the white to fight when we're told to fight. We all knew that going on. That's why we put it on the first place, isn't it? It was a cheap evasion, but neither of them called him on it. It happened to be true. So they nodded in acceptance, and he nodded too. They were, after all, soldiers of the Empire. With everything else going on, the Pirates Arlen and Chance were seeking were starting to seem like a pretty trivial matter. Chance, unsurprisingly, had argued otherwise. Whoever was financing them, be it Mordren Crux or someone else, was clearly a major crime lord and quite probably tied to the epidemic of glitter stem addiction that had been spreading through the neglected backwaters of the Outer Rim. Finding the truth and breaking this criminal empire if possible was simply the moral thing to do, the Jedi thing. Arlen had asked Chance as he still wanted full repayment for his stolen merchandise. Chance hadn't denied that either. Still, Arlen had been on the verge of moving off Arlen's sofa and flying out to Synex Juvex to help when a counter-argument came from the most surprising source. When he called them back to his headquarters, Volgma the Hutt didn't bother to treat them to a fancy meal. He simply sat them down in front of a holo projector and let it play. Arlen hadn't seen footage from the battle at Fingren before, but given the mix of ships involved, this was clearly it. The planet itself lay at the center of the image most of the time so it had probably been taken from the hull of one of the Alliance ships. Was this publicly released? Chance asked. It looks like it was taken from a Navy ship. I acquired this footage through perfectly legal means. The hut waved a plump brown hand. Now watch. They watched. Starfighters danced around each other, Mandalorian biscuits shaped like flying tees, tri-wings darting left and right, soaring D-wings launching heavy weapons. Some heavy explosions flashed to one side, but the camera kept recording. Watch, Volgma urged them, though Arlen was starting to wish he'd just come out with it. New ships soared in from above. First were a couple Mandalorian corvettes. Then came a massive civilian model cargo hauler. Just as things started to make sense, the holo froze. Volgma tapped the remote control with his stubby fingers until the image zoomed in on the underside of the cargo ship. When the resolution adjusted, it was unmistakable. The logo of Volgma Shipping Incorporated stamped on the hull. Arlen knew it was going to take a few minutes for all the pieces to click. Volgma announced the obvious one. Now we know who has been stealing these ships. And we know why as well. The rebels in Synex Juvex needed high-grade equipment for their free worlds and ships to carry them. You've got pretty convincing evidence, all right, Chan said. His tone was distracted. Arlen knew he was trying to fit all the pieces, too. I will pass this on to Alliance Intelligence, the military, anyone who'd willing to see it, the Hut said, but I showed it to you first. I trust you more than any of them. Chance exhaled. What can I say, Volgma? I'm flattered. Not you, you foolish human. The Jedi. I have always trusted Jedi. Arlen was finally willing to believe him, but that didn't mean all the pieces fit together. They tried to talk it through as they rode Chance's speeder back to his apartment. I really thought this broken moon group was the one paying for those ships, he said. Granted, a lot of it was based on coincidence. I see that now. But if it wasn't broken moon, then how did Saviar get all those credits? The pirates, the ships, the supplies. Don't forget the entire army of mercenaries, Arlen said. Those mandas don't work cheap. 
You don't just keep that kind of capital under your pillow. Savyar must have had major financial resources this whole time, but nobody even sniffed it. Well, who's to say is one or the other? Why not both? Chance frowned. What do you mean? I mean, maybe Savyar was working with this guy, this Mordron Crux. One's a revolutionary, and the other's a drug dealer. How does that work? Maybe they have a partnership. Maybe Savyar has something to do with the Glitterstone boom and they're split in a profit. Maybe she's doing business through Broken Moon, and that's why nobody realized she had enough money to hire Mandos and pirates, and who knows what else. It was a lot to think about. A lot of unanswered questions and dangling possibilities. A lot of guesswork. As they got close to Chance's apartment, Arlen said, The only way we're going to learn anything for sure is if we actually go to this Broken Moon and see for ourselves. I was afraid it would come to that, Chan sighed. You know, I am a VM, E, E, CFO of a major interstellar corporation. Meaning what? Meaning I have things to do besides tag after you all the time. Just this morning you were trying to get me to tag after Al. Yeah, but that was different. Different how? He sputtered for a second. This morning I was trying to guilt trip you? I don't like it when things get reversed. Arlen laughed. You're a good man, Chance Calrissian. Did I ever tell you how being a good guy cost my dad a whole city once? And then remind me how it all because of my grandfather. Yes. Multiple times. Well, I'm going to tell it again when we're on our way to Broken Moon, Chance scowled. Just so you don't forget. The gruesome display in the city square had been just the beginning of an education on the state of the newly proclaimed free world of Veridin. Even as the apprentices grappled with various kinds of revulsion, Mazer Jalu had insisted they had a unique opportunity to uncover the operations of Savire's revolutionary organization, especially now that the Falling herself was here. After the battle for control over the mining complex, whole blocks of buildings had been hastily abandoned and it wasn't too hard to find some place to squat in. That the mining colony was an interspecies mixed match was a blessing. Bean still gave Warren second glances but one little bim going around with two teenage humans didn't seem to strike people as unusual. So they had to talk to people. They had to listen. There was a lot more going on here besides retaliatory bloodletting. But that was only part of it. In reality, they couldn't leave if they wanted to. Shortly after Savire's bloody demonstration, Mandalorian guards had been posted outside the lifts leading up to the surface. There was only one way in or out of the underground colony, and it had suddenly become impassable. Their shuttle had been hidden in a deep crevasse and covered with camo netting, combined with the harsh conditions on Veridan's surface that should have kept it hidden from most observers, but there was no way to be sure. Putting aside personal risk and future danger for the greater good was a very Jedi task, and Warren tried his best at it. As the Jedi started talking to the citizens of the mining town, in groups or one by one, they started to piece things together. When the rising had happened, Mandalorian troops had shown up out of nowhere to lead the charge. They'd been instrumental in defeating House Petrol's security forces, and had stayed here since. Numbers were vague, but there didn't seem to be more than two dozen of them in the entire city, but the sight of just one was enough to still in the citizens a mix of fear and reverence. Savyar herself was seen even more scarcely. According to the aggregate rumors, she was still on planet and staying in the actual mining complex. The great boring machinery had been damaged in the fighting and trusted workers had been toiling for days to get it up and running again. They spotted Savyar from time to time, always in the company of a few Mandalorians and some loyal partisans easily marked by the scarlet armbands they wore and the rifles they carried. The question that seemed to be on everyone's minds was, now what? There was one central communication station connected to the transmitter on the surface and daily was released in daily doses by Savire's loyalists. Each batch listed a half dozen to a dozen planets that were proclaiming themselves independent of the houses. There were also listings of atrocities committed by loyalists against rebels, but retaliatory events like the one in this very town square were curiously alighted. All of it promised a new age of independence for the oppressed of Synex Juvex, none of it explained what that actually meant. 
all of it settled worn deeper into the conviction that this rising was a disaster. He tried to explain that to the other apprentices, late one afternoon in the hovel they'd occupied while Master Mjalu was out. Think, he told them. What's really changed for the beings in these mines? What will change? They're still stuck underground. They'll still have to drill into the planet and pull up, or they'll still be able to control their own condition, their wages, their lives, Jodrum said. That's better than what they had under House Petro. He then added quickly, it doesn't excuse everything. I'm not saying that. But these people. They've been through hell already, Jade said. They might bring it with them if they ever leave this place, Warren said. What's going to happen to all these free world popping up? Are they going to join the Alliance? Be independent. That's something Atlanta Senator D.J. O. would know, Jay said. Jedi aren't supposed to be political like that. We came here to help people. And these people need help. It's just... Political help may be the only help that works, Warren told them. The humans looked at him with hints of skepticism in their eyes. Right now, Senex Juvex is in chaos. It needs peace and order, and that has to come from strong leadership. The houses? Jodrum said with sarcasm and disdain. No, not just strong leadership. Good leadership. So not Saviar then? No, though she does seem strong. Warren turned his red eyes to Jade. Do you think your cousin would be a good leader? She seems like it, but that's just what I've heard. Jade blinked. Um, I don't know. I think so. I'm not sure if she really wants that though. Her mother had total control over hapes, and look how that ended. Still, if peace needs to be brought about, aren't the Jedi uniquely suited to do it? If a Jedi really believes that peace has to come from above, shouldn't he or she seek the necessary power? Every time a Force user's taken over the galaxy in the past thousand years has been a Sith, Jodrum reminded him darkly. What about Leia Organa Solo? She led the New Republic for almost and she was considered a success. Yes, but she didn't have time to fully train as a Jedi until after she resigned, Jade said. Warren's blue brow wrinkled. As you sure? She was my great aunt. I'm sure. Ah, of course. Sometimes he almost forgot how the galaxy's most important family lines tangled together. I'm not saying I have answer. Just so many more questions. Master Mjallu would say there's most wisdom in questions than answers. Warren smirked. The logic instructors in Chiss Space will scorn her for that. Jedi have a different kind of wisdom, Jodrum said. Yes. I think that's what I was saying a minute ago, Warren said. And before either of them could object, he told them, I'm starting to understand why the Chiss keep themselves locked away from the rest of the galaxy. Order and security, safety and predictability. Those are important to us. Out here with the rest of the galaxy. You don't get any of those things, Jodrum said. You just have to find a way to go with the flow. He was probably right, but Warren had a hard time accepting that too. Going with the flow here on Veridan would have meant joining in the vengeful rush toward the helpless security officers. It meant sitting back and trusting Saviar and her partisans and Mandalorian thugs to somehow build peace out of bloody chaos and Synex Juvex. Warren definitely couldn't do that. It left him all too restless. That night, after Master Mjallu returned and they all settled someone else's bed spreads, Warren rose and slipped out into the night. When we walked out into the streets, he slipped on a set of goggles that both improved his night vision and hid the glow from his red eyes. There had been a curfew in this mining town before the revolution, and there was still one now. Partisans and the occasional Mandalorian patrolled the city at late hours, when the glow globes suspended between the city and the high cavern ceiling were dimmed to almost nothing. The force was his alley at night. He could send the alert minds of patrolling watchmen and avoid them. The town's precise grid streets made navigation and evasion both very easy. This was his third time getting close to the mining complex at night. None of the others, not even Master Mjallu, had noticed him slipping out. At least, none of them had mentioned it and he figured at least Mjallu would have. A high fence made of reinforced plasteel shafts rose around the entire facility, separating the city 
and his people from the great shaft that plunged kilometers deep toward Veridan's molten core. On his first night visit, Warren had skirted around the fence, scoping out where the security sensors were and watching the live guards at the security gate miners would have gone through to work every day. On his second, he'd gotten close at places where the sensor grid had a gap. He peered through the high plastic pikes at the boring machinery, the walkways and ladders, and lift tubes that plunged deep into a shaft that must have been 10 meters wide at the mouth. They mined ore here, he knew, which meant the big shaft probably split into smaller ones as the miners chased veins of minerals deeper and deeper. Some light echoed up from deep in the shaft. They were probably working still just like they'd been working when he sneaked up close two nights before. He knew what he had to do. He couldn't come all this way just to stand out and look for a third time. The pikes of the fence were over 10 meters high and topped with pressure-based alarms against anyone who might be able to scale the slick plastic shafts. Getting over it safely would have been impossible for anyone but a Jedi. In the quiet and dark it was easy to concentrate. The ground seemed to fall out from under Warren's feet as he concentrated. In the breezeless cavern he left like he was levitating, stationary, even as he rose higher and higher. He dared open his eyes and saw he was hovered 12 meters over the ground. The tip of the wall was below him too. He pushed himself over the edge, then descended just as carefully. His boots touched hard earth without a sound. As he approached the mouth of the shaft he didn't see any guards on patrol. The outer wall was nigh unbreachable and manpower was limited, so it made sense, but the emptiness of the mine complex struck Warren as eerie, almost haunted. The only sound came from a main power generator on the opposite rim of the shaft, the one that powered the drilling machines and transportation tubes kilometers down. When Warren got to the rim, he peered down into an abyss. Three industrial strength lift tubes plunged down too and he could just barely make out where the main shaft began to split off into smaller ones. He saw a bright light down one in particular. They must have been working still. He wondered that to do next. The walls of the shaft were rocky and jagged. The surface would be easy to scale down, especially with the help of the force, but he wasn't crazy about climbing down such a huge distance, especially when he had no idea what lay beneath or if it was even worth investigating. He was about to step back from the shaft and explore the other structures along his rim when he heard a faint noise from down below. He tensed and reached out with the force. No one was nearby but someone was coming up. The noise grew louder until he realized a lift was coming up out of the shaft. He scooted back a little from the rim, pressed his body flat against the earth, and watched. When the lift doors opened he saw a trio of thick bodies hurriedly step out. Miners or technicians? Probably. Next were a couple partisans with red armbands, and then a single Mandalorian in bronze armor. Savyar came out last. Rather than the blood red dress she'd worn to the massacre she had on a simple dark tunic, form fitting and vaguely martial. Black hair fell back off her high falling forehead and spilled over her shoulders. She stopped as soon as she got out of the lift and looked around in a half circle arc, as though she was looking for something. Warren stiffened. He fought the urge to back away and pressed himself flatter against the rock. After an agonizing moment, Savyar looked away. She said something to the Mandalorian and her people kept walking toward one building closer to the gate with his light still on. He should follow her. He should find out what her goals really were. He shoved down all his fear and rose to a crouch. Keeping his back and head as low as possible, he scampered through the dark. By the time Savyar and her company were almost at the entrance, he was just 10 meters behind them. That was when the voice shouted, Halt! Hands on your head! Warren ducked on instinct, stupidly hoping they were shouting at some other intruder. Then a pair of spotlights from atop the gate blinded him. He wrenched the night vision goggle from his face. Still squinting, he spun in a circle and tried to make out the guards coming for him. Both of the partisans with Savyar were marching toward him, rifles raised. Another two were jogging from the gate. The wall stretched out 30 meters behind him and nobody was coming from there. He turned and ran, crouched low, bobbing and weaving at the spotlight struggled to track him, and laser blasts whipped over his head. The wall surged up closer, closer, 
and he wondered if he could actually summon enough concentration with the force to pull himself over it. Over his panic and the tang of laser blasts, he didn't hear the Mandalorian's jet back until the mercenary was literally on top of him. The armor body knocked him off his feet. A hard boot slammed into his chest, cracking a rib. Warren fought through the pain. He rolled onto his back and looked up. The Mandalorian's armor gleamed in the spotlights as he pulled the pistol and aimed. Warren's defensive instincts kicked in. In the space of two seconds, he pulled his lightsaber from his hidden pouch, flicked it on, and sheared the muzzle of the Mando's blaster. So much for keeping secrets. He stumbled to his feet, fighting off the pain in his chest. The Mandalorian was still in his way and reaching for another weapon. Warren turned and saw the four other guards catching up. They popped off more laser blasts that he caught with his saber. Savior was coming up behind them. He had one arm raised to deflect a laser blast when something wrapped tight around him. It caught his waist and hip and pinned his other arm to his side. Mandalorian fiber cord. He couldn't run. He couldn't fight. The guards were shouting at him to drop the saber in his free hand. Savior was walking straight and confidently toward Warren. Their eyes met across darkness and distance and she smirked. Something black welled up inside Warren, humiliation, anger, hatred, despair. He threw hurled his lightsaber through the air, guided it with the force as it flew in a straight line right for the woman who'd done so much to drive Senex Juvex into bloody chaos. It took less than a second to reach her but the second lasted forever. She stopped and stared at the bright death lancing toward her. Surprise flickered over her face, wilting that smug smile. Then the smile returned. Just before the lightsaber could spear her through the face it suddenly shut off, jerked in midair, and slapped into Savire's waiting palm. As realization dawned a stun bolt caught Warren's chest and dropped him. Chapter 18 Darth Keekit could not remember his life before the one Sith. But Darth Zorin had told him he'd been born to impoverished refugees displaced by the U.S. Hinvong destruction of Barabai. He wondered if some suppressed infant's memory was responsible for the abject revulsion he'd felt for that race of invaders all his life. After ravaging over half the galaxy, the U.S. Hinvong had as much collapsed on their own as been defeated, then graciously allowed by the Jedi to seek exile and redemption on the living planet Zanima II. That had been almost 50 years ago and most beings alive in the galaxy today had never seen a U.S. Hinvong or any of their instruments of destruction. In some ways that merely reinforced their legend and the hatred the very mention of them aroused. Still, the galaxy was vast, and their relics still drifted through the stars, abandoned organic battlecruisers, coral skipper starfighters, even the great planetoid-sized world ships in which the Vong had migrated for centuries through the abyss between galaxies. The U.S. Hinvong had never come closer to Synax Juvex, so Kikit was still uncertain when, where, and how one of those great and dying world ships had been found and relocated to a hiding place in the Shroud. He supposed he could have asked his host, but the old hatreds ran deep, and he tried to speak as little with Villeth Dal as possible. The Shaper disarmed him partially because he was so unlike the U.S. Hinvong conjured in popular nightmares. Instead of being a mutilated and fearsome warrior, Hulking and encased in spiked Von Dunn crab armor, Villeth Dow was tall and narrow and usually wrapped in some animal skin cloak. The tentacled headdress common to his cast writhed over a face that was tattooed but unscarred. Despite his age, he carried himself with a dignity that was almost aristocratic, and whenever they spoke, Kikit had the suspicion the U.S. Hinvong is looking down on him, a rare experience for the Sith Lord used to being feared. He couldn't tell for sure, like all of his race, Villeth Dow seemed to exist outside the Force entirely. It was the most disconcerting thing of all. It is strange, the Shaper said as they walked down one of the long, rocky-looking corridors that wound its way through the vast world ship. When I was a child, I was raised on a world ship like this. I was promised that one day I would stand on feet of U.S. and to recreate it. On that day our exile would be over and we'd never have to drift through the stars on these artificial worlds again. Kika made no reply, so Villa Dow went on, I've stood on planets, even one that's the closest to U.S. Enter as we'll ever get. By the end of it I wanted nothing more than to stand on a world ship again. Isn't it curious?
He looked intently at Kikid as they walked. Because a response seemed necessary, the bearable said, nostalgia can be a powerful force. True, but I don't believe it's only that. Sometimes one must journey far to decide where he can truly belong. Since he didn't say it as a question, Kikid didn't answer. They came upon the end of the corridor and walked into the space beyond. The path they were walking on continued, now on an elevated walkway that rose on evenly spaced stilts over what looked like a landscape of deep craters. Far below them, workers moved in and out of the craters. They gathered close to a hundred thousand beings on this vong monstrosity, most of them loyalists to Savyar. This world ship had once carried over a hundred million, and those who worked in it now were focused in only two areas that Villadal had worked decades to rejuvenate while the rest of the old living ship's interior slowly died. Kika tilted his head back and looked high above. The transparent organic shell spread over the crater pit tinted things red and blurred the view beyond, but the shroud was still an impressive sight. When will you test the hyperdrives? He asked Villadal. Very soon. Don't worry, Darth Kika. I've been monitoring all the Davin basils we've grown in this ship. They'll pull us into dark space without any problem. Kikid was more worried that whatever seen our brain this world ship had might throw them into some planetoid or radiated dust cloud drifting through the shroud. But he said, you will need to test the Davin basils. All of them? We've already done trials with the offensive ones. They'll perform magnificently. All of this was inspired by an infidel weapon you know. Villith Dow said with a slanted grin. He'd been with the one Sith for 30 years, but he still called non Vong infidels. It was another reason not to trust him. I did not realize you were allowed to be inspired by our technology. Of course we are. We've also been inspired by it and adapted to it. Villith Dave waved a modified, six-fingered hand. It was the lifeless nature of your machines that always appalled my people. But no matter. The point is, when we bring this world ship against them, it will bring cruel poultry with it. Vengeance, Kikid admitted, is a very sad trait. A U.S. and Vong won as well. It's no wonder I felt at home among your kind. Villith Dow looked down at the crated pits and breathed deeply. Not the only reason, of course. Even during the war, I never had the chance for such creative shaping. Kikid knew that without Villith Dow's creative techniques, Darth Crate, Dark Lord of the Sith and Master of the One, would have died from battle wounds and his own Vondo and Crab armor. The One Sith owed their continued existence to this U.S. Vong. It was something Kikid had to remind himself of often. They walked in silence across the bridge through more corridors until they reached the communications room. It was itself very unorthodox. Instead of hosting a choir of sack-like Villip communication devices, a metal holo projector sat in the center of the chamber glistening in the pulsing light of the lamp and creatures planted in the Yorick coral ceiling. Kika tapped the communications console with the claw. He and Villith Dow stepped together in front of the projector and waited until the blue holo image of his master appeared. So you are together, Darth Zorn said. Excellent. Is everything proceeding as promised, Darth Kika? Nearly, master. We've yet to test the Davin Basil's controlling light speed. Yes. It has been years since those were fired. The falling shifted her eyes to Villith Dow. Prepare to run at least one test. Then prepare for battle. Is the Alliance moving against us? There was a husky hunger in the U.S. Vong's voice. Their second full fleet is nearly at Ismeru. We can expect a full incursion soon. Where should we demonstrate the weapon? I can't say yet. Wait until you see where the largest portion of their fleet is distributed. I'd wager some throne world that's still contested. Anturus, perhaps, or Carfadian. When you know, act. You won't be joining us, master, asked Kikit. I will try, but I'm afraid I've been delayed on Veridan. She smirked. A Jedi infiltrator was captured sneaking around the mines. A Jedi, Kikit hissed. An apprentice, but I'm sure he didn't come here alone. Until I find his friends, I won't be leaving Veridan. I understand. We will take the fight to the Alliance in your stead. I have no doubt you will succeed, Darth Kikit. And you, a Master Shaper? Villith Dal inclined his head. I live to serve. 
I know. Now get ready, both of you. Time is short. The holo winked off. Darth Keekit and Villith Dow stared at the projector for a moment before turning to each other. It's as she said. Villith Dow's headrest writhed. Time is short. Let's go. When the glow lamps in the great cavern brought up daylight, it was clear that something was wrong. The worst part was that Jade wasn't surprised by it. Nameless anxiety had clung to her all night, trapping her in a stake between wake and sleeping. When the light finally pried her eyes open and she rolled over to see Warren's bedroll empty, her first thought was that explains it. You don't think he could have gone off to get food, do you? Jodrum sounded torn between skepticism and desperate hope. I mean, heck old have. Master Jalu closed her big black eyes and shook her head. If he meant for us to know he was leaving, he'd have told us. So what does that mean? Was he trying to run out on us? Get back to the ship. What do I think? Jay sighed. Warn. Running. I don't think he's a coward. But, Jodrum trailed off. He didn't want to admit that the thought of leaving had been flitting through his own head. We must ask around and search the city, Jalu said. Well, said Jodrum, a chis is easy to spot. Unless he's trying hard to hide. If no one has seen him, then I think his path is obvious. The mine complex, said Jade. He went to the shaft. To look for Savyar. And do what? Capture her all by himself. Jodrum shook his head. Warren's got some weird ideas, but he's not stupid. None of us are as wise as we think we are, Jalu said grimly. And in the heat of the moment, we sometimes do things we not normally do. Gather everything you need and let's go. I have a feeling we won't be coming back here. Jade froze. A feeling, master. Or the force. Who can say? The Bim shrugged. Hurry, children. Wherever he is, he needs our help. Consciousness came back slowly. Light and color moved without shape. Thoughts were hard to gather, and so was memory. Some low sound rattled in his skull from time to time until he realized the sound was him, groaning. When he tried to move his arms and legs he found them bound, and his body pinned flat to something cold and hard. By the time Savyar appeared before him, it had pretty much all come back. He could even remember, in photographic detail, the confident, condescending smirk on her green face as she plucked his lightsaber from the air and slapped it into her hand with the power of her mind. What is your name? She asked. Her voice was low, unreadable. He tried to reach out in the forest, just to sense if anyone else was in the room. They seemed to be alone. You're only an apprentice, she stated. I wasn't even aware there were any of your kind in the Jedi Order. Are there others or are you the only one? He tried to roll his head and look away but a bodiless hand gripped his face tight and turned it to face the falling woman. She'd taken two steps closer and bent slightly over him now. I was asking a simple question, she said. Are there more of you? Or are you a trailblazer? I'm the only one, he rasped. Interesting. Tell me, is it lonely? She sounded sympathetic rather than mocking. He used the force again and tried to get a sense of her but her presence was vague, impossible to read. The Jedi are my clan now, he told her. Oh, but that's not really true, is it? Even with the Chiss you never really fit. It's why you went off to the Jedi in the first place. You see, there are some beings in this galaxy who will never belong wherever they go. They can spend their lifetime struggling with the fact, or they can accept it. You don't know anything about me. You don't even know my name? Names, she shrugged, dismissive. What's my name, boy? I'm sure you know. He licked dry lips. You're Savyar. You're wrong. Almost all the galaxy calls me that, but they're wrong, too. I was born Savyar. The galaxy sees me as Savyar. But that's not what I am. She leaned in close and ran fingers lightly through his hair. Breath tickled his forehead as she said, What I am is Sith. He fought a shudder. All the implications that had rushed through his head when she caught his lightsaber fell into awful order. All of this is you, he said. The uprising. The slaughter. The chaos. You. The Sith. 
That condescending smile appeared again. Do you really think that? Of course you would. You're so young. You think everything has such neat cause and effect just like everything has a single name. Oppression breeds desperation. Desperation breeds violence and violence breeds the dark side. Senex Juvex has been oppressed for a thousand years. Do you think I've brainwashed all those angry beings with Sith magic? No. It was all inside them already. I only gave them a chance to let it out. This is all happening because of you. Because you. She snapped. Do you want to know my real name? Warren nodded. Very slightly. My true name is Darth Zorn. Sith lie. He said instinctively. What do you know about the Sith? She sounded genuinely curious. I know you're their agent. They sent you here to start this revolt, to destabilize the Alliance and draw in the Jedi. Wrong again. She placed a finger on his lips, sealing them. Listen carefully. I was born Savyar, and I was born on Jeweler into refugees from the Vong War. My parents died when I was a child. I scraped by living on the worst worlds in Cynic Juvex. I spent a lot of time in house prisons. That's what the galaxies read about me, and it's entirely true. She leaned in close again. The Sith found me. They trained me and showed me what I've been all along. Who I've been? Do you know what my name means? Her finger was still pinned to his lips. He shook his head very slightly. Saviar is a type of fragrant flower on Falling. Or it was, before the Vong came. I suppose my parents thought I could bring a little life and beauty they needed in their lives. Zorin is a word in the ancient Sith tongue. It's the name I chose for myself. Zorin means justice. She pulled back her finger. Warren said, justice. What's happening here isn't justice. Of course it is. This isn't just mindless violence. This is retribution against the houses for all the wrong they've done for a thousand years. That's not justice. That's revenge. Revenge is the only true justice, she hissed. The Sith are delivering that. I am delivering that. Tell me, what have the Jedi done for Synex Juvex ever? Warren wanted to retort but was stuck with his jaw open and no words. He wanted to tell her that he really didn't know, that he hadn't studied the history of the sectors in enough detail, but there surely been something because Jedi wouldn't have let innocent people suffer for so long. It was a lame response. He didn't even bother. When he closed his mouth, the falling woman went on. The Jedi did nothing because that is the Jedi way. For 1,000 years, they sat in their temple on Coruscant and did everything they could to consolidate their power and prestige under the guise of serving the Force and protecting the Old Republic. When the Sith toppled them, their first goal was to claw their way back into power. The Jedi aren't even part of the Alliance anymore which should have freed them to help Synex Juvex finally. But they didn't. Can you tell me why? He stubbornly shook his head. Because they cannot. They serve the light, they say. They serve peace and order and use it as an excuse to sit on their hands. Their precious moral righteousness is a form of complacency. In the end, they let anything horrible pass unless it threatens them specifically. There can be no justice without darkness. Without the desperation and anger, and need only a victim knows. The Jedi are afraid of the dark, afraid of themselves, so they'll never take the steps to truly right and justice in the galaxy. You're lying, he said. Am I really? She snarled, and deep down Warren believed she wasn't, that she really meant everything she said. Only those who use the Force have the power to truly remake the galaxy. The Jedi will never bring justice to the ones who need it most. There will only be an end to strife when everything is under Sith rule. Warren suddenly felt like he was trapped in some cruel mirror image of his last conversation with Jade and Jadra. Your creed and strife, he said. The galaxy must be broken before it can be remade. The breaking starts here. She ran her fingers across his cheek with surprising softness. You can play a part in that breaking if you chose. It took Warren a second to realize what she was offering. I will never join the Sith. You wouldn't be the first to swear that pledge. Then recant. Our own master did. Your master? You desire order. Stability. Justice. I can sense that in you. The cruel smile came back. And you have anger as well. I'm a Jedi. 
I've always wanted to be a Jedi, and I'll die before I do anything to help you. The smile wilted and settled into a grim frown. I believe you mean what you're saying. She seemed earnestly disappointed. In that case, I don't suppose you will volunteer where your friends are hiding. I came alone. It sounded like a lie, even to him. I was hoping we could come to some accord, one force user to another, she sighed. Don't say I didn't offer mercy. He grounded his teeth together and tried to brace himself. What now? You'll torture me? She raised a hand, fingers cupped and pointing upward. Tiny sparks of lighting danced from tip to tip. Like I said, I offered mercy. Warren opened his mouth for a last retort, but fingers like claws dug into his chest and all he could do was scream. For three Jedi it was easy to get over the secured fence and into the mining complex, even in daylight. The barrier had a circumference of almost two kilometers total and there were places where they could pull themselves over without being spotted by sensors or watchful eyes. The trickier part was avoiding the beings moving around the wide shaft, working the lifts and bringing the great machinery to life. They were taking cover behind an equipment shed, tensely talking out how to search the area when everyone suddenly stopped. Do you feel it? Jade whispered. I feel it, Jodrum nodded grimly. It's warm. He's in great pain, Mjalus fur bristled. They're torturing him. He's close by. Jade felt sick. When she felt something was wrong during the night she should have wrenched herself away. She should have grabbed Master Mjalu and done something. A real Jedi didn't fail her friends. Master? Can you locate him? Chadram asked. The Bim closed her eyes and took a deep breath. A shudder ran through her body and her fur bristled. I have him, she muttered, but didn't say more. Master, what is it? Jade asked. What else do you sense? Mjalu opened her eyes. Brace yourselves, children. Have your weapons ready. Where is he? Press Chadram. She peeked her head over the side of the shed and pointed to a building on the rim of the shaft, tucked close to the power generator. It looks guarded, Jay said. Can we distract them? There's got to be a way to get to the gate out front, said Jadron. That is not difficult, Mjalu nodded. As you know, I have a certain affinity for affecting energy flow. Triggering an alarm will not be difficult. What else is there? Jade asked. Jalu had holding something back that was obvious. I hope I am wrong, the Bim said, but I believe the challenge lays within that building, not outside it. Jadrum gripped his lightsaber. Let's get it over with, then. Indeed, Jalu nodded, but she hesitated for a moment more before she closed her eyes and reached out with the force. Jig glanced at Jadrum, whose face was set in uncomplicated determination. He didn't seem to be sensing whatever Mjalu had sensed, whatever was gnawing in the back of Jay's mind. Whatever was in there, whatever that source of anxiety was, it felt familiar somehow, which was the strangest thing of all. Back by the gate, the alarm started wailing. Mjalu opened her eyes and took a breath. Jade peeked out from their hiding place and saw a bunch of men with red armbands and rifles running toward the sound of the klaxons. They're moving, she whispered. Then let's go, said Jadrum. He was up before he finished speaking and running before he finished rising. Jay scrambled up too and sprinted for the building as quickly as she could, calling on a touch of the force to aid her long, leaping strides. She got maybe two-thirds of the way across the gap before lasers started flying in her direction. Jadrum was almost at the building. She kept sprinting after him, praying the shooter didn't get her first. When she got closer, Jodrum's gold lightsaber sprung to life in his hand. He pushed back from the building side toward Jade, lunged, a caught a laser blast before it could scorch across her forehead. Jade grabbed his shoulder and pulled them both forward until she slammed against the wall. She rebounded, turned, looked around even as she ignited her violet saber. Master Mjalu was running as fast as his small legs could carry her. A few bright plasma blasts lanced at her butt they bounced back without the bim giving any indication that she'd noticed. Jay tried to track the source of the blasts and spotted a soul figure in bronze Mandalorian armor, suspended in the air over the shaft by his jetpack. Inside, 
called Njalu as she got closer. Inside? Now. Jodrum didn't hesitate. He jumped up and stabbed his lightsaber through the building window. Fracture lines ran like a spider's web across the transparted steel. As he pulled his blade out, Jade sent a wave of force pressure that imploded the window, spraying shattered metal inside. Together, the three Jedi leaped through the window and plunged inside. What they saw inside was so simple, but it took an awful moment for Jade to comprehend. Warren was strapped flat to a hard metal table. Smoke rose from his chest, the scorched fabric of his tunic. Standing over him was a tall, green-skinned falling woman in a tight black tunic. Savior was staring at the Jedi as though they'd shown up late for a banquet. Run! Warren rasped. She's a, a eh? Sith, Mjalu said, sad and resigned. Savior raised both hands and let blue lightning lance out from her fingers. Jade held her lightsaber up and caught one volley, Jodrum caught the other. Savior stopped after one blast. She held her hands up, glancing at them, glancing at Warren's strapped body, considering. Don't you dare hurt him, Jodrum barked. Something dropped from her sleeve and into her hand. A red lightsaber sprung to life, and she raised it high over Warren's trapped body. Jade screamed, Jodrum lunged. Their blades rose together to block Savire's attack, but with her free hand, she summoned another burst of force lightning. Sizzling pain spasmed through their bodies, and they tumbled to the floor. Jay's lightsaber fell from her hand as electric spasms jolted through her, making her entire arm tremble and her fingers twitch uncontrollably. She watched her weapon roll toward the door, and she watched as the door opened. The bronze-armored Mandalorian stepped into the room, with the heavy rifle raised. Are you all right, madam? He asked. They're only apprentices, Savior sniffed. I was expecting more. Suddenly the Mando was lifted from his feet and thrown against the wall so hard it shattered the plaster. The mercenary grunted as he clattered to the ground. Savior turned her eyes on Master Njalu, standing unarmed beneath the shattered window. Ah, the falling said, Aerial Jedi. She raised her free hand and sent another blast of force lighting. This one arced over the three prone apprentices, right toward the little bim. Mjalu raised one hand, and all the dark energy fell right into her palm. It sparked, sizzled, flared, and slowly burned down to nothing. Savior snarled. A lightsaber dropped into her hand and extended a blue blade. Warren's lightsaber. Mjalu sighed. Always violence. Tell me. Where would the Sith be without their weapons? The Force is my weapon. Savyar lunged. Without even crouching first, Mjalu somersaulted over Savyar's blades and landed on her shoulders. A strong kick, overpowered for such a small body, pounded the Feline's shoulders and knocked her face first onto a floor strewn with transparent steel shards. Despite the impressive show, Mjalu urgently snapped, free worn, and run. Children. Hurry. Jodrum was already pulling himself up. Jade called on the force and pulled her lightsaber back into her hand. She and Jodrum quickly and expertly sliced Warren's bindings without harming his arms or legs. Are you okay? Jodrum asked as he pushed Warren up by the shoulders. Can you move? My rib, Warren winced and clutched his side. From his scorched tunic it looked he had more problems than just that. Jade looked back to Savyar and Jalu. The falling was in the corner of the room, getting to her feet again, clutching both sabers, while the master Mjalu stood between her and the apprentices. Go, children, the bim said, not taking her eyes off Savyar. Hurry. Jade and Jodrum grabbed Warren by the shoulders and lurched for the door. The chis quickly put his boots in the ground and started moving with his own power. When they got close to the door, Savyar moved again not for the apprentices but for the broken window. Before Mjalu could stop her, she backflipped through the gap. Go, cried Mjalu, and all four Jedi rushed outside. Savior was waiting for them there. She lunged, both sabers flashing. Jay caught one, Jodrum the other. She raised a boot and kicked Jodrum hard in the chest, knocking him back. She lunged at Jade with both weapons, batted the girl's one saber and knocking her back one step. 
another, another. Then there was a horrible groaning sound. Saviar hesitated before bringing down one more blow. She looked up, and shock dawned on her face. Jade lunged, her lightsaber scored a shallow puncture in the feline's side before she skirted away. By the now the sound was louder. Jade looked up to see the great generator powering the mining machinery rattling like it was about to burst. Don't do it, Saviar shouted at Jalu. You'll kill us all. The bim shrugged, sighed, and the rattling stopped. Then one of the lift tubes plunging deep into the shaft twisted and screamed. Saviar snarled and lunged at Njalu with both sabers. Jay took a swipe but was too slow. Jodrum couldn't get to his feet on time and Warren had nothing to stop her with. Right before Saviar could strike Njalu, the shaft broke apart. As the lower half began to totter and collapse broken machinery from inside it flew up out of the shaft and became a deadly hell of hard metal. Saviar spun on one heel and swiped through one piece before it could bash in her head, but another slammed her hard on the shoulder. The falling stumbled and dropped Warren's saber. Don't stand looking. Jalu called to the apprentices. With the flick of a hand, she sent Warren's saber flying to him. To the fence. Go now. Jay saw that security teams, confused but armed, were already rushing toward them from the gate. She pulled Warren by one arm. Jodrum was right behind them. Behind them, Saviar threw another burst of force lightning at Jalu. This one was brighter, fiercer, angrier than before. Jade glanced over her shoulder and saw Jalu stagger and wince as she struggled to catch the energy. The guards began to shoot at them. She and Warren ducked low while Jodrum deflected the first blast. Jade looked again. The energy in Jalu's small hand sizzled, then burst out. Saviar was so close she caught a face full of her own dark lightning. She staggered and howled as it scorched her butt didn't drop her lightsaber. She lunged again, this time grabbing Jalu by the scruff of her neck and bodily hurling her toward the shaft. Jade yelled as her master hit the ground, tumbled, and almost rolled to the edge. Jalu stopped and pushed herself upright. She turned to face Saviar once more, back to the edge. Jalu was trembling now. Her black eyes met Jay's across the distance. The apprentice felt a touch on her cheek, like a soft furred hand. No! Jay screamed, even as Jodrum grabbed her sleeve and tucked her down right before a guard's shot cut her down. Suddenly more twisted machinery rose in the air. It started to fly in tightening circles like a hurricane of metal, with Master Jalu in the center. Even as she trembled, even as Saviar stalked toward her with lethal purpose, the bim closed her eyes. The debris kept flying through the air. It knocked down one guard, then another. Jade half stumbled and half let Jodrum drag her toward the fence. She kept looking back, watching. Every piece of metal flying at Saviar was deflected by lightsaber or by the force. Jade could feel her in the force, a storm of dark energy brewing stronger and stronger full of desperation and anger and hate. It was so awful, so overpowering, so familiar. Jay screamed. Jodrum and Warren grabbed her, one shoulder each, and threw her against the wall. We have to go, Jodrum shouted. Can you do it? Can you go over? Jay's head swam with revelation. Nothing would be the same again, nothing. But she saw her friends imploring and found the will to nod. None of them looked back as they rose into the air, slowly, unsteadily. They dropped themselves onto the top of the wall and perched there for a moment to regroup and recover. They all looked back then. They couldn't help it. They all turned just in time to see Saviar just meters away from Jalu, twisted metal still swirling around them both. They saw Saviar deflect one piece, dodge a second, then reach up with her free hand and pluck a third from the air. They watched her hurl it. They watched it spear through Master Jalu's chest. Her body crumpled instantly, and the flying wreckage clattered to the earth. Jay didn't jump so much as fall. As the ground rushed to meet her, she found the force, somehow, and slowed her drop just enough. As she landed hard and boots first on the safe side of the fence, Jade risked one last look over her shoulder. Through the plasteel pike, she saw Saviar give Jalu's broken body a single kick knocking it over the rim 
and into the shaft's endless plunge. Then they started to run. Chapter 19 At the beginning of Operation Enduring Peace, as the joint incursion into Senex Juvex had hastily been named, things happened fast. While Admiral Primvold remained at Asmeru with half the Third Fleet, the rest jumped ahead with four task force from the first. From Nilanen they skipped down the Senex Trace, past Fingren entirely. At the same time the Imperial Task Force entered the Senex Sector from Belsivis and routed to a staging point in empty space midway between the Atron and Carfedian system. They remained there in reserve while the Joint Alliance fleets, under command of Admiral Croce, dropped into orbit over the former Vandron homeworld of Carfedian and immediately issued a declaration that all sides were to cease hostilities. When faced with such overwhelming force, the ships in orbit offered their surrender. They were a motley mix of House Vandron pickets and modified ships typical of those commandeered by Savire's partisans. There were no Mandalorian ships among the lot which almost surely meant they were elsewhere. They'd gone to great lengths to keep the movements of the combined fleet secrets so none of their potential enemies would know where they'd chosen to make their stand. Elena watched it all with the other senior officials in the chamber on Coruscant that had acquired the uncomfortable but inevitable moniker of the War Room. Chief of State Savage sat beside her, along with a cluster of other senior senators, while the military and intelligence staff spanned the other half of the semicircle. As with the Battle of Fingerin, they watched it all on a holo manifesting combined tactical data transmitted from observation satellites and Admiral Crow's eyes flagship. As the Alliance fleets moved to encircle Carfedian, they began to disgorge their support ships, starfighters, shuttles, and landing craft that were to make their way into Carfedian's atmosphere and lay down troops who'd pacify the planet. This was the critical moment Alana knew. With the planet encircled and troops landed the Alliance would establish clear superiority over Carfedian. Resistance on the ground might be difficult, but it would be nearly impossible to pry the planet from the grasp of so many warships, even for a biggest fleet the Mandalorian mercenaries could muster. Crow's eye's voice came in clear through the comm connection. We've established space superiority. Ships will be at assigned positions in six standard minutes. Then we'll begin landing at target zones. I see that, Admiral, said Savash. Has there been any communication from the ground? Negative. Our first scout ships are dipping into the upper atmosphere now and doing scans. Please stand by. There was a single click as the link closed. Admiral Antilly said, things will be hard if it's chaos on the ground, but it might be harder if one sides firmly in control. They'll feel their victory is about to be stolen from them and fight her harder. Don't those Vandra ships in orbit signify is still contested? Asked Tyrk Dre Lai, the long-serving Bothan senator, who was chair of the Defense Council. Not necessarily, until he shook her head. We've gotten reports that some house security forces are switching sides rather than be captured. Are killed? Dre Lai muttered under his breath, Grayfur bristling. Hopefully Admiral Crow she will figure that out soon enough, Alana offered. As if on cue, the comm link clicked back on and the Gossam said, Command, we are in position and are beginning to deploy troop ships. Predict they'll start in landing at their targets in eight to nine minutes. What kind of resistance do you expect? Asked Savash. Ground situation is still hard to read, but we've seen no signs anti-orbital cannons or anything but local deflector shields. I don't anticipate landing will be trouble. However, Suddenly a new set of lights appeared on the tactical holo, two sets, in fact. One appeared from the coreward side of Carfedian orbit, one from the rimward end, and both were falling toward the planet and the Alliance fleet ringing it. Ah, Mandalorians, said Croce. Right on schedule. When the call to battle came, Tamar Skarada thought they'd be doing a rerun of the Battle of Fingren. When she dropped out of hyperspace and plunged her basket fighter toward the waiting fleet, she realized how mistake she'd been. This was going to be a much, much bigger brawl, and the forces they brought with them would never be enough. She felt an urge to calm the Mandalor's flagship and ask him if he'd gone Mirisic, but instead patched her comlink directly to her cousin. Dornica, you read? Loud and clear. Are we supposed to all those ships? 
That seems to be the plan, he grated. She checked her scanners. They are pumping out fighters now. D-wings, tri-wings, the works. We'll never take them all, or protect Carfedian. Maybe we're supposed to give him a bloody nose and run. I sure asked a shab what we could get a Hercom board lit up. Finally. She switched her channel and heard Jevron Auchis in her ear, saying, All fighters, cut ahead and keep those drop ships from hitting Atmo. Repeat, target the drop ships. Don't stop to engage their fleet. We'll hang back and draw as many of their snubs off your back as we can. When the signal ended, as abruptly as it came, she switched back to Dorn's comm line. Hear that? I guess we've got our orders. Think we can punch through their forward line. She checked her scanners, checked space ahead with her eyes. The Alliance was keeping some fighters to escort the drop ships, but most of them were wheeling around the intercept the newcomers. Of course, there were many more Alliance fighters than there were Mando Beskids, and half those enemy cruisers probably still had fighters in their hangars. Still, Beskids were fast, just as fast as the enemy Tri-Wings. If they could break through the initial line of hostiles coming at them now, they could probably catch up with the clunky shuttles and drop ships while they were still in the atmosphere. They couldn't keep the Alliance from occupying Carfedian, but they could make it extra costly. Let's punch some radii in the nose, she growled and throttled forward. I knew you'd say that, Dorn breathed, and jumped ahead too. As chief tactical officer on Voidwalker, Davek fell, was given all the details of the battle happening over Carfedian, even as the entire Imperial Task Force set light years outside the system. Standing at a station in the aft of the bridge, he traced the movements of all the Alliance capital ships, the launch of their fighters, and landing craft the arrival of the Mandalorians and the joining of battle. In the beginning, the mood among the bridge crew had been one of sullen patience. After the labor and headache of prepping for a battle that would be the first for most of them, it felt unfair to sit back and watch as other soldiers, Alliance soldiers especially, did the fighting. One thing Davik was sure, though, was that he was glad they weren't part of that first wave toward the planet. The Mandalorian Beskid fighters were fast and nimble and barely slowed down as they cut through the screen of Alliance interceptors. Now they were on their way into the atmosphere to attack the troop ships heading for Carfedian's main population centers. Our ties would have stopped them, muttered one of his subordinates. We don't know that for sure, Ensign Korak, Davek warned the dark-haired man. Those Mandas are tough flyers with tough ships. We saw what they did at Fingren, sir, said another ensign, a female Keldor named Poor Dunn. Then you shouldn't need reminding. Never underestimate your enemies. Is there an issue in your section, Lieutenant? Kamal suddenly said. Davik tried not to jump. Ensign Korak did too, less well. The first officer was behind them, eyeing them carefully. Well, is there? The Mandalorians have cut through the initial alliance line, sir. Davek said. They're going to start cutting up those drop ships any minute now. Do you think the Alliance will call on us for aid? I don't know, sir. Then we should all keep quiet, wait, and see. Kamal passed his glare to the ensigns, let it linger for a second, then moved on. Don't normally see him with a stick up his butt, breathed Korak. That's enough, ensign, Davek said, quiet but firm. He was right, though. Kamal wasn't exactly a Martinet first officer. The anxiety of battle must have been getting to him. It was getting to them all in different ways. Korak wasn't normally this chatty. They kept watching the developments in stern silence. Davek let his glare dart between the tactical readouts and Captain Lorne, who remained seated in his command chair, elbows and armrests and long fingers clasped in front of him, facing the fore of the bridge and his view of empty stars dotted by engine flare. The moon didn't seem to be paying attention to anything on the bridge, but Davik knew otherwise. The captain was picking it all up with his keen hearing, waiting for something major to happen. When he watched the tactical readouts, the situation was pretty clear. As expected, the Mandalorian ships plunged into the atmosphere and shot down over 50% of the Alliance drop ships before they could land. In orbit, the Mando frigates and corvettes had joined with the enemy fleet. Too small and scattered to withstand a pitched battle, 
and Mandos were instead doing fast hit-and-run attacks on the bigger cruisers. It was a good way to deal damage, but there was no way the Mandalorians could win this fight. Davak expected them to pull their fighters back and withdraw, but they didn't. They kept up with the fast attacks, even as the Alliance ships broke formation to try and contain them. Again, the Alliance had numbers on their side. The Mandalorians could flit around and sting like angry thunder wasps, but sooner or later, they'd be encircled and pulverized by the big Mon Cal cruisers and star defenders. Then a new set of lights appeared on the tactical holo. Davik announced, Captain, a second wave of Mandalorian ships has appeared. I'm counting two-thirds the strength as the first wave. Understood, Lieutenant. Thank you. Lorne didn't look back or budge in his command chair, but they all knew their chances of being called into the fight had gotten higher. What are they hoping to do? Muttered poor Dunn. Bash the Alliance as hard as they can, what do you think? Said Korak. Yes, but then what? Poor Dunn kept her voice down and glanced at Kamal across the bridge, near the gunnery station. They still can't win a pitch fight. They're probably betting the Alliance will run if they get punched hard enough. I wouldn't bet on that, Davak told them. He pointed out to the groups of green lights forming on the holo. They were forming into defensive clusters. See? They've had to abandon their landing attempts but they'll slug it out before they run because they know they can win a slugging match. Then what are the Mandos doing, sir? Asked poor Dunn. It just doesn't make sense. Davik frankly had no idea, and before he could hazard a guess, Lieutenant Rimmer called from the comm station. Signal from Admiral Brant. Alliance has requested full assistance. We are go for launch. The crew tensed, but Lorne just raised his hand slowly, steadily. Understood. All crews, run final checks. Come, count us down. Yes, sir. Two minutes to launch. Davik and the tactical crew quickly ran through their checks. Davik personally commanded Major Sly to inform him to put Razor Company on standby in the hangar. While he was telling Commander Samar to get ready to launch his birds, Lieutenant Renwar announced one minute to light speed. Lastly, Davik patched in with his counterpart on Shieldbreaker. Lieutenant Pelkey's voice was smooth, firm, and reassuring as always. Walker, our bombers are ready to deploy once we exit hyperspace. Good. Have them fall behind black, gray, and gold squads. Stand by for targeting information. Will do. Good luck, Walker. You too, Breaker. Happy hunting. He waited a split second for a little more of her voice, but nothing came so he closed the link. Rim recounted 30 seconds. Davek looked over his ensigns all younger than him but not by much. Lieutenant Commander Kamal was moving around the bridge fast now, a storm of motion with the captain at the eye, making sure all divisions were ready for launch. Ready, sir, Davek declared when his turn came. Kamal didn't stop until all sections were good. Five seconds of silence followed and then, perfectly timed, Lieutenant Renwar announced, three, two, one, zero. Loud and firm. Captain Lawrence said, launch. Voidwalker lurched forward with the rest of the fleet, stretched toward the stars, and was enveloped by the light of hyperspace. Davek's breath held. The jump lasted less than 10 seconds before they fell out of light and into Carfedian's outer orbit. Right where they wanted to be. Launch began the second they dropped out of hyperspace. Black Squad went first, followed by Gray Squad, with Gold Squad last the forward tight X fighters slowed so that Miracia's dozen ships could join the same stretched out line and approach the enemy as a single front. In the center of her viewport was the planet, emerald against the shroud. Lights of a joint battle flashed and winked in the distance. They'd resolve into starships and explosions very fast. Miracia's mouth felt dry. This was a real battle then, a big one, bigger than anything the galaxy had seen in decades. Was the long piece officially over? That was for politicians and historians to decide. She tried to focus on the approaching battle. She tried to steady her breathing and pretend her palm wasn't sweating hard inside his glove. All ships, this is the CAG. Commander Samar's voice sounded in her helmet. Blue and red squads hold back. 
Gold Squad, take rear position and protect the bombers. Black and Gray, ahead with me. Prepare to engage the Mandalorian fighters. Understood. Lead, said Gray Leader. Targets of opportunity are protect our ships. Stand by on that. Might need to save some Alliance hide first. She could hear Samara's smug grin. She wished she felt that confident. She was anxious but she wasn't getting any of those sudden bad feelings. At least, she didn't think she was. As Gold Squad dropped back to protect the bombers the other two lurched ahead. She checked her scanners, as expected. Admiral Brant's Oswald Teshik was moving forward toward the closest battle point. Right alongside it was the FN Ceridi. It had probably disgorged all its fighters now. They were probably all hurling right toward the Mandas now, minutes away from glory or death. Maybe Gold Squad would get that today, maybe not. Voidwalker and Shieldbreaker were deployed on the far end of the Imperial line. She expected they'd split off to some side engagement with Resolution and the rest of the support ships, but the order hadn't come down yet. Then, without warning, Static burst over her sensor readout. When it came back it was on the fritz. A red circle, blinking, had suddenly appeared behind the Imperial ships. These readouts weren't meant to be scale accurate, but Circle was absolutely giant, almost as wide across as the Imperial line. She never seen anything like it. Great time for the computer to go on go haywire, she muttered. She was tempted to hit the screen to see if anything changed, but one of her pilots shouted, Holy carp! Look at that! What's up, Six? Asked another. Look. Behind us. Look. Maragia was about to tell them all to shut up when her stomach lurched in her gut. A sudden tug of inertia had tried pulling her back against her chair, like she'd just rapidly accelerated when she'd done nothing of the kind. The only thing she knew of that could have that effect was a gravity well projector coming online, but even then the pull was never so strong. The red mark in her F sensors wasn't going away. She slowed down and pivoted her tie X to look behind her while momentum kept carrying the ship forward. As she swung around she saw the line Imperial destroyers and support ships, dozens and all. And behind them was a rocky planetoid, vaguely disc-shaped, with arms branching off like those of a spiral galaxy. It was huge, at least a hundred kilometers in diameter. It was like nothing she'd ever seen but she knew she'd seen it before, in holo records, in history books. Her mind reeled, struggling to put a name on the impossible. A U.S. Vong world ship, Senator Dre like gaped. How? How? For an awful moment, the command room stared at the holographic readouts in stunned silence. When Elena found her voice, she said, Get Admiral Croce. Now. After a second, the gossip crackled, Command, this is the Admiral. We are. Uh, we see the world ship. Savash said, voice shockingly firm. Admiral, where did it come from? From his vector it appears to have come from the shroud. It's dropped right on top of the Imperials. Is it launching fighters? Asked Admiral Antilles. No, it's not launching anything. It's just no, it's not sitting there. It's approaching the planet, slowly. And it's thrown up a gravity well, a huge one. He didn't have to say there was no escape. Even as Ice took hold of her gut, Alana asked, Admiral, have you tried hailing it yet? Can we even hail them? Someone whispered. We've not attempted yet? Croce stuttered. He clearly didn't know either. We will do so now. As the link cut off, Draylai looked to Alana. Senator, what the devils is going on? The Vong. Here. Now. Are we even sure it is the Vong? Asked Antilles. They're not launching other ships. More calmly than the rest, but still bleeding tension in the force, Savash swung his head to Alana. Well, Senator, do you know anything about this? All eyes were on her, and she wanted to scream. But no, they were right to look at her. The Jedi had negotiated the Vong surrender 45 years ago. The Jedi had overseen their exile on the rogue planet Zonima II and were the only ones who knew the world's location. The Jedi were the galaxy's sole conduit to the U.S. Vong, and she was the only Jedi in the room. Before she could say anything, one of the techs reported, 
we are seeing strange readings from the world ship. Strange how? Asked Draylai. Ah, I'm not sure. I've never studied Vong Tech, but it looks like gravitic anomalies. Davin Basils, and Tilly supplied. Thirty years ago, she commanded a task force into the unknown regions hunting Zanima Second and a rogue U.S. Hinvong fleet, which made her the sole present expert on their technology. They're miniature, organically generated singularities. They're used for defense, for propulsion, for generative gravity wells. The strength of the interdiction field doesn't seem to be increasing. It's not accelerating or decelerating either. This is something else. What kind of something else? Admiral, I, I'm sorry. I just don't know. Antilles was out of her seat and halfway over to the tech station when the tactical holo burst into static and disappeared. The entire chamber was plunged into darkness that lasted three shocked and soundless seconds. Then the holo was back again, only different. Almost all of the Imperial line had vanished, and so had an entire cluster of Alliance ships. Get Kroshi on the line, Antilles demanded. Now, as the comm officer struggled to comply, Alana sunk back in her chair. From half a galaxy away all she could do was watch, helpless. Admiral, what's happening? Savash called. The stress was cutting through even his voice now. I don't understand, the Gossam's voice rasped and crackled over the static choke comm link. It was just a burst of force. It tore the Imperial fleet apart. It went through the fleet and destroyed Task Force Gemstone. They're gone, all of them. Get as far away from that world ship as you can, Admiral. Until he said, try to put the planet between it and you. I already gave that order, Croce said angrily. The Mandalorians, they're trying to pin us in place, keep us caged. Break out any way you can. Scatter. Admiral, have you seen this weapon before? Savash asked Antilles. She shook her head. No, sir, we've already seen what it can do. We can't fight it. We have to run. We are running. Crow she snapped. Stand by. He killed the comm link. Alana and the rest watched as the world ship overtook what was left of the Imperial fleet and failed past it. The Mandalorians were starting to pull back, but only from certain vectors. Alana saw it plainly. They all did. The mercenaries were clearing angles for the world ship to fire his weapon while keeping the Alliance groups pinned in place. Suddenly, the entire holo burst into static. They waited, waited for it to come back again, dreading what it would show. The light never came back. It was another shot, and Tilly's lowered her head. He's gone. I was there at Fonder, you know, Vilith Dow said thoughtfully as he and Kiki stood on what passed for a command deck on the world ship. In truth, it was an observation room with a broad and pretended dome through which to view the stars. Years of work under the old shaper's direction had rerouted key nerve pathways from other parts of the ship to this chamber. The crew around them was as minimal as it was motley. There was a handful of other U.S. involved, mixed shaper and warrior casts. Some were humans and other races. Savior loyalists even when standing on this great behemoth Vilith Dow and the Sith had resurrected from whatever cold tomb in the vacuum it had drifted in for forty years. They worked consoles both organic and mechanical. Vilith Dow had long since left behind his racist typical views on heresy. He'd become a pure creator, passionate and ruthless in his work. As they stood side by side under the observation dome, watching the great weapon at work, Darth Kikit had to admit the Vong was a worthy member of the One Sith after all. Fonder, Vilith Dow repeated, almost wistful. I was just an apprentice shaper then. A boy. I still never even set foot on a real planet. We'd brought an entire massive fleet to Fonder to subjugate it. To break the Republic had the happen flotilla that had gathered there. But the G-Day had other plans. Kikit had heard the story before. Centerpoint Station. Yes. That ancient machine over Corellia. Designed to manipulate gravity by factors unthinkable by modern standards. It sent gravitic force across light years and punched through the space over Fonder, like an invisible first. Thousands of our ships, millions of our warriors, dead before they knew what hit them. Vilith Dow's dark expression took on a sadistic gleam. 
My Dovin basal weapon can't reach as far or punch as hard, but I, it will work. Finally, a little revenge for Fondor. Fifty years, his Kikid, is a long time to wait for revenge. Proper revenge is worth waiting centuries for. Yes, he deserved to be called one Sith. A U.S. Hinvong warrior stepped up to Villith Dal, saluted with wrists against shoulders, and said something in his nature tongue. Part of Kikit was irked by how the Vong crew ignored him and deferred to the Shaper in all things. The rest of him was glad not to deal with their kind. He couldn't sense a one of them in the Force, and he would never get used to that. As the warrior went away, Villith Dal told him, the Davin Basils have re-energized and are ready for another attack. They're starting to scatter. It will be harder to punch through whole groups at once. The Mandalorians are there to finish off stragglers. The Shaper shouted a command in U.S. Hinval, and as his crew scurried to work, he fixed Kikid with a cruel smile. No matter what, they've no place to run. What do you say, Sith Lord? Shall we slaughter them all? Kikid looked up at the battle, reached out with the Force, and felt the death grip panic of hundreds of thousands of terrified soldiers. He savored that feeling. He didn't know what Darth Zorn would prefer. If she'd want some frightened stragglers to slink away, and spread horror stories across Empire and Alliance both. She was on Veridan and he was here. He was a Sith Lord now, and it was his decision to make. Yes, he told the U.S. and Vong. Leave no survivors. You couldn't see the wave of kinetic energy as it thrust out from the center of the world ship's giant disc. Even laser blasts, fast as they were, gave you a flash and split-second warning you were about to die. There was nothing here. One second tomorrow was looking at a long chain of fleeing Alliance ships, harassed by a few Beskid squads and Crusader corvettes, all maybe 200 kilometers ahead of her fighter. Then, as if totally spontaneous, all of them crumpled from behind and burst into flames. The explosions died just as fast as they'd come, leaving only darkness and faint debris. Nothing made sense anymore. Absolutely nothing. She didn't hesitate this time as she punched in the comm channel for Jevon Archer's flagship. The voice that answered was high-pitched, almost whiny, clearly not the Mandalor. This is Striker 1. She identified herself. I need to talk to Archer's. Striker 1, has very busy right now. I need to talk to the Mandalor. Now. No can do, Striker. He. The Lynx seemed to die, and for a second Tamar wondered if the world ship had gotten off another shot and wiped even the Mandalor away, though she saw no more explosions. Then the familiar voice, always deep and smooth, said, Make it fast, Skarada. You saw that, didn't you? We just lost ships in the last blast. Mando 8? I saw it. She thought he heard just a little tension. I told them not to get too close. Damn it, Mandler, you knew what this was from the start, didn't you? You kept that that thing secret. Operation Security, Skarada. Get that in your head. You're not entitled to anything just because you had a big shot half GDI Babor. This isn't about him, he snarled, and it really wasn't. What? Are we allied with the Shabler von Jassi now? Those aren't Vong. Those are our allies. It's Savire's ship. Her superweapon. Call it what you want, but we just won this battle. Now we have to finish him off. Order just came down from our employer's Skarada. Take your cousin and all your fighters. Go get the stragglers on the imp line. Finish them all off. The connection closed, and she knew she couldn't get it back. She swung her fighter around toward the world ship. It had settled firmly in the planet's orbit now, like a disc-shaped miniature moon and was swinging around to attack the Alliance ships trying to use Carfedian as a shield. She found herself wondering what that thing's weapon could do to a world, whether it would break the crust or shatter it entirely like another Death Star, whether she'd be there to see it with her own eyes. The time for soldiers battling soldiers was over, the last pretense of honorable combat gone. This wasn't battle anymore. This was an absolute massacre. Tamika, her cousin's voice sounded in her ear. Do you hear me? Tamika. I'm here, she panted. Tamar, what do we do? She never heard such pleading in his voice. He was always the strong one, the certain one, 
the true loyal Mando at that she could never be deep down, corrupted as she was by Jedi blood. He really, truly didn't know what to do. She swallowed and said, We have our orders from the Mandalor. Finish off the imps. She swung her fighter around and signaled for the rest of her squadron to form up. Doors joined the formation. More Mandalorian ships were joining them, including some corvettes and two heavy frigates. All of them raced away from the planet. When they put the world ship behind them, Tamar felt relief seep through her body, but it didn't last long. There was still so much killing to be done. When the concussion blast hit, Razor Company was standing in Voidwalker's hangar, waiting for the signal to file into the waiting drop ships. Then they were on the deck, all tangled up in each other while alarm blared through the ship. Lucas Briggs figured it was only his white helmet that kept him from cracking his head open in the initial fall. He still had to kick his legs out from between Leela's after internal grab generators stabilized and the ship stopped trembling. Their sergeant, Holmes Malkin, tried to call everyone order, but even trained stormtroopers got confused and frantic in the chaos. While he was on the ground, Lucas was half certain he was going to die there, Void Walker blown up around him by some enemy he never even knew was out there, Razor Company not even in their drop ship when it happened. It would be as pathetic a death as a stormy could dream of. When they got to their feet, they tried to make sense of things, but nobody had certain news. Major Sly was the one patched into the bridge, not any of them, and they had to stand around in the hangar, pathetic and helpless as the alarm kept wailing, until Sly's voice finally came into each and every one of their helmets. All razors to the dropships. Repeat to the dropships. Assume proper locations and stand by for more orders. Somebody pulled off his helmet and shouted loud enough for everyone to hear what the cark happened. There was a tense moment where everybody waited for some response from Sly, probably a reprimand, but then the commander said, the enemies brought out some new weapon. Our main line is broken and the ship's been damaged. Board the drop ships and stand by for evacuation. Evacuation. The world rattled through the silence. They weren't getting ready to deploy. They were about to run and if Sly was given the order, then it could only come right from the bridge. Lucas tried to wrap his head around how such a standard deployment could go so wrong so fast. Then he spotted something moving outside the starfield port of Voidwalker's hangar mouth. He looked, one by one, the other troopers looked too. As the frigate turned, their field of vision shifted. The rear half of a hundred-meter gunship tumbled through space. It was close enough to see the flickering embers inside the thrust of the cells, and the body of one unlucky crewman, flushed out of an open deck but stuck on a twisted beam so he just dangled, frozen in the vacuum. The frigate shifted more. The great gray wedge of a star destroyer drifted into view. More debris winked out stars. Far beyond it, the green sphere of Carfedian and something else, something round eclipsing half the world. It couldn't be as big as the planet, not even close. But as he stared Lucas mind struggling to comprehend how huge, how monstrous that thing must have been. And he thought about his grandfather's stories, about the U.S. Hinvong invasion of Imperial space. Knowledge shuddered through him, racked his body, and only the arms of his comrades kept him from falling down. Voidwalker's bridge was a bedlam. The world ship had been right behind the Imperial line when it unleashed the blast that had swept away nearly the entire task force. Being at the edge of the formation was the only thing that had saved them. The concussive wave had still slipped effortlessly past the particle and energy shields, battering the ship, straining its hull, damaging the exposed systems on its flank. The port shield generator was down. Two of the sublight engines were too and the gunnery team was struggling to reroute power to the turbolasers. Everyone was running about, everyone was yelling. Everyone except Captain Lorne, who remained seated in his command chair even after all this, though the comm had gone out of his voice and he barked orders as frantically as reports came shouted to him. The most surreal thing of all was that, as chief tactical officer, Davek Fell didn't have that much to do. As the rest of the crew ran about, frenzied, he kept looking back at the tactical holo. The sensors, at least, were still working. 
He watched as the world ship delivered one, two, three more blasts, each one simply smashing dozens of Alliance ships and thousands of lives out of existence. He watched as Shieldbreaker pulled alongside her struggling sister ship as Resolute's broken hull began to drift. He spotted, too, the first swarm of Mandalorian fighters heading back their way. To finish them off, he was sure. Walker, do you hear me? Commander Samar sounded in his headset. The voice jarred Davek's attention from the holo. He'd almost forgotten their birds were still out there. Loud and clear. We're spotting Mandalorian ships approaching. Instructions. Do your best to hold them off, leader. Understood. Samar grunted and killed the comm. Davik turned his attention to the captain's chair. Lorne was talking to the holo image of Shieldbreaker's Captain Dobris, but the sound was inaudible. When the holo disappeared, Lorne said, loud enough for all to hear, attention. Hostiles are incoming. Prepare for combat. For everyone else, the news was unexpected. As they froze in dread silence, Davik said, Sir, are we going to fight them? What choice do we have? The Muin turned a grim look at him. Can we run? Some ensign in the crew pit yelped. Kamal, standing beside Lorne's chair, shook his head. The gravity well still up. We're trapped here. And they're not going to lower it anytime soon. Beside Davik, ensign poor Dunn cleared her throat and said, That's not exactly true. She said it too softly for the captain to hear. But Davik asked, What do you mean? I've been watching the strength of that grav well, sir. Every time it fires, it's big. Whatever that weapon is, the interdiction field weakens. Doesn't go away, not at all. But it does so soft around the edges, if you see what I mean. How soft? She tapped her claws on her console. Look at my screen, sir. I've started running calculations. Davik and Ensign Korak both huddled over her shoulder. She was right. That interdiction field was weakening with every shot, but only for 30 seconds or before and after. It might be enough. It was all they had. He sprinted over to Lorne's seat, almost knocking Kamal aside as he did. Captain. He called. Captain, we can run. The Muas stared at Davik like he'd gone mad, but he pressed. That drag field. It weakens when it fires that gravity weapon. There's a one minute window when the interdiction field weakens. It shrinks. You mean like it's draining power? Asked Kamal. Our redirecting Davin Basils, or however, that works for the Vong, Davek said. Sir, Ensign Poor Dunn ran calculations. We need to run as far away from that thing as we can and wait for it to use the weapon again. We can't do it, sir. It's not that far. We're struggling to get two engines back online, Lorne told him. And we still have those Mandos coming after us, Kamal warned. Our port shields are down. Davik locked the captain's eyes. Please, sir. It's our only chance. It's either this or we die. That seemed to decide him. Lorne looked sharply at Kamal. Lieutenant Commander, you used to be an engineer. Can you direct the team working on the shield generator while Chief Daher handles the engines? If you need me to, sir. Go, Trancy, hurry. The first officer snapped a salute then ran off the bridge faster than Davik had ever seen him move. The captain hailed, hell. Plot us a course. Get us as far away from that damned world ship as possible. Come, tell Shieldbreaker to do the same. I'll explain to Dobris in a minute. Voidwalker's deck shuddered as it turned away from the planet and accelerated. A Contest class frigate was pretty fast for a ship its size but those Mando vessels were faster. They'd be under attack before they reached a place where they could jump. Lorne looked back at Davek. Lieutenant, call our pilots. Tell them to hold a rear guard action. Make sure they're ready to land their birds fast. I don't want to leave our people out here. Davik agreed and hurried back to his console. He quickly did as the captain said, coming Samar and explaining the situation. The CAG sounded skeptical but ready to try anything just like the captain. Once he closed the link, Davek frantically tried to think of how he could get as many pilots aboard as possible. A one-minute window wasn't enough time to reel three squads of ties into their racks, not even close. He could pull back one squad at a time, maybe. Gold squad first, then gray, then black. 
By the time he made his decision, the Mandalorians were on them. Lieutenant Jaeger had Helm had said that the two damaged engines were back to mostly full capacity, but the port shield generators were still down, even though Kamo had gone down there to direct repairs. Mandalorian basket fighters began to buzz around the hull, stabbing laser blasts into their unshielded flank. Shieldbreaker pulled up along that same side and used his cannons to chase away the swarm, but the fighter would be back. Worse, the Terra class attack frigate was right behind them. Anything, Ensign? He asked poor Dunn. We're just about in range, sir, but that doesn't matter until it charges the weapon again. The ship shuddered. Somewhere in the aft, the Mandas had scored a major hit. As someone read off damage reports and the deck trembled, Davek staggered over to the captain's chair. Sir, we're in range. Once that weapon charges, we can go. Excellent. Lorne ground his teeth. Helm, what kind of hyperdrive course can you plot? Lieutenant Jaeger looked up from the crew pit with a grimace. Not good, sir. Those Mandas have us boxed in and the world ships cut off half our vectors. We'd almost have to jump into the shroud. Can we scan the shroud and find a place to jump into? Someplace safe. Long-range sensors are still good. Sir, Davek confirmed. Then the shroud it is, Helm Lorne told Jaeger. Link your computer with shield breakers. Wherever we go I want to end up together. He called to another section. How's the damn shield generator coming? Before he could get an answer, another explosion shook the ship even harder. Davek slipped and grabbed hold of the captain's armrest to keep from falling on his face. He barely noticed a trio of basket fighters whipping past the bridge from the port aft side. Damage report. Lorne was shouting now. Sir, an ensign gaped. We've got hull breaches on five decks. Emergency bulkheads are down. But, sir? Yes. Out with it. Sir, the port shield generator's gone. The generator and the crew. First Officer Kamel and whoever else was down there. Gone in an instant. We won't last much longer like this, sir, Davek wheezed. Then we better hope that weapon fires again. Lorne snarled. To your station, Lieutenant. Now. As he lurched back to his post, Davek remembered the pilots. No matter what they did, Voidwalker wouldn't last much longer without poor shields. He called up Gold Leader's frequency and said, This is Walker. Bring you birds home, Lieutenant. That s in order. Are you pulling us back, Walker? He could hear Lieutenant Valter's frown. Yes. You have your orders. He switched Comfrex again, this time to his opposite number. Breaker, he called. This is Walker. Do you copy? I hear you, Lieutenant. Pelkey's voice was frantic like he'd never heard it. I've started pulling back our birds. What about yours? I reeled Blue Squad in. Red Squad is still harassing that Mando frigate. Did your captain explain what we're doing? Jump into the shroud. One minute window. Something like that. Okay. Keep that in mind. I will. That all, Walker? Pretty much. Good luck. Breaker. You too. Davit killed the comp just as poor Dunn tugged on his sleeve. The Keldor said, I think that world ship's going to fire soon. His heart jumped. Is it warming up? Not yet. But see his telemetry. It's tilting, angling toward that cluster of ships. The last big cluster. I say it should fire in one minute, two tops. You're sure, Ensign? Are you absolutely sure? He got an uncertain nod, but still a nod. It was enough. He switched his headset freak once more. Black one, bring every bird you've got home. All squads. Before Samara could even respond, he called a Pelkey again. Lieutenant, call Red Squad home. It's almost time. Are you sure, Walker? Just save your pilots. Walker out. He switched up the headset and called across the bridge. Captain, we've got an estimate. Less than two minutes to firing. Lorne glared at him. Are you certain? Davik held his eyes across the distance. He nodded and tried his best to look sure. Lorne nodded back and relayed the order to the comm lieutenant, telling her to give Shieldbreaker the heads up. Davik glanced at the console readout from the hangar. All of Gold's squad was back in his racks. 
Five ties from Gray Squad were in and nine from Black Squad. Sir, poor dumb squawked. The grav well starting to weaken. Captain Davik began. I heard, Lauren snarled. Helm, tell me we've got a course. Found a little pocket in the shroud. Sir, just a short jump. Anything to get us out of here? Is Shieldbreaker linked in? Yes, sir. Tactical. Tell us when we can jump. Davik looked at poor Dunn. Got it. Yes, sir, she said, loud enough for the whole bridge to hear. We're outside the drag field. How much time? Davik glanced at his console. Most of the birds were in, but not all. Less than a minute. Captain. Davik called. We still have pilots out there. Just give us 30 more. Can't risk it. Lauren snapped. Helm. Light speed. Davik raised his voice to object, but then starlines exploded beyond the bridge, and bright light carried them away. After losing contact with Admiral Crow's eyes flagship, the observers on Coruscant frantically reestablished connection with another major ship still in the Carfedian system. They tracked the progress of the battle, watching until that ship was destroyed, sometimes by the world ship's destructive gravity waves, sometimes by marauded Mandalorian frigates. Then they found a new ship and did it all over again, watching as long as they could. One by one or in rushes, everyone died. People started to leave the room before the end of it. Alana couldn't blame them, but she stayed. She watched as ever last warship sent into the Carfedian system was destroyed. Jaina's son was out there somewhere. Probably he was already dead. And awful as that was, Davak's loss was just a tiny piece of an even greater tragedy. Over a hundred vessels from three different fleets, crewed by more than two million soldiers. One after another after another, they died. When the last connection broke, when there were no more ships left for them to view the slaughter through, Alana lowered her face in her hands and cried. They'd crept around Carfedian's nightside face, and were swinging toward daylight again. The planet was a slim emerald crescent through the world ship's observation domes. Dead ships and twisted debris now choked the planet's orbit. As fresh sunlight found them, they gleamed like jewels. So, Vilith Dal asked, as if resuming casual conversation, do you think she'll be pleased? Dark Keekit looked out on the stars, reached out with the force, and felt so much agony rippling across space. It was like nothing he'd known before. It made him feel powerful and glorious like nothing else. Yes, he said. I think she will. Chapter 20 Warren wanted to tell them everything, that he'd been stupid and reckless and foolish, that N'Jalu's death was his fault, that they should have left him to die. He couldn't get any of it out, though, not when they were fleeing for their lives through a city suddenly turned against them. Their escape from the mining complex had been chaotic, and that confusion was why they got as far as they did through the city before security forces located them. They heard the sounds of speeder bikes swooping down from overhead and ducked for cover inside the doorway of an abandoned building just as the first laser blast came raining down on them. The building shook as the bike pulled over them and started to veer for another pass. We can't stay here, Jodrum said. His lightsaber still blazed in his hand. They'll bring reinforcements any minute. Are we trying to get to the lifts? Asked Warren as he held the side of his chest where his ribs had been cracked. He was panting, and every deep breath stung. Where else can we go? We can't hide anywhere and they'll keep throwing people at us. Jodrum looked to Jade. Are you okay? Are you with us? She nodded, but her eyes were hollow, her expression blank. Master Mjallu Warren wheezed. Jade, I'm so. Save it, Jodrum said. Listen. The drone of the speeder bike was getting louder. No bikes. Warren bent forward and looked out the door. I see one. He's coming around. Get inside. Jodrum pulled him back by the arm. Get ready to jump. All of us. Jodrum tapped Jade on the shoulder, hard. Ready? She nodded but still didn't speak. Jodrum glanced out the door again, then stepped fully out. As Jodrum raised his lightsaber and batted back the first two laser shots from the bike, Warren stepped out to join him. The bike shifted aim slightly to fire at Warren, which gave Jodrum his chance. 
When the bike swooped low, the young man jumped high, right onto the bike itself. A force shove knocked the rider onto the rooftop. Jodrum wrestled the bike into submission and spun it around in a tight circle. When he brought it around again, Warren and Jade were ready. They jumped onto the speeder's back and Jodrum gunned the engine, pushing them as fast as they could to the far wall of the cavern. Laser blast whistled past them. Warren, barely clinging to Jade who in turn clung to Jodrum, took out his saber to ward off shots from the three other speeders in pursuit. The city streets and rooftops whipped by fast. He caught only a few but spared most of his concentration for simply hanging on. Jodrum was throwing them into all sorts of slides and dodges to avoid getting hit. A speeder like this had no shields or armor, one lucky hit and they were all dead. The one thing their craft had going for it was that it was fast. The cavern wall and the lift platform were coming up already. Warren could see a couple Mandalorians on the platform scramble to the edge and start shooting at them. Jodrum was driving, Warren was in the back, and Jade was sandwiched between them. It was all they could do to juke and slip and slide to avoid the blast coming at them from both directions now, and even if they got to the platform, Warren had no idea what they were going to do about the Mandalorians. Hold on, Jodrum called. We're going in hot. What are you doing? Warren asked, but Jodrum didn't respond. He just dove toward the platform, toward the Mandos, barely slowing down. When Jodrum dropped, he dropped right onto a Mando. The impact knocked the mercenary off his feet. Jodrum leveled out but didn't slow down. He slammed nose first into the next armored figure. The bike jumped as they ran straight over him. A third Mandalorian nailed their speeder with his rifle. The whole thing lurched and Warren knew the engine would blow with another hit. So did Jodrum. He called for them all the bail and they bailed. Warren dove off, trying to aim his unbroken ribs toward the platform and used the force to cushion his fall. The errant, smoking speeder charged ahead and ran down one more Mandalorian before careening into the canyon wall and exploding. It was Jade who tugged Warren to his feet. Jodrum was already at the controls for the lift, pounding on them like that could get the tube here quicker. The other speeder bikes had caught up with them and were circling around for a pass, and two more Mandalorians were on their feet and attacking. Jay still seemed out of it, but Warren and Jodrum charged with sabers blazing. Warren bounced back two shots, ducked under a third, and came up close to the Mando. He swung his saber across the warrior's chest and was shocked when it deflected off the spotless armor plating. The Scargom, of course. The Mando swiped at Warren with a knife, and he barely jumped back in time. The blade cut across his shoulder, tearing clothes and skin, and drawing blood. Warren held in pain, the Mando spun for a kick aimed at his broken ribs. He flicked his lightsaber down to block it, sizzling blade against Besker Legbees. The Mando still had a rifle in his other hand, and swung it up to fire, even though he was off balance. At that range it was almost impossible to miss. Jodrum's blade sizzled across the Mando's back. He grunted, lost balance even more, and tried to recover. Warren saw an opening and took it. He lunged forward and thrust his saber into the man's side, between his armor plating, through his ribs into his lungs and heart. Warren felt the man's death in the force, the pain, the shock, the disbelief fast surrendered. It was satisfying to feel. He pulled the blade out and let the body collapse. The and Jodrum looked at each other across the corpse and heard the awful whine of more approaching speeders. Guys, Jay shouted, Rides here. They sprinted for the lift and threw themselves inside. The doors closed before the speeders got there, and the capsule shot upward for the planet's surface. Do you think they can stop it? Asked Warren as they shuddered with fast motion. I'm sure they can stop it, Jodrum said. I'm more worried about whoever's up top, waiting for us. There was nobody when we came down. They hadn't fully secured the place yet. We only got inside because we were lucky. Unlucky muttered Jade, and neither boy responded. It was impossible to disagree. Warren was surprised when they made it to the top. He was surprised when the door opened and nobody was there to shoot at them. The three of them ran across the empty hangar toward the exit and were about to plunge outside before Jodrum called a halt. Goggles. 
Breath masks, he reminded. I don't have them, Warren said. He was lucky to have his lightsaber. Here, Jodrum ripped off a piece of his tunic that was already torn in the fight. Cover your mouth at least. Warren did the best he could. This part of the planet must have been turning itself away from Veridan's sun because the valley had fallen into shadow and the sky above was the color of hot flame. When they stumbled outside, he held a hand over the top half of his face so he was looking through a slit between fingers. It kept out most of the flying dust particles, but his eyes still itched. How he was going to climb up and down mountains with one hand, he didn't know. He heard the sound of spacecraft engines and decided he'd probably never find out. For the rocks. Run, Jodrum said. All three of them raced away from the landing complex. Warren risked a look skyward to see a ship plunging down on them, blunt body and flying almost vertically. A Mandalorian attack shuttle, probably. They reached the rocks and tried to scramble up the jagged slope. The Mandalorian ship fired a few shots, but they went high and wide. They impacted on the mountainside 10 or 20 meters away and shook the entire face. How do we get back to the ship? Warren shouted over the explosions, the roaring engine, the savage desert winds. We have to take care of them first. Jodrum shoved a hand skyward. There was another explosion as more lasers hit. Warren said, they're trying to flush us out. They want to capture us if they can. That doesn't mean they'll let us get away. No, but. Another explosion cracked through the air, but the mountainside barely trembled. That one was different. It had been a bigger blast, far bigger, but further away, and in the direction they were trying to go. They found the ship, Jade muttered. It's gone. We don't, we're not sure, Warren stuttered. Jade lowered her head. Warren looked to Jodron for guidance. He was the one who gotten them this far. But now his single-minded determination had melted away. The young man who looked back at Warren was dirty, exhausted, and out of ideas. In a grim way, Jay found herself waiting for capture. It would mean some answers before they killed her. Some fulfillment of the revelation that had just rocked her world. There would be pain too, untold agony before she died at the hands of a Sith, but right then it almost felt worth it. The Mandalorians must have pinpointed their location because their shuttle set to hover over the mountainside and four troopers dropped out, slowing their fall onto the slope with bursts from their jetpacks. What do we do? whispered Warren through the tattered cloth covering his mouth and nose. I don't know, Jodron rasped. She'd known him all her life but she'd never seen him so panicked, felt that panic so strongly in their forced bond. She felt him reach out to her, desperate and mournful. I'm so sorry, he said. I'm sorry I couldn't save you. She couldn't reply to that. She peeked over the rocks and saw the Mandalorian shimmying toward them. There was no place to run and barely any place to fight. It was over. And then there was the sound, the roaring of another set of spacecraft engines. She felt Jodrum's sprit fall even further but hers barely budged. She already knew what was ahead of them. Then she heard the sound of chain link laser fire and looked up. Red blast slammed into the side of the hovering Mandalorian ship. It swiveling to return fire, popped off a few shots then veered and accelerated away. The air around them howled as two long-winged starfighters went chasing after it. When the next shuttle came and opened its drop doors, the Mandalorians were ready. Forgetting their quarry, they dropped to positions of cover on the rocky mountain site and opened fire the second the first bodies jumped out. Their preparation did little good. Jade counted five lightsabers springing to life before the Jedi even hit ground. Jodrum was the first one up, the first to charge. Warren and Jay followed and she prayed he wouldn't get himself killed, not when they were so close to an impossible escape. The Mandalorians fought hard. Jade saw one of them get close enough to a Jedi to slide a viper blade into her thigh and kick her to the ground. That warrior only got a second to enjoy his victory. A blue lightsaber blade slipped between Beskar plates and took his arm off at the shoulder. That same lightsaber spun around Bob fast over a set of outcroppings and speared another Mando through the side. In the sandstorm the distant body wielded it was only a dark blur, constantly moving, 
but the luminous blue blaze spun once more, shot ahead, vanished inside the chest of the third Mandalorian, then came out blazing. Even before Jade felt her in the force, she knew her aunt had come for her. Attacked from all sides, the Mandalorian didn't last long. The survivors fell back, ducked behind rocks, and reduced themselves to sniping and effectively through the sandstorm. As the shuttle drooped low, and the wounded Jedi was helped to the ship, the three apprentices converged around the small but commanding figure of Jaina Solo fell. Come on, you three. Jaina's eyes blazed. She hadn't even bothered with goggles and a mask, and her gray hair furled in the wind like a banner. We've got more hostiles right behind us. Jadrum helped pull Warren into the shuttle's mouth. As Jaina helped Jade about, she leaned close and asked, Master Mjallu, like she already knew the answer. Jay shook her head. Jaina nodded and called to the pilot. The shuttle door slammed shut, locking them away from the harsh atmosphere. The shuttle jumped skyward so hard, they were thrown against the back bulkhead, but not hard enough to injure anyone. They didn't seem to have a healer with them, but Jaina herself took out a first aid kit and started looking them over after they'd escaped to hyperspace. She checked over Jay first, saying, You were down there for almost a week with no message. I figured something had to be wrong. We were hiding behind the moon for almost two days, waiting for some sign of where you were. Beside her, Warren tried to sit up. Master, I'm so sorry. It was my fault. I he winced for the pain in his ribs. Jaina looked him over more thoroughly. Her eyes went wide at the scorched clothing over his chest. Savior was down there, Jodrum said. She killed Master Njalu. She's a Sith. No, Warren said. Not Savior. Darth Zorin. It doesn't matter. Jay grabbed her aunt's arm and squeezed hard. Not her name, but her. I know her. Jodrum frowned. You've met her. How? I felt her. All that hate, that anger. I remembered it, all this time. I didn't know what it was. I just thought she clenched Jana's arm enough to hurt but didn't let go. It was her. Twelve years ago. She was the one who killed my mother. Jade's eyes held her aunt's tight, imploring, asking a question she couldn't speak. Shame wilted Jana's face as she looked away.